Part One, Chapter Seventeen of the Daisy Chain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. Part One, Chapter Seventeen. Gently supported by the ready aid of loving hands whose little work of toil her grateful prodigality repaid. With all the benediction of her smile, she turned her failing feet to the softly cushioned seat, dispensing kindly greetings all the time. R. M. Milnes Three great events signalized the month of January. The first was the opening of the school at Coxmoor, whither a cart transported half a dozen forms, various books, and three dozen plum buns, margaret's contribution in order that the school might begin with a claw there walked mr wilmot richard and flora with mary in a jumping capering state of delight and ethel not knowing whether she rejoiced she kept apart from the rest and hardly spoke for this long probation had impressed her with a sense of responsibility and she knew that it was a great work to which she had set her hand a work in which she must persevere and in which she could not succeed in her own strength she took hold of flora's hand and squeezed it hard in a fit of shyness when they came upon the hamlet and saw the children watching for them and when they reached the house she would fain have shrank into nothing there was a swelling of heart that seemed to overwhelm and stifle her and the effect of which was to keep her standing unhelpful when the others were busy bringing in the benches and settling the room it was a tidy room, but it seemed very small when they arranged the benches and opened the door to the seven-and-twenty children and the four or five women who stood waiting. Ethel felt some dismay when they all came pushing in, without order or civility, and would have been utterly at a loss what to do with her scholars, now she had got them, if Richard and Flora had not marshaled them to the benches. Rough heads, torn garments, staring vacant eyes, and mouths gaping in shy rudeness, it was a sight to disenchant her of visions of pleasure in the work she had set herself. It was well that she had not to take the initiative. Mr. Wilmot said a few simple words to the mothers about the wish to teach their children what was right, and to do the best at present practicable, and then told the children that he hoped they would take pains to be good and mind what they were taught. Then he desired all to kneel down, he said, the collect prevent us o lord in all our doings and then the lord's prayer ethel felt as if she could bear it better and was more up to the work after this next the children were desired to stand round the room and mr wilmot tried who could say the catechism the two biggest a boy and a girl had not an idea of it and the boy looked foolish and grinned at being asked what was his name one child was tolerably perfect and about half a dozen had some dim notions. Three were entirely ignorant of the Lord's Prayer, and many of the others did not by any means pronounce the words of it. Jane and Fanny Taylor, Rebecca Watts, and Mrs. Green's little boy were the only ones who, by their own account, used morning and evening prayers, though, on further examination, it appeared that Polly and Jenny Hall, and some others, were accustomed to repeat the old rhyme about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Una McCarty, and her little brother, Fergus, said something that nobody could make out, but which Mr. Wilmot thought had once been an Ave Maria. Some few of the children could read, and several more knew their letters. The least ignorant were selected to form a first class, and Mr. Wilmot promised a prayer book to the first, who should be able to repeat the catechism without a mistake, and a Bible to the first who could read a chapter in it. Then followed a setting of tasks, varying from a verse of a psalm, or the first answer in the catechism, down to the distinction between A, B, and C, all to be ready by next Tuesday, when, weather permitting, a second lesson was to be given. Afterwards, a piece of advice of Margaret's was followed, and Flora read aloud to the assembly the story of Margaret Fletcher, to some this seemed to give great satisfaction, especially to Una, but Ethel was surprised to see that many, and those not only little ones, talked and yawned. 
They had no power of attention even to a story, and the stillness was irksome to such wild colts. It was plain that it was time to leave off, and there was no capacity there which did not find the conclusion agreeable, when the basket was opened and Ethel and Mary distributed the buns, with instructions to say thank you. The next Tuesday, some of the lessons were learned, Una's perfectly, the big ignorant boy came no more, and some of the children had learned to behave better, while others behaved worse. Ethel began to know what she was about. Richard's gentleness was eminently successful with the little girls, impressing good manners on them in a marvelous way, and Mary's importance and happiness with alphabet scholars, some bigger than herself, were edifying. Coxmoor was fairly launched. The next memorable day was that of Margaret's being first carried downstairs. She had been willing to put it off as long as she could, dreading to witness the change below stairs, and feeling, too, that in entering on the family room, without power of leaving it, she was losing all quiet and solitude, as well as giving up that monopoly of her father in his evenings, which had been her great privilege. However, she tried to talk herself into liking it, and was rewarded by the happy commotion it caused though dr may was in a state of excitement and nervousness at the prospect of seeing her on the stairs and his attempts to conceal it only made it worse till margaret knew she should be nervous herself and wished him out of sight and out of the house till it was over for without him she had full confidence in the coolness and steadiness of richard and by him it was safely and quietly accomplished she was landed on the sofa richard and flora settling her and the others crowding round and exclaiming while the newness of the scene and the change gave her a sense of confusion, and she shut her eyes to recover her thoughts, but opened them the next instant at her father's exclamation that she was overcome, smiled to reassure him, and declared herself not tired, and to be very glad to be among them again. But the bustle was oppressive, and her cheerful manner was an effort. She longed to see them all gone, and Flora found it out, sent the children for their walk, and carried off Ethel and the brothers. Dr. May was called out of the room at the same time, and she was left alone. She gazed round her, at the room where, four months before, she had seen her mother with the babe in her arms. The children clustered round her, her father exulting in his hen and chicken daisies, herself full of bright, undefined hope, radiant with health and activity, and her one trouble such that she now knew the force of her mother's words, that it only proved her happiness. It was not till that moment that Margaret realized the change, found her eyes filling with tears, and as she looked round and saw the familiar furniture and ornaments, they were instantly checked as she heard her father returning, but not so that he did not perceive them, and exclaimed that it had been too much for her. Oh, no, it was only the first time, said Margaret, losing the sense of the painful vacancy in her absorbing desire not to distress her father and thinking only of him as she watched him stand for some minutes leaning on the mantel shelf with his hand shading his forehead she began to speak as soon as she thought he was ready to have his mind turned away how nicely richie managed he carried me so comfortably and easily it is enough to spoil me to be so deftly waited on i am glad of it said dr may i am sure the change is better for you but he came and looked at her still with great solicitude Richie can take excellent care of me, she continued, most anxious to divert his thoughts. You see, it will do very well indeed for you to take Harry to school. I should like to do so. I should like to see his master and to take Norman with me, said the doctor. It will be just the thing for him now. We would show him the dockyard and all those matters, and such a thorough holiday would set him up again. He is very much better, much better. He is recovering spirits and tone very fast. That leaf work of yours came at a lucky time. I like to see him looking out for a curious fern in the hedgerows. The pursuit has quite brightened him up. And he does it so thoroughly, said Margaret. Ethel fancies it is rather frivolous of him, I believe, but it amuses me to see how men give dignity to what women make trifling. He will know everything about the leaves, hunts up my botany books, and has taught me a hundred times more of the construction and wonders of them than I ever learned. Hi, said the doctor. He has been talking a good deal to me about vegetable chemistry. He would make a good scientific botanist if he were to be nothing else. 
I should be glad if he sticks to it as a pursuit. Tis pretty work, and I should like to have gone further with it, if I had ever had time for it. I dare say he will, said Margaret. It will be very pleasant if he can go with you. How he would enjoy the British Museum, if there was time for him to see it. Have you said anything to him yet? No, I waited to see how you were, as it all depends on that. I think it depends still more on something else, whether Norman is as fit to take care of you as Richard is. That's another point. There's nothing but what he could manage now, but I don't like saying anything to him. I know he would undertake anything I wished without a word, and then, perhaps, dwell on it in fancy and force himself till it would turn to a perfect misery and upset his nerves again. I'm sorry for it. I meant him to have followed my trade, but he'll never do for that. However, he has wits enough to make himself what he pleases, and I dare say he will keep at the head of the school after all. How very good he has been in refraining from restlessness. It's beautiful, said Dr. May, with strong emotion. Poor boy, I trust he'll not be disappointed, and I don't think he will, but I've promised him I won't be annoyed if he should lose his place so we must take a special care not to show any anxiety. However, for this matter, Margaret, I wish you would sound him and see whether it would be more pleasure or pain. Only mind you, don't let him think that I shall be vexed. If he feels that he can't make up his mind, I would not have him fancy that for more than I can tell. This consultation revived the spirits of both, and the others returning found Margaret quite disposed for companionship. If to her the evening was sad and strange, like a visit in a dream to some old familiar haunt, finding all unnatural, to the rest it was delightful. The room was no longer dreary, now that there was a center for care and attentions, and the party was no longer broken up. The sense of comfort, cheerfulness, and home-gathering had returned, and the pleasant evening household gossip went round the table almost as it used to do. Dr. May resumed his old habit of skimming a club book and imparting the cream to the listeners, and Flora gave them some music, a great treat to Margaret, who had long only heard its distant sounds. Margaret found an opportunity of talking to Norman, and judged favorably. He was much pleased at the prospect of the journey and of seeing a ship, so as to have a clearer notion of the scene where Harry's life was to be spent, and though the charge of the arm was a drawback, he did not treat it as insurmountable. A few days' attendance in his father's room gave him confidence in taking Richard's place, and, accordingly, the third important measure was decided on, namely, that he and his father should accompany Harry to the naval school and be absent three nights. Some relations would be glad to receive them in London, and Alan Ernscliffe, who was studying steam navigation at Woolwich, volunteered to meet them and go with them to Portsmouth. It was a wonderful event. Norman and Harry had never been beyond Whitford in their lives, and none of the young ones could recollect their papas ever going from home for more than one night. Dr. May laughed at Margaret for her anxiety and excitement on the subject, and was more amused at overhearing Richard's precise directions to Norman over the packing up. "'Hey, Richie,' said the doctor, as he saw his portmanteau lock and the key given to Norman, "'you may well look grave upon it. You won't see it look so tidy when it comes back again, and I believe you are thinking it will be lucky if you see it at all. There was a very affectionate leave-taking of Harry, who, growing rather soft-hearted, thought it needful to be disdainful, scolded Mary and Blanche for lugging off his figurehead, and assured them they made as much work about it as if he was going to see it once. Then, to put it into any more embraces, he marched off to the station with Tom, and nearly caused the others to be too late by the search for him that ensued. In due time, Dr. May and Norman returned, looking the better for the journey. There was, first, to tell of Harry's school and its master, and Alan Ernscliffe's introduction of him to a nice-looking boy of his own age. Then they were eloquent on the wonders of the dockyard, the victory, the block machinery, and London. While Dr. May went to transact some business, Norman had been with Alan at the British Museum, and though he had intended to see half London besides, there was no tearing him away from the Elgin marbles, and nothing would serve him but bringing Dr. May the next morning to visit the Nine Vite Bulls. Norman further said, 
that whereas papa could never go out of his house without meeting people who had something to say to him it was the same elsewhere six acquaintances he had met unexpectedly in london and two at portsmouth so the conversation went on all the evening to the great delight of all it was more about things than people though flora inquired after mr ernscliffe and was told he had met them at the station had been everywhere with them and had dined at the mackenzies each day how was he looking ethel asked and was told pretty much the same as when he went away and on a further query from flora it appeared that an old naval friend of his father's had hopes of a ship and had promised to have him with him and thereupon warm hopes were expressed that harry might have birth in the same and when is he coming here again papa said ethel eh oh i can't tell i say isn't it high time to ring when they went up at night everyone felt that half the say had not been said and there were fresh beginnings on the stairs norman triumphantly gave the key to richard and then called to ethel i say won't you come into my room while i unpack oh yes i should like it very much ethel sat on the bed rolled up in a cloak while norman undid his bag announcing at the same time well ethel papa says i may get to my euripides to-morrow if i please and only work an hour at a time oh i am so glad then he thinks you quite well yes i am quite well i hope i've done with nonsense and how did you get on with his arm very well he was so patient and told me how to manage you heard that sir matthew said it got much better in these few weeks oh here it is there's a present for you oh thank you from you or from papa this is mine papa has a present for everyone in his bag he said at last that a man with eleven children hadn't need to go to london very often and you got this beautiful lira innocentium for me how very kind of you norman it is just what i wished for such lovely binding and those embossed edges to the leaves oh they make a pattern as they open i never saw anything like it i saw such a one on miss rivers's table and asked ernest cliff where to get one like it see here's what my father gave me bishop kin's manual that is in readiness for the confirmation look i begged him to put my name though he said it was a pity to do it with his left hand i didn't like to wait so i asked him at least to write n w may and the date and he has added prov twenty three twenty four twenty five let me look it out she did so and instead of reading it aloud looked at norman full of congratulation how it ought to make one and there norman broke off from the fullness of his heart i'm glad he put both verses said ethel presently how pleased with you he must be a silence while brother and sister both gazed intently at the crooked characters till at last ethel with a long breath resumed her ordinary tone and said how well he has come to write with his left hand now yes did you know that he wrote himself to tell ernscliffe sir matthew's opinion of margaret no did he do you know ethel said norman as he knelt on the floor and tumbled miscellaneous articles out of his bag it is my belief that ernscliffe is in love with her and that papa thinks so dear me cried ethel starting up that is famous we should always have margaret at home when he goes to sea but mind ethel for your life you must not say one word to any living creature oh no i promise you i won't norman if you'll only tell me how you found it out what first put it in my head was the first evening while i was undoing the portmanteau my father leaned on the mantel shelf and sighed and muttered poor ernscliffe i wish it may end well i thought he forgot that i was there so i would not seem to notice but i soon saw it was that he meant how cried ethel eagerly oh i don't know by alan's way tell me i want to know what people do when they are in love nothing particular said norman smiling did you hear him inquire for her how did he look i can't tell that was when he met us at the station before i thought of it and i had to see to the luggage but i'll tell you one thing ethel when papa was talking of her to mrs mackenzie at the other end of the room all his attention went away in an instant from what he was saying and once when harry said something to me about her he started and looked round so earnestly 
Oh, yes, that's like people in books. And did he color? No, I don't recollect that he did, said Norman, but I observed he never asked directly after her if he could help it, but always was trying to lead in some roundabout way to hearing what she was doing. Did he call her Margaret? I watched, but to me he always said, Your sister, and if he had to speak of her to Papa, he said, Miss May, and then you should have seen his attention to Papa. I could hardly get a chance of doing anything for Papa. Oh, sure of it, cried Ethel, clasping her hands. But, poor man, how unhappy he must have been at having to go away when she was so ill. Ay, the last time he saw her was when he carried her upstairs. Oh, dear, I hope he will soon come here again. I don't suppose he will. Papa did not ask him. Dear me, Norman, why not? Isn't Papa very fond of him? Why shouldn't he come? Don't you see, Ethel, that would be of no use while poor Margaret is no better. If he gained her affections, it would only make her unhappy. Oh, but she is much better. She can raise herself up now without help, and sat up ever so long this morning without leaning back on her cushions. She is getting well. You know Sir Matthew said she would. Yes, but I suppose Papa thinks they had better say nothing till she is quite well. And when she is, how famous it will be. Then there's another thing. He is very poor, you know. I am sure Papa doesn't care about people being rich. I suppose Alan thinks he ought not to marry unless he can make his wife comfortable. Look here, it would be all very easy. She should stay with us and be comfortable here, and he go to sea and get lots of prize money. And that's what you call domestic felicity? said Norman, laughing. He might have her when he was at home, said Ethel. No, no, that would never do, said Norman. Do you think Ernscliff, a man that would marry a wife for her father to maintain her? Why, Papa would like it very much. He is not a mercenary father in a book. Hey, what's that? said a voice Ethel little expected. Contraband talk at contraband times? What's this? Did you hear, Papa? said Ethel, looking down. Only your last words, as I came up to ask Norman what he had done with my pocket book. Mind, I ask no impertinent questions, but, if you have no objections, I should like to know what gained me the honor of that compliment. Norman, said Ethel, interrogatively, and blushing in emulation of a brother, who was crimson. I'll find it, said he, rushing off with a sort of nod and sign that conveyed to Ethel that there was no help for it. So, with much confusion, she whispered into her papa's ear that Norman had been telling her something he guessed about Mr. Ernscliff. Her father at first smiled, a pleased, amused smile. Ah, ha, so Master June has his eyes and ears open, has he? A fine bit of gossip to regale you with on his return. He told me to say not one word, said Ethel. Right, mind you don't, said Dr. May, and Ethel was surprised to see how sorrowful his face became. At the same moment, Norman returned, still very red, and said, I put out the pocketbook, Papa. I think I should tell you I repeated what, perhaps, you did not mean me to hear. You talked to yourself something of pitying Ernscliff. The doctor smiled again at the boy's high-minded openness, which must have cost an effort of self-humiliation. I can't say little pitchers have long ears to a maypole like you, Norman, said he, I think I ought rather to apologize for having inadvertently tumbled in among your secrets. I assure you, I did not come to spy on you. Oh, no, 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 repeated Ethel vehemently. Then you didn't mind our talking about it? Of course not, as long as it goes no farther. It is the use of sisters to tell them one's private sentiments. Is not it, Norman? And do you really think it is so, Papa? Ethel could not help whispering. I'm afraid it is, said Dr. May, sighing. Then, as he caught her earnest eyes, the more I see of Alan, the finer fellow I think him, and the more sorry I am for him. It seems presumptuous, almost wrong, to think of the matter at all while my poor Margaret is in this state, and, if she were well, there are other difficulties which would, perhaps, prevent his speaking, or lead to long years of waiting and wearing out hope. Money, said Ethel, I, though I so far deserve your compliment, miss, that should be foolish enough, if she were but well, to give my consent to-morrow, because I could not help it, 
Yet one can't live forty-six years in this world without seeing it is wrong to marry without a reasonable dependence, and there won't be much among eleven of you. It makes my heart ache to think of it, come what may, as far as I can see, and without her to judge. The only comfort is that poor Margaret herself knows nothing of it, and is at peace so far. It will be ordered for them anyhow. Good night, my dear. Ethel sought her room, with graver, deeper thoughts of life than she had carried upstairs. End of Part 1, Chapter 17 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Part 1, Chapter 18 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. Part 1, Chapter 18. Saw ye never in the meadows where your little feet did pass, down below the sweet white daisies growing in the long green grass? Saw ye never lilac blossoms or acacia white and red waving brightly in the sunshine on the tall trees overhead? Hymns for Children, C.F.A. My dear child, what a storm you have had! How wet you must be! exclaimed Mrs. Larpent as Maida Rivers came bounding up the broad staircase at Abbotstoke Grange. Oh no, I am quite dry. Feel! Are you sure? said Mrs. Larpent drawing her darling into a luxurious bedroom lighted up by a glowing fire and full of pretty things. Here, come and take off your wet things, my dear, and Belairs shall bring you some tea. I'm dry, I'm warm, said Maida, tossing off her plumy hat as she established herself with her feet on the fender. But where do you think I have been? You have so much to hear, but first, three guesses where we were in the rain in the Stoneborough cloisters, that you wanted to see? My dear, you did not keep your papa in the cold there. No, no, we never got there at all. Guess again. At Mr. Edward Wilmot's? No. Could it have been at Dr. May's? Really? Then you must tell me. There, you deserve a good long story beginning at the beginning, said Maida, clapping her hands. Wasn't it curious? As we were coming up the last hill, we met some girls in deep mourning with a lady who looked like their governess. I wondered whether they could be Dr. May's daughters, and so it turned out they were. Presently there began to fall little square lumps, neither hail nor snow nor rain. It grew very cold, and rain came on. It would have been great fun if I had not been afraid Papa would catch cold, and he said we could canter on to the end. But luckily there was Dr. May walking up the street, and he begged us to come into his house. I was so glad. We were tolerably wet, and Dr. May said something about hoping the girls were at home. Well, when he opened the drawing-room door, there was the poor daughter lying on the sofa. Poor girl, tell me of her. Oh, you must go and see her. You won't look at her without losing your heart. Papa liked her so much. See if he does not talk of her all the evening." She looks the picture of goodness and sweetness. Only think of her having some of the maiden hair and cape jasmine still in water that we sent her so long ago. She shall have some flowers every three days. Well, Dr. May said, there is one at least that is sure to be at home. She felt my habit and said I must go and change it, and she called to a little thing of six telling her to show me the way to Flora. She smiled and said she wished she could go herself, but Flora would take care of me. Little Blanche came and took hold of my hand, chattering away. Up we went, up two staircases, and at the top of the last stood a girl about seventeen. So pretty! Such deep blue eyes and such a complexion! That's Flora, little Blanche said. Flora, this is Miss Rivers, and she's wet, and Margaret says you are to take care of her. So that was your introduction? Yes, we got acquainted in a minute. She took me into a room, such a room! I believe Belairs would be angry if she had such a one. All up in the roof, no fire, no carpet, except little strips by the beds. There were three beds. Flora used to sleep there till Miss May was ill. Now she dresses there. 
yet I am sure they are as much ladies as I am. You are an only daughter, my dear, and a petted one, said Mrs. Larpent, smiling. There are too many of them to make much of, as we do of our meta. I suppose so, but I did not know that gentlewomen lived in such a way, said Meta. There were nice things about, a beautiful inlaid work-box of Flora's, and a rosewood desk, and plenty of books, and a Greek book and dictionary were spread open. I asked Flora if they were hers, and she laughed and said no, and that Ethel would be much discomposed that I had seen them. Ethel keeps up with her brother Norman. Only fancy, and he at the head of the school. How clever she must be! But, my dear, were you standing in your wet things all this time? No, I was trying on their frocks, but they trailed on the ground upon me, so she asked if I would come and sit by the nursery fire till my habit was dry, and there was a dear little good-humoured baby, so fair and pretty. She is not a bit shy, will go to anybody, but, they say, she likes no one so well as her brother Norman. So you had a regular treat of baby nursing. That I had. I could not part with her, the darling. Flora thought we might take her down, and I liked playing with her in the drawing-room and talking to Miss May till the fly came to take us home. I wanted to have seen Ethel, but only think, Papa has asked Dr. May to bring Flora some day. How I hope he will! Little Maida, having told her story and received plenty of sympathy, proceeded to dress, and, while her maid braided her hair, a musing fit fell upon her. I have seen something of life to-day, thought she. I had thought of the great difference between us and the poor, but I did not know ladies lived in such different ways. I should be very miserable without Belair's, or without a fire in my room. I don't know what I should do if I had to live in that cold, shabby den, and do my own hair, yet they think nothing of it, and they are cultivated and ladylike. Is it all fancy, and being brought up to it? I wonder if it is right." Yet dear Papa likes me to have these things and can afford them. I never knew I was luxurious before, and yet I think I must be. One thing I do wish, and that is, that I was of as much use as those girls. I ought to be. I am a motherless girl like them, and I ought to be everything to Papa, just as Miss May is, even lying on the sofa there, and only two years older than I am. I don't think I am of any use at all. He is fond of me, of course, dear Papa, and if I died, I don't know what would become of him, but that's only because I am his daughter. He has only George, besides, to care for. But, really and truly, he would get on as well without me. I never do anything for him, but now and then playing to him in the evening, and that not always, I am afraid, when I want to be about anything else. He is always petting me and giving me all I want, but I never do anything but my lessons, and going to the school, and the poor people, and that is all pleasure. I have so much that I never miss what I give away. I wonder whether it is all right. Leonora and Agatha have not so much money to do as they please with. They are not so idolized. George said, when he was angry, that Papa idolizes me, but they have all these comforts and luxuries, and never think of anything but doing what they like. They never made me consider as these maids do. I should like to know them more. I do so much when a friend of my own age. It is the only want I have. I have tried to make a friend of Leonora, but I cannot. She never cares for what I do. If she saw these maids, she would look down on them. Dear Mrs. Larpent is better than anyone, but then she is so much older. Flora May shall be my friend. I'll make her call me Meta as soon as she comes. When will it be? The day after tomorrow? But little Maida watched in vain. Dr. May always came with either Richard or the groom to drive him, and if Maida met him and hoped he would bring Flora next time, he only answered that Flora would like it very much, and he hoped soon to do so. The truth was, it was no such everyday matter as Maida imagined. The larger carriage had been broken, and the only vehicle held only the doctor, his charioteer, and in a very minute appendage behind a small son of the gardener, to open gates and hold the horse. The proposal had been one of those general invitations to be fulfilled at any time, and therefore easily set aside, and Dr. May, though continually thinking he should like to take his girls to Abbotstoke, never saw the definite time for so doing, and Flora herself, though charmed with Miss Rivers, 
and delighted with the prospect of visiting her, only viewed it as a distant prospect. There was plenty of immediate interest to occupy them at home, to say nothing of the increasing employment that Coxmoor gave to thoughts, legs, and needles. There was the commencement of the half-year, when Tom's schoolboy life was to begin, and when it would be proved whether Norman were able to retain his elevation. Margaret had much anxiety respecting the little boy about to be sent into a scene of temptation. Her great confidence was in Richard, who told her that boys did many more wrong things than were known at home, and yet turned out very well, and that Tom would be sure to right himself in the end. Richard had been blameless in his whole school course, but though never partaking of the other boy's evil practices, he could not form an independent estimate of character, and his tone had been a little hurt by sharing the school public opinion of morality. He thought Stoneboro and its temptations inevitable, and only wished to make the best of it. Margaret was afraid to harass her father by laying the case before him. All her brothers had gone safely through the school, and it never occurred to her that it was possible that, if her father knew the bias of Tom's disposition, he might choose, for the present at least, some other mode of education. She talked earnestly to Tom, and he listened impatiently. There is an age when boys rebel against female rule, and are not yet softened by the chivalry of manhood, and Tom was at this time of life. He did not like to be lectured by a sister, secretly disputed her right, and, proud of becoming a schoolboy, had not the generous deference for her weakness felt by his elder brothers. He was all the time peeling a stick, as if to show that he was not attending, and he raised up his shoulder pettishly whenever she came to a mention of the religious duty of sincerity. She did not long continue her advice, and, much disappointed and concerned, tried to console herself with hoping that he might have heeded more than he seemed to do. He was placed tolerably high in the school, and Norman, who had the first choice of fags, took him instead of Hector Ernstcliffe, who had just passed beyond the part of the school liable to be fagged. He said he liked school, looked bright when he came home in the evening, and the sisters hoped all was right. Everyone was just now anxiously watching Norman, especially his father, who strove in vain to keep back all manifestation of his earnest desire to see him retain his post. Resolutely did the doctor refrain from asking any questions when the boys came in, but he could not keep his eyes from studying the face to see whether it bore marks of mental fatigue and from following him about the room to discover whether he found it necessary, as he had done last autumn, to spend the evening in study. It was no small pleasure to see him come in with his handful of horse chestnut and hazel buds, and proceed to fetch the microscope and botany books, throwing himself eagerly into the study of the wonders of their infant forms, searching deeply into them with Margaret, and talking them over with his father, who was very glad to promote the pursuit, one in which he had always taken great interest. Another night Dr. May was for a moment disturbed by seeing the school books put out, but Norman had only some notes to compare, and while he did so, he was remarking on Flora's music and joining in the conversation so freely as to prove it was no labor to him. In truth, he was evidently quite recovered, entirely himself again, except that he was less boyish, he had been very lively and full of merry nonsense, but his ardor for play had gone off with his high spirits, and there was a manliness of manner and tone of mind that made him appear above his real age. At the end of a fortnight he volunteered to tell his father that all was right. I am not afraid of not keeping my place, he said. You were quite right, Papa. I am more up to my work than I was ever before, and it comes to me quite fresh and pleasant. I don't promise to get the Randall scholarship, if Forder and Cheviot stay on, but I can quite keep up to the mark in schoolwork. That's right, said Dr. May, much rejoiced. Are you sure you do it with ease and without its haunting you at night? Oh, yes, quite sure. I can't think what has made Dr. Hoxton set us up in such easy things this time. It is very lucky for me, for one gets so much less time to oneself as ducks. "'What? With keeping order?' "'Aye,' said Norman. "'I fancy they think they may take liberties because I am new and young. 
I must have my eye in all corners of the hall at once, and do my own work by snatches as I can. Can you make them attend to you? Why, yes, pretty well, when it comes to the point. Will you or will you not? Cheviot is a great help, too, and has all the weight of being the eldest fellow amongst us. But still you find it harder work than learning? You had rather have to master the dead language than the live tongues? A pretty deal, said Norman, then added, One knows what to be at with the dead better than with the living. They don't make parties against one. I don't wonder at it. It was very hard on some of those great fellows to have me set before them, but I do not think it is fair to visit it by putting up the little boys to all sorts of mischief. Shameful, said the doctor warmly, but never mind, Norman. Keep your temper and do your own duty, and you are man enough to put down such petty spite. I hope I shall manage rightly, said Norman, but I shall be glad if I can get the Randall and get away to Oxford. School is not what it used to be, and if you don't think me too young... No, I don't, certainly not. Trouble has made a man of you, Norman, and you are fitter to be with men than boys. In the meantime, if you can be patient with these fellows, you'll be of great use where you are. If there had been anyone like you at the head of the school in my time, it would have kept me out of no end of scrapes. How does Tom get on? He is not likely to fall into this set, I trust. I'm not sure, said Norman. He does pretty well on the whole. Some of them began by bullying him, and that made him cling to Cheviot and Ernest Cliff and the better party. But lately I have thought Anderson, Jr., rather making up to him, and I don't know whether they don't think that tempting him over to them would be the surest way of vexing me. I have an eye over him, and I hope he may get settled into the steadier sort before next half. After a silence, Norman said, Papa, there is a thing I can't settle in my own mind. Suppose there had been wrong things done when older boys, and excellent ones too, were at the head of the school, yet they never interfered. Do you think I ought to let it go on? Certainly not, or why is power given to you? So I thought, said Norman. I can't see it otherwise. I wish I could, for it will be horrid to set about it, and they'll think it a regular shame in me to meddle. Oh, I know what I came into the study for. I want you to be so kind as to lend me your pocket Greek testament. I gave Harry my little one. You are very welcome. What do you want it for? Norman colored. I met with a sermon the other day that recommended reading a bit of it every day, and I thought I should like to try. Now the confirmation is coming. One can always have some quiet by getting away into the cloister. Bless you, my boy. While you go on in this way... I have not much fear, but that you'll know how to manage. Norman's rapid progress affected another of the household in an unexpected way. Margaret, my dear, I wish to speak to you, said Miss Winter, reappearing when Margaret thought everyone was gone out walking. She would have said, I am very sorry for it, so ominous was the commencement, and her expectations were fulfilled when Miss Winter had solemnly seated herself and taken out her netting. I wish to speak to you about dear Ethel, said the governess. You know how unwilling I always am to make any complaint, but I cannot be satisfied with her present way of going on. Indeed, said Margaret, I am much grieved to hear this. I thought she had been taking great pains to improve. So she was at one time. I would not by any means wish to deny it, and it is not of her learning that I speak, but of a hurried, careless way of doing everything, and an irritability at being interfered with. Margaret knew how Miss Winter often tried Ethel's temper, and was inclined to take her sister's part. Ethel's time is so fully occupied, she said. That is the very thing that I was going to observe, my dear. Her time is too much occupied, and my conviction is that it is hurtful to a girl of her age. This was a new idea to Margaret, who was silent, longing to prove Miss Winter wrong, and not have to see poor Ethel pain by having to relinquish any of her cherished pursuits. "'You see, there is that Coxmore,' said Miss Winter. "'You did not know how far off it is, my dear. Much too great a distance for a young girl to be walking continually in all weathers.' "'That's a question for Papa,' thought Margaret. "'Besides,' continued Miss Winter, "'those children engross almost all her time and thoughts. She is working for them.' 
preparing lessons, running after them continually. It takes off her whole mind from her proper occupations, unsettles her, and I do think it is beyond what befits a young lady of her age. Margaret was silent. In addition, said Miss Winter, she is at every spare moment busy with Latin and Greek, and I cannot think that to keep pace with a boy of Norman's age and ability can be desirable for her. It is a great deal, said Margaret, but... I am convinced that she does more than is right, continued Miss Winter. She may not feel any ill effects at present, but you may depend upon it. It will tell on her by and by. Besides, she does not attend to anything properly. At one time she was improving in neatness and orderly habits. Now you surely must have seen how much less tidy her hair and dress have been. I have thought her hair looking rather rough, said Margaret disconsolately. No wonder, said Miss Winter, for Flora and Mary tell me she hardly spends five minutes over it in the morning, and with a book before her the whole time. If I send her up to make it fit to be seen, I meet with looks of annoyance. She leaves her books in all parts of the schoolroom for Mary to put away, and her table drawer is one mass of confusion. Her lessons she does well enough, I own, though what I should call much too fast. But have you looked at her work lately? She does not work very well, said Margaret, who was at that moment, though Miss Winter did not know it, regathering a poor child's frock that Ethel had galloped through with more haste than good speed. She works a great deal worse than little Blanche, said Miss Winter, and though it may not be the fashion to say so in these days, I consider good needlework far more important than accomplishments. Well, then, Margaret, I should wish you only just to look at her writing and Miss Winter opened a French exercise book, certainly containing anything but elegant specimens of penmanship. Ethel's best writing was an upright, disjointed niggle, looking more like Greek than anything else, except where here and there it made insane efforts to become running hand, and thereby lost its sole previous good quality of legibility, while the lines waved about the sheet in almost any direction but the horizontal. The necessity she believed herself under of doing what Harry called writing with the end of her nose, and her always holding her pen with her fingers almost in the ink, added considerably to the difficulty of the performance. This being at her best, the worst may be supposed to be indescribable, when dashed off in a violent hurry and considerably garnished with blots. Margaret thought she had seen the worst, and was sighing at being able to say nothing for it, when Miss Winter confounded her by turning a leaf and showing it was possible to make a still wilder combination of scramble, niggle, scratch, and crookedness, and this was supposed to be an amended edition. Miss Winter explained that Ethel had, in an extremely short time, performed an exercise in which no fault could be detected except the writing, which was pronounced to be too atrocious to be shown up to M. Ballomp. On being desired to write it over again, she had obeyed with a very bad grace, and some murmurs about Coxmoor, and produced the second specimen, which, in addition to other defects, had some elysians from errant carelessness, depriving it of its predecessor's merits of being good French. Miss Winter had been so provoked that she believed this to be an effect of ill temper, and declared that she should certainly have kept Ethel at home to write it over again, if it had not so happened that Dr. May had proposed to walk part of the way with her and Richard, and the governess was unwilling to bring her into disgrace with him. Margaret was so grateful to her for this forbearance that it disposed her to listen the more patiently to the same representations put in, what Miss Winter fancied, different forms. Margaret was much perplexed. She could not but see much truth in what Miss Winter said, and yet she could not bear to thwart Ethel, whom she admired with her whole heart, and that dry experience and prejudiced preciseness did not seem capable of entering into her sister's thirst for learning and action. When Miss Winter said Ethel would grow up odd, eccentric, and blue, Margaret was ready to answer that she would be superior to everyone, and when the governess urged her to insist on Coxmoor being given up, she felt impatient of that utter want of sympathy for the good work. All that evening Margaret longed for a quiet time to reflect, but it never came till she was in bed, and when she had made up her mind how to speak to Ethel, 
it was five times harder to secure her alone. Even when Margaret had her in the room by herself, she looked wild and eager, and said she could not stay, she had some Thucydides to do. "'Won't you stay with me a little while, quietly?' said Margaret. "'We hardly ever have one of our talks.' "'I didn't mean to vex you, dear Margaret. "'I like nothing so well, only we are never alone, and I've no time. "'Pray do spare me a minute, Ethel, for I have something that I must say to you, "'and I am afraid you won't like it, so do listen kindly.' "'Oh,' said Ethel, "'Miss Winter has been talking to you.' I know she said she would tell you that she wants me to give up Coxmoor. You aren't dreaming of it, Margaret. Indeed, dear Ethel, I should be very sorry, but one thing I am sure of, that there is something amiss in your way of going on. Did she show you that horrid exercise? Yes. Well, I know it was baddish writing, but just listen, Margaret. We promised six of the children to print them each a verse of a hymn on a card to learn. Richie did three and then could not go on, for the book that the others were in was lost till last evening, and then he was writing for Papa. So I thought I would do them before we went to Coxmoor, and that I should squeeze time out of the morning, but I got a bit of Sophocles that was so horribly hard it ate up all my time, and I don't understand it properly now. I must get Norman to tell me. And that ran in my head, and made me make a mistake in my sum, and have to begin it again. Then, just as I thought I had saved time over the exercise, comes Miss Winter and tells me I must do it over again, and scolds me besides about the ink on my fingers. She would send me up at once to get it off, and I could not find Nurse and her bottle of stuff for it, so that wasted ever so much more time, and I was so vexed that, really and truly, my hand shook and I could not write any better. No, I thought it looked as if you had been in one of your agonies, and she thought I did it on purpose, and that made me angry, and so we got into a dispute, and away went all the little moment I might have had, and I was forced to go to Coxmoor as a promise breaker. Don't you think you had better have taken pains at first? Well, so I did with the sense, but I hadn't time to look at the writing much. You would have made better speed if you had. Oh, yes, I know I was wrong, but it is a great plague altogether. "'Really, Margaret, I shan't get Thucydides done. "'You must wait a little longer, please, Ethel, "'for I want to say to you that I am afraid you are doing too much, "'and that prevents you from doing things well, "'as you were trying to do last autumn. "'You are not thinking of my not going to Coxmoor,' "'cried Ethel vehemently. "'I want you to consider what is to be done, dear Ethel. "'You thought, last autumn, a great deal of curing your careless habits.' Now you seem not to have time to attend. You can do a great deal very fast, I know, but isn't it a pity to be always in a hurry? It isn't Coxmoor that is the reason, said Ethel. No, you did pretty well when you began, but you know that was in the holidays, when you had no Latin and Greek to do. Oh, but Margaret, they won't take so much time when I have once got over the difficulties and see my way but just now they have put Norman into such a frightfully difficult play that I can hardly get on at all with it, and there's a new kind of Greek verses, too, and I don't make out from the book how to manage them. Norman showed me on Saturday, but mine won't be right. When I've got over that, I shan't be so hurried. But Norman will go on to something harder, I suppose. I dare say I shall be able to do it. Perhaps you might, but I want you to consider if you are not working beyond what can be good for anybody. You see, Norman is much cleverer than most boys, and you are a year younger, and besides doing all his work at the head of the school, his whole business of the day, you have Coxmore to attend to, and your own lessons, besides reading all the books that come into the house. Now isn't that more than is reasonable to expect any head and hands to do properly? But if I can do it? But can you, dear Ethel, aren't you always racing from one thing to another, doing them by halves, feeling hunted, and then growing vexed? I know I've been cross lately, said Ethel, but it's the being so bothered. And why are you bothered? Isn't it that you undertake too much? What would you have me do, said Ethel, in an injured, unconvinced voice? Not give up my children? No, said Margaret, but don't think me very unkind if I say... 
Suppose you left off trying to keep up with Norman. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, and her eyes filled with tears. We have hardly missed doing the same every day since the first Latin grammar was put into his hands. I know it would be very hard, said Margaret, but Ethel continued in a piteous tone, a little sentimental. From high, high, hock, up to alcaics, and beda, thukadidu, we have gone on together, and I can't bear to give it up. I'm sure I can... Stop, Ethel, I really doubt whether you can. Do you know that Norman was telling Papa the other day that it was very odd Dr. Hoxton gave him such easy lessons? Ethel looked very much mortified. You see, said Margaret kindly, we all know that men have more power than women, and I suppose the time has come for Norman to pass beyond you. He would not be cleverer than anyone if he could not do more than a girl at home. He has so much more time for it, said Ethel. That's the very thing. Now consider, Ethel. His work, after he goes to Oxford, will be doing his very utmost, and you know what an utmost that is. If you could keep up with him at all, you must give your whole time and thoughts to it, and when you had done so, if you could get all the honors in the university, what would it come to? You can't take a first class. I don't want one, said Ethel. I only can't bear not to do as Norman does, and I like Greek so much. And for that, would you give up being a useful, steady daughter and sister at home? The sort of woman that dear Mamma wished to make you and a comfort to Papa. Ethel was silent, and large tears were gathering. You own that that is the first thing? Yes, said Ethel faintly. And that is what she fail in most? Yes. Then, Ethel, dearest, when you made up your mind to Coxmoor, you knew those things could not be done without a sacrifice? Yes, but I didn't think it would be this. Margaret was wise enough not to press her, and she sat down and sighed pitifully. Presently she said, Margaret, if you'd only let me leave off that stupid old French and horrid dull reading with Miss Winter, I should have plenty of time for everything. And what does one learn by hearing Mary read poetry she can't understand? You work, don't you? But indeed, Ethel, don't say that I can let you leave off anything. I don't feel as if I had that authority. If it be done at all, it must be by Papa's consent. And if you wish me to ask him about it, I will, only I think it would vex Miss Winter, and I don't think dear Mamma would have liked Greek and Coxmoor to swallow up all the little common ladylike things. Ethel made two or three great gulps. Margaret, must I give up everything and forget all my Latin and Greek? I should think that would be a great pity, said Margaret, if you were to give up the verse-making, and the trying to do as much as Norman, and fix some time in the day, half an hour perhaps, for your Greek, I think it might do very well. Thank you, said Ethel, but relieved. I'm glad you don't want me to leave it all off. I hope Norman won't be vexed, she added, looking a little melancholy. But Norman had not by any means the sort of sentiment on the subject that she had. Of course, you know, Ethel, said he, it must have come to this some time or other, and if you find those verses too hard, and that they take up too much of your time, you had better give them up. Ethel did not like anything to be said to be too hard for her, and was very near pleading she only wanted time, but some recollection came across her, and presently she said, I suppose it is a wrong sort of ambition to want to learn more, in one's own way, when one is told it is not good for one. I was just going to say I hated being a woman, and having these tiresome little trifles, my duty, instead of learning, which is yours, Norman." "'I'm glad you did not,' said Norman, "'for it would have been very silly of you, "'and I assure you, Ethel, "'it is really time for you to stop, "'or you would get into a regular learned lady "'and be good for nothing. "'I don't mean that knowing more than other people "'would make you so, "'but minding nothing else would.' "'This argument from Norman himself "'did much to reconcile Ethel's mind "'to the sacrifice she had made, "'and when she went to bed "'she tried to work out the question in her own mind.' whether her eagerness for classical learning was a wrong sort of ambition to know what other girls did not, and whether it was right to crave for more knowledge than was thought advisable for her. She only bewildered herself and went to sleep before she had settled anything, but that she knew she must make all give way to Papa first, 
and secondly to Coxmoor. Meanwhile, Margaret had told her father all that had passed. He was only surprised to hear that Ethel had kept up so long with Norman, and thought that it was quite right that she should not undertake so much, agreeing more entirely than Margaret had expected with Miss Winters's view, that it would be hurtful to body as well as mind. "'It is perfectly ridiculous to think of her attempting it,' he said. "'I am glad you have put a stop to it.' "'I am glad I have,' said Margaret, "'and dear Ethel behaved so very well. "'If she had resisted, it would have puzzled me very much. "'I must have asked you to settle it. "'But it is very odd, Papa. "'Ethel is the one of them all who treats me most "'as if I had real authority over her. "'She lets me scold her, asks my leave, "'never seems to recollect for a moment how little older I am "'and how much cleverer she is.' I am sure I never should have submitted so readily, and that always makes it more difficult to me to direct her. I don't like to take upon me with her, because it seems wrong to have her obeying me as if she were a mere child. She is a fine creature, said Dr. May emphatically. It just shows the fact, the higher the mind, the readier the submission. But you don't mean that you have any difficulty with the others. Oh, no, no. Flora never could need any interference, especially from me, and Mary is a thorough good girl. I only meant that Ethel lays herself out to be ruled in quite a remarkable way. I am sure, though she does love learning, her real love is for goodness and for you, Papa. Ethel would have thought her sacrifice well paid for had she seen her father's look of mournful pleasure. End of Part 1, Chapter 18 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gherkin, Gilbert, Arizona. Part 1, Chapter 19 of The Daisy Chain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gherkin, Gilbert, Arizona. THE DAISY CHAIN by Charlotte Mary Young Part 1, Chapter 19 O rueful scene, when from a nook obscure His little sister doth his peril see, All playful as she sate, she grows demure, She finds full soon her wanted spirits flee, She meditates a prayer to set him free. Shenstone the setting sun shone into the great west window of the school at Stoneboro. On its bare walls, the master's desks, the forms polished with use, and the square, inky, hacked and hued chests, carved with the names of many generations of boys. About six or eight little boys were clearing away the books or papers that they, or those who owned them as fags, had left astray, and a good deal of talk and laughing was going on among them. Ha! exclaimed one. Here has Harrison left his book behind him that he was showing us the gladiators in, and, standing by the third master's desk, he turned over a page or two of Smith's antiquities, exclaiming, It is full of pictures. Here's an old man blowing the bellows. Let me see, cried Tom May, precipitating himself across the benches and over the desk, with so little caution that there was an outcry and, to his horror, he beheld the ink spilled over Mr. Harrison's book while, There, August, you've been and done it. You'll catch it, resounded on all sides. What good will stirring with your mouth open do, exclaimed Edward Anderson, the eldest present. Here, a bit of blotting paper this moment. Tom, dreadfully frightened, handed a sheet torn from an old paper case that he had inherited from Harry, saying despairingly, it won't take it out, will it? No, little stupid head, but don't you see? I'm stopping it from running down the edges or soaking in. He won't be the wiser till he opens it again at that place. When he does, he will, said the bewildered Tom. Let him. It won't tell tales. He's coming, cried another boy. He is close at the door. Anderson hastily shut the book over the blotting paper, which he did not venture to retain in his hand, dragged Tom down from the desk and was apparently entirely occupied with arranging his own box when Mr. Harrison came in. Tom crouched behind the raised lid, 
quaking in every limb, conscious he ought to confess, but destitute of resolution to do so, and, in a perfect agony as the master went to his desk, took up the book and carried it away, so unconscious that Larkins, a great wag, only waited till his back was turned to exclaim, Ha! Old fellow, you don't know what you've got there. Hallo! May Junior, will you never leave off staring? You won't see a bit farther for it, said Edward Anderson, shaking him by the ear. Come to your senses, and know your friends. He'll open it, gasped Tom. So he will, but I bet ninety to one it is not at that page, or if he does, it won't tell tales, unless, indeed, he happened to see you standing there, crouching and shaking. That's the right way to bring him upon you. But suppose he opens it, and knows who is in school? What then? Do you think we can't stand by each other and keep our own counsel? But the blotting paper, suppose he knows that? There was a laugh all round at this, as if Harrison knew everyone's blotting paper. Yes, but Harry used to write his name all over his, see, and draw Union Jacks on it. If he did, the date is not there. Do you think the ink is going to say March 2nd? Why should not July have done it last half? July would have told if he had, said Larkins. That's no go. Aye, that's the way. The maids are all like girls. Can't keep a secret. Not one of them. There, I've done more for you than ever one of them would have done. Own it. And he strode up to Tom and grasped his wrist to force a confession from him. But, but he'll ask when he finds it out. Let him. We know nothing about it. Don't be coming the good boy over me like your brothers. That won't do. I know whose eyes are not too short-sighted to read upside down. Tom shrank and looked abject, clinging to the hope that Mr. Harrison would not open the book for weeks, months, or years. But the next morning his heart died within him when he beheld the unfortunate piece of blotting paper displayed by Mr. Harrison with the inquiry whether anyone knew to whom it belonged and what made it worse was that his sight would not reach far enough to assure him whether harry's name was on it and he dreaded that norman or hector earnscliff should recognize the nautical designs however both let it pass and no one through the whole school attempted to identify it one danger was past but the next minute mr harrison opened his smith's antiquities at the page where stood the black witness tom gazed round in despair he could not see his brother's face but Edward Anderson, from the second form, returned him a glance of contemptuous encouragement. This book, said Mr. Harrison, was left in school for a quarter of an hour yesterday. When I opened it again, it was in this condition. Do any of you know how it happened? A silence, and he continued. Who was in school at this time? Anderson, Jr., can you tell me anything of it? No, sir. You know nothing of it? No, sir. Cold chills crept over Tom as Mr. Harrison looked round to refresh his memory. Larkins, do you know how this happened? No, sir, said Larkins boldly, satisfying his conscience because he had not seen the manner of the overthrow. Earnscliff, were you there? No, sir. Tom's timid heart fluttered in dim hope that he had been overlooked as Mr. Harrison paused, then said, Remember, it is concealment that is evil, not the damage to the book. I shall have a good opinion ever after of a boy honest enough to confess. May, Junior, I saw you, he added, hopefully and kindly. Don't be afraid to speak out if you did meet with a mischance. Tom colored and turned pale. Anderson and Larkins grimaced at him to remind him that they had told untruths for his sake and that he must not betray them. It was the justification he wanted. He was relieved to fancy himself obliged to tell the direct falsehood for which a long course of petty active deceits had paved the way, for he was in deadly terror of the effects of truth. No, sir, he could hardly believe he had said the words, or that they would be so readily accepted, for Mr. Harrison had only the impression that he knew who the guilty person was, and would not tell, and, therefore, put no more questions to him, but, after a few more vain inquiries, was baffled, and gave up the investigation. Tom thought he should have been very unhappy. He had always heard that deceit was a heavy burden and would give continual stings, but he was surprised to find himself very comfortable on the whole 
and able to dismiss repentance as well as terror. His many underhand ways with Richard had taken away the tenderness of his conscience, though his knowledge of what was right was clear, and he was quite ready to accept the feeling prevalent at Stoneborough that truth was not made for schoolboys. The axiom was prevalent, but not universal, and parties were running high. Norman May, who as head boy had, in play hours, the responsibility and almost the authority of a master, had taken higher ground than was usual even with the well-disposed, and felt it his duty to check abuses and malpractices that his predecessors had allowed. His friend Cheviot and the right-minded set maintained his authority with all their might, but Harvey Anderson regarded his interference as vexatious, always took the part of the offenders, and opposed him in every possible way, thus gathering as his adherents not only the idle and mischievous, but the weak and mediocre, and, among this set, there was a positive bitterness of feeling to May, and all whom they considered as belonging to him. In shielding Tom May and leading him to deceive, the younger Anderson had gained a conquest. In him the maze had fallen from that pinnacle of truth, which was a standing reproach to the average Stoneborough Code, and, from that time, he was under the especial patronage of his friend. He was taught the most ingenious arts of saying a lesson without learning it, and of showing up other people's tasks. Whispers and signs were directed to him to help him out of difficulties, and he was sought out and put forward whenever a forbidden pleasure was to be enjoyed by stealth. These were his stimulants under a heavy bondage. He was teased and frightened, bullied and tormented, whenever it was the fancy of Ned Anderson and his associates to make his timidity their sport. He was scorned and ill-treated, and driven by bodily terror, into acts alarming to his conscience, dangerous in their consequences, and painful in the perpetration, and yet, among all his sufferings, the little coward dreaded nothing so much as truth, though it would have set him free at once from this wretched tyranny. Excepting on holidays, and at hours when the town boys were allowed to go home, there were strict rules confining all except the sixth form to their bounds, consisting of two large courts and an extensive field bordered by the river and the road. On the opposite side of the bridge was a turnpike gate, where the keeper exposed stalls of various eatables, very popular among the boys, chiefly because they were not allowed to deal there. Ginger beer could also be procured, and there were suspicions that the bottle so-called contained something contraband. August, said Norman, as they were coming home from school one evening, did I see you coming over the bridge? Tom would not answer. So you have been at Ball Hatchet's gate? I can't think what could take you there. If you want tarts, I am sure poor old Betty's are just as good. What made you go there? Nothing, said Tom. Well, mind you don't do it again, or I shall have to take you in hand, which I shall be very sorry to do. That man is a regular bad character and neither my father nor Dr. Hoxton would have one of us have anything to do with him, as you know. Tom was in hopes it was over, but Norman went on. I am afraid you are getting into a bad way. Why won't you mind what I have told you plenty of times before, that no good comes of going after Ned Anderson and Axworthy and that set? What were you doing with them today? But receiving no answer, he went on. You always sulk when I speak to you. I suppose you think I have no right to row you, but I do it to save you from worse. You can't never be found out. This startled Tom, but Norman had no suspicion. If you go on, you will get into some awful scrape, and Papa will be grieved. I would not, for all the world, have him put out of heart about you. Think of him, Tom, and try to keep straight. Tom would say nothing, only reflecting that his elder brother was harder upon him than anyone else would be, and Norman grew warmer. If you let Anderson Jr. get hold of you and teach you his tricks, you'll never be good for anything. He seems good-natured now, but he will turn against you, as he did with Harry. I know how it is, and you had better take my word and trust to me and straightforwardness when you get into a mess. I'm in no scrape, said Tom, so doggedly that Norman lost patience and spoke with more displeasure. You will be then, if you go out of bounds and run Anderson's errands and shirk work. You'd better take care. 
it is my place to keep order and i can't let you off for being my brother so remember if i catch you going to ball hatchets again you may make sure of a licking so the warning closed tom more alarmed at the aspect of right which he fancied terrific and norman with some compunction at having lost temper and threatened when he meant to have gained him by kindness norman recollected his threat with a qualm of dismay when at the end of the week as he was returning from a walk with chivio tom darted out of the gatehouse he was flying across the bridge with something under his arm when norman laid a detaining hand on his collar making a sign at the same time to chevio to leave them what are you doing here said norman sternly marching tom into the field so you've been there again what's that under your jacket only only what i was sent for and he tried to squeeze it under the flap what is it a bottle only only a bottle of ink norman seized it and gave tom a fierce angry shake but the indignation was mixed with sorrow oh tom tom these fellows have brought you a pretty pass who would have thought of such a thing from us tom cowered but felt only terror speak truth said norman ready to shake it out of him is this for anderson jr under those eyes flashing with generous sorrowful wrath he dared not utter another falsehood but anderson's threats chained him and he preferred his thraldom to throwing himself on the mercy of his brother who loved him he would not speak i am glad it is not for yourself said norman but do you remember what i said in case i found you there again oh don't don't cried the boy i would never have gone if they had not made me made you said norman disdainfully how they would have thrashed me they pinched my fingers in the box they pulled my ears oh don't poor little fellow said norman but it is your own fault if you won't keep with me or ernst cliff of course they will bully you but i must not let you off i must keep my word tom cried sobbed and implored in vain i can't help it he said and now don't howl i had rather no one knew it it will soon be over i never thought to have this to do to one of us tom roared and struggled till releasing him he said there that will do stop bellowing I was obliged, and I can't have hurt you much, have I? He added more kindly, while Tom went on crying and turning from him. It is nothing to care about, I am sure. Look up, and he pulled down his hands. Say you are sorry, speak the truth. Keep with me, and no one shall hurt you again. Very different this from Tom's chosen associates, but he was still obdurate, sullen, and angry, and would not speak, nor open his heart to those kind words after one more i could not help it tom you've no business to be sulky norman took up the bottle opened it smelled and tasted and was about to throw it into the river when tom exclaimed oh don't don't what will they do to me give it to me did they give you the money to pay for it yes let me have it how much was it four pence i'll settle that and the bottle splashed in the river now then tom don't brood on it any more here's a chance for you of getting quit of their errands if you will keep in my sight i'll take care no one bulls you and you may still leave off these disgraceful tricks and do well but tom's evil spirit whispered that norman had beaten him that he should never have any diversion again and that anderson would punish him and there was a sort of satisfaction in seeing that his perverse silence really distressed his brother if you will go on in this way i can't help it but you'll be sorry some day said norman and he walked thoughtfully on looking back to see whether tom was following as he did slowly meditating on the way how he should avert his tyrant's displeasure norman stood for a moment at the door surveying the court then walked up to a party of boys and laid his hand on the shoulder of one holding a silver fourpence to him anderson jr said he there's your money I am not going to let Stoneboro School be turned into a gin palace. I give you notice. It is not to be. Now you are not to bully May Jr. for telling me. He did not. I found him out. Leaving Anderson to himself, he looked for Tom, but not seeing him, he entered the cloister, for it was the hour when he used to read there, but he could not fix his mind. He went to the bench where he had lain on the examination day, and kneeling on it looked out on the green grass where the graves were 
"'Mother, mother,' he murmured, "'have I been harsh to your poor little tender, sickly boy? "'I couldn't help it. "'Oh, if you were but here, we are all going wrong. "'What shall I do? "'How should Tom be kept from this evil? "'It is ruining him, mean, false, cowardly, sullen, "'all that is worst, and your son. "'Oh, mother, and all I do only makes him shrink more from me. "'It will break my father's heart.' and you will not be there to comfort him. Norman covered his face with his hands, and a fit of bitter grief came over him. But his sorrow was now not what it had been before his father's resignation had tempered it, and soon it turned to prayer, resolution, and hope. He would try again to reason quietly with him, when the alarm of detection and irritation should have gone off, and he sought for the occasion. But, alas, Tom had learned to look on all reproof as rowing, and considered it as an additional injury from a brother who, according to the Anderson view, should have connived at his offences, and turned a deafened ear and dogged countenance to all he said. The foolish boy sought after the Anderson still more, and Norman became more dispirited about him, greatly missing Harry, that constant companion and follower, who would have shared his perplexities, and removed half of them, in his own part of the school, by the influence of his high, courageous, and truthful spirit. In the meantime, Richard was studying hard at home, with greater hopefulness and vigor than he had ever thrown into his work before. Suppose, Ethel had once said to him, that when you are a clergyman, you could be curate of Coxmoor when there is a church there. When? said Richard, smiling at the presumption of the scheme, and yet it formed itself into a sort of definite hope. Perhaps they might persuade Mr. Ramsden to take him as a curate with a view to Coxmoor, and this prospect, vague as it was, gave an object and hope to his studies. Everyone thought the delay of his examination favorable to him, and he now read with a determination to succeed. Dr. May had offered to let him read with Mr. Harrison, but Richard thought he was getting on pretty well with the help Norman gave him for it appeared that ever since Norman's return from London, he had been assisting Richard, who was not above being taught by a younger brother, while, on the other hand, Norman, much struck by his humility, would not for the world have published that he was fit to act as his elder's tutor. One evening, when the two boys came in from school, Tom gave a great start, and, pulling Mary by the sleeve, whispered, "'How came that book here?' "'It is Mr. Harrison's. "'Yes, I know, but how came it here?' "'Richard borrowed it to look out something, "'and Ethel brought it down. "'A little reassured, "'Tom took up an exciting storybook "'and ensconced himself by the fire, "'but his agonies were great "'during the ensuing conversation. "'Norman!' Ethel was exclaiming in delight. "'Do you know this book?' "'Smith? "'Yes, it is in the school library.' "'There's everything in it that one wants, I do believe. "'Here is such an account of ancient galleys. "'I never knew how they managed their banks of rowers before. "'Oh, and the Greek houses! "'Look at the pictures, too!' "'Some of them are the same as Mr. Rivers's gems,' said Norman, "'standing behind her, and turning the leaves in search of a favorite. "'Oh, what did I see? "'Is that ink?' said Flora, from the opposite side of the table." "'Yes, didn't you hear?' said Ethel. "'Mr. Harrison told Ritchie when he borrowed it "'that unluckily one day this spring he left it in school "'and some of the boys must have upset an inkstand over it. "'But, though he asked them all round, each denied it. "'How I should hate for such things to happen, "'and it was a prize book, too.' "'While Ethel spoke, she opened the marked page "'to show the extent of the calamity, "'and as she did so, Mary exclaimed, "'Dear me!' How funny! Why, how did Harry's blotting paper get in there? Tom shrank into nothing, set his teeth, and pinched his fingers, ready to wish they were on Mary's throat, more especially as the words made some sensation. Richard and Margaret exchanged looks, and their father, who had been reading, sharply raised his eyes and said, Harry's blotting paper? How do you know that, Mary? It is Harry's, said she, all unconscious because of that anchor up in one corner and the union jack in the other. Don't you see, Ethel? Yes, said Ethel. Nobody drew that but Harry. 
Ay, and there are his buttons, said Mary, much amused and delighted with these relics of her beloved Harry. Don't you remember one day last holidays? Papa desired Harry to write and ask Mr. Ernstcliff what clothes he ought to have for the naval school, and all the time he was writing the letter, he was drawing sailor's buttons on his blotting paper. I wonder how ever it got into Mr. Harrison's book. Poor Mary's honest wits did not jump to a conclusion quite so fast as other people's, and she little knew what she was doing when, as a great discovery, she exclaimed, I know, Harry gave his paper case to Tom. That's the way it got to school. Tom, exclaimed his father, suddenly and angrily, where are you going? To bed, muttered the miserable Tom, twisting his hands. A dead silence of consternation fell on all the room. Mary gazed from one to the other, mystified at the effect of her words, frightened at her father's loud voice, and at Tom's trembling confusion. The stillness lasted for some moments, and was first broken by Flora, as if she had caught at a probability. Someone might have used the first blotting paper that came to hand. "'Come here, Tom,' said the doctor, in a voice not loud, but trembling with anxiety, then laying his hand on his shoulder. "'Look in my face.' Tom hung his head, and his father put his hand under his chin, and raised the pale, terrified face. Don't be afraid to tell us the meaning of this. If any of your friends have done it, we will keep your secret. Look up and speak out. How did your blotting paper come there? Tom had been attempting his former system of silent sullenness, but there was anger at Mary, and fear of his father to agitate him, and in his impatient desire at thus being held in question, he burst out into a violent fit of crying. "'I can't have you roaring here to distress Margaret,' said Dr. May. "'Come into the study with me.' But Tom, who seemed fairly out of himself, would not stir, and a screaming and kicking scene took place before he was carried into the study by his brothers, and there left with his father. Mary, meantime, dreadfully alarmed, and perceiving that, in some way, she was the cause, had thrown herself upon Margaret, sobbing inconsolably as she begged to know what was the matter and why papa was angry with tom had she made him so margaret caressed and soothed her to the best of her ability trying to persuade her that if tom had done wrong it was better for him it should be known and assuring her that no one could think her unkind nor a tell-tale then dismissing her to bed and mary was not unwilling to go for she could not bear to meet tom again only begging in a whisper to Ethel, that, if dear Tom had not done it, she would come and tell her. "'I am afraid there is no hope of that,' sighed Ethel, as the door closed on Mary. "'After all,' said Flora, "'he has not said anything. If he has only done it, and not confessed, that is not so bad. It is only the usual fashion of boys.' "'Has he been asked? Did he deny it?' said Ethel, looking in Norman's face, as if she hardly ventured to put the question— and she only received sorrowful signs as answers. At the same moment, Dr. May called him. No one spoke. Margaret rested her head on the sofa and looked very mournful. Richard stood by the fire without moving limb or feature. Flora worked fast, and Ethel leaned back on an armchair, biting the end of a paper knife. The doctor and Norman came back together. "'I have sent him up to bed,' said Dr. May. "'I must take him to Harrison tomorrow morning.' It is a terrible business. Has he confessed it? said Margaret. I can hardly call such a thing a confession. I warmed it out bit by bit. I could not tell whether he was telling truth or not till I called Norman in. But he has not said anything more untrue? Yes, he has, though, said Dr. May indignantly. He said Ned Anderson put the paper there and had been taking up the ink with it. Twas his doing. Then when I came to cross-examine him, I found that, though Anderson did take up the ink, it was Tom himself who knocked it down. I never heard anything like it. I never could have believed it. It must all be Ned Anderson's doing, cried Flora. They are enough to spoil anybody. I am afraid they have done him a great deal of harm, said Norman. And what have you been about all this time, exclaimed the doctor, too keenly grieved to be just. I should have thought that with you at the head of the school, the child might have been kept out of mischief. But there have you been going your own way, and leaving him to be ruined by the very worst set of boys. 
Norman's color rose with the extreme pain this unjust accusation caused him, and his voice, though low, was not without irritation. I have tried. I have not done as much as I ought, perhaps, but... No, I think not, indeed, interrupted his father. Sending a boy there, brought up as he had been without the least tendency to deceit? Here no one could see Norman's burning cheeks, and brow bent downwards in the effort to keep back an indignant reply without bursting out in exculpation. And Richard looked up, while the three sisters all at once began, Oh, no, no, Papa, and left Margaret to finish. Poor little Tom had not always been quite sincere. Indeed, and why was I left to send him to school without knowing it? The place of all others to foster deceit. It was my fault, Papa, said Margaret. And mine, put in Richard, and she continued, Ethel told us we were very wrong, and I wish we had followed her advice. It was by far the best, but we were afraid of vexing you. Everyone seems to have been combined to hide what they ought not, said Dr. May, though speaking to her much more softly than to Norman, to whom he turned angrily again. Pray, how came you not to identify this paper? I did not know it, said Norman, speaking with difficulty. He ought never to have been sent to school, said the doctor, that tendency was the very worst beginning. It was a great pity. I was very wrong, said Margaret, in great concern. I did not mean to blame you, my dear, said her father affectionately. I know you only meant to act for the best, but... And he put his hand over his face, and then came the sighing groan, which pained Margaret ten thousand times more than reproaches, and which, in an instant, dispersed all the indignation burning within Norman, though the pain remained at his father's thinking him guilty of neglect, but he did not like, at that moment, to speak in self-justification. After a short space, Dr. May desired to hear what were the deceptions to which Margaret had alluded, and made Norman tell what he knew of the affair of the blotted book. Ethel spoke hopefully when she had heard it. Well, do you know, I think he will do better now. You see, Edward made him conceal it, and he has been going on with it on his mind, and in that boy's power ever since. But now it is cleared up and confessed, he will begin afresh and do better. Don't you think so, Norman? Don't you, Papa? I should have more hope if I had seen anything like confession or repentance, said Dr. May, but that provoked me more than all. I could only perceive that he was sorry to be found out and afraid of punishment. Perhaps, when he has recovered the first fright, he will come to his better self, said Margaret, for she guessed, what indeed was the case, that the doctor's anger on this first shock of the discovery of the fault he most abhorred had been so great that a fearful cowering spirit would be completely overwhelmed, and, as there had been no sorrow shown for the fault, there had been none of that softening and relenting that won so much love and confidence." Everyone felt that talking only made them more unhappy. They tried to return to their occupations, and so passed the time till night. Then, as Richard was carrying Margaret upstairs, Norman lingered to say, Papa, I am very sorry you should think I neglected Tom. I dare say I might have done better for him, but, indeed, I have tried. I am sure you have, Norman. I spoke hastily, my boy. You will not think more of it. When a thing like this comes on a man, he hardly knows what he says. If Harry were here, said Norman, anxious to turn from the real loss and grief, as well as to talk away that feeling of being apologized to, it would all do better. He would make a link with Tom, but I have so little, naturally, to do with the second form, that it is not easy to keep him in sight. Yes, yes, I know that very well. It is no one's fault but my own. I should not have sent him there without knowing him better. But you see how it is, Norman. I have trusted to her till I have grown neglectful, and it is well if it is not the ruin of him. Perhaps he will take a turn, as Ethel says, answered Norman cheerfully. Good night, Papa. I have a blessing to be thankful for in you, at least, murmured the doctor to himself. What other young fellow of that age and spirit would have borne so patiently with my injustice? Not I, I am sure. A fine father I show myself to these poor children. Neglect, helplessness, temper. Oh, Maggie! Margaret had so bad a headache the next day that she could not come downstairs. 
The punishment was, they heard, a flogging at the time, and an imposition so long that it was likely to occupy a large portion of the play hours till the end of the half-year. His father said, and Norman silently agreed, a very good thing, it will keep him out of mischief, but Margaret only wished she could learn it from him, and took upon herself all the blame from beginning to end. She said little to her father, for it distressed him to see her grieved. He desired her not to dwell on the subject, caressed her, called her his comfort and support, and did all he could to console her, but it was beyond his power. Her sisters, by listening to her, only made her worse. Dear, dear Papa, she exclaimed, how kind he is, but he can never depend upon me again. I have been the ruin of my poor little Tom. Well, said Richard quietly, I can't see why you should put yourself into such a state about it. This took Margaret by surprise. Have not I done very wrong, and perhaps hurt Tom for life? I hope not, said Richard. You and I made a mistake, but it does not follow that Tom would have kept out of this scrape if we had told my father our notion. It would not have been on my conscience, said Margaret. He would not have sent him to school. I don't know that, said Richard. At any rate, we meant to do right, and only made a mistake. It was unfortunate, but I can't tell why you go on and make yourself ill by fancying it worse than it is. The boy has done very wrong, but people get cured of such things in time, and it is nonsense to fret as if you were not a mere child of eight years old. You did not teach him deceit. No, but I concealed it. Papa is disappointed when he thought he could trust me. Well, I suppose no one could expect never to make mistakes, said Richard, in his sober tone. Self-sufficiency, exclaimed Margaret. That has been the root of all. Do you know, Richie, I believe I was expecting that I could always judge rightly. You generally do, said Richard. No one else could do half what you do. So you have said, Papa, and all of you, till you have spoilt me. I have thought it myself, Richie. It is true, said Richard. But then, said Margaret, I have grown to think much of it, and not like to be interfered with. I thought I could manage by myself, and when I said I would not worry Papa, it was half because I liked the doing and settling all about the children myself. Oh, if it could have been visited in any way but by poor Tom's faults! Well, said Richard, if you felt so, it was a pity, though I never should have guessed it. But you see, you will never feel so again, and as Tom is only one, and there are nine to govern, it is all for the best. His deliberate common sense made her laugh a little, and she owned he might be right. It is a good lesson against my love of being first. But indeed, it is difficult. Papa can so little bear to be harassed. He could not at first, but now he is strong and well. It is different. He looks terribly thin and worn still, sighed Margaret. So much older. I, I think he will never get back his young looks, but except his weak arm, he is quite well. And then his, his quick way of speaking may do harm. Yes, that was what I feared for Tom, said Richard. And there was the mistake. I see it now. My father always is right in the main, though he is apt to frighten one at first, and it is what ought to be that he should rule his own house. But now, Margaret, it is silly to worry about it any more. Let me fetch baby, and don't think of it. And Margaret allowed his reasonableness, and let herself be comforted. After all, Richard's solid soberness had more influence over her than anything else. End of Part 1 Chapter 19 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. Part 1, Chapter 20 of The Daisy Chain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by charlotte mary young part one chapter twenty think how simple things and lowly have a part in nature's plan how the great hath small beginnings and the child will be a man little efforts work great actions lessons in our childhood taught 
mold the spirit of that temper whereby blessed deeds are wrought cherish then the gifts of childhood use them gently guard them well for their future growth and greatness who can measure who can tell moral songs the first shock of tom's misdemeanor passed away though it still gave many an anxious thought to such of the family as felt responsible for him the girls were busily engaged in preparing an easter feast for cocksmoor mr wilmot was to examine the scholars and buns and tea were provided in addition to which ethel designed to make a present to every one a great task considering that the cocksmoor funds were reserved for absolute necessaries and were at a very low ebb so that twenty-five gifts were to be composed out of nothing there was a grand turnout of drawers of rubbish all over margaret raising such a cloud of dust as nearly choked her what cannot rubbish and willing hands effect envelopes and wafer boxes were ornamented with pictures bags needle cases and pin cushions beautiful balls tippets both of list and gay print and even sunbonnets and pinafores were contrived to the supreme importance and delight of marian blanche who found it as good or better than play and ranged their performances in rows till the room looked like a bazaar to provide for boys was more difficult but richard mended old toys and repaired the frames of slates and norman's contribution of half a crown bought mugs marbles and penny knives and there were even hopes that something would remain for bodkins to serve as nozzles to the bellows which were the pride of blanche's heart never were easter gifts the source of more pleasure to the givers especially when the nursery establishment met dr hoxton near the pastry cook's shop and he bestowed on blanche a packet of variegated sugar plums all of which she literally poured out at ethel's feet saying i don't want them only let me have one for aubrey because he is so little all the rest are for the poor children at cocksmoor after this margaret declared that blanche must be allowed to buy the bodkin and give her bellows to jane taylor the only cocksmoor child she knew and whom she always destined in turn every gift that she thought most successful so blanche went with flora to the toy shop and there fell in love with a little writing box that so eclipsed the bellows that she tried to persuade flora to buy it for jane taylor to be kept till she could write and was much disappointed to hear that it was out of the question just then a carriage stopped and from it stepped the pretty little figure of maida rivers oh how do you do how delightful to meet you i was wondering if we should little blanche too kissing her and here's mrs larpent mrs larpent miss flora may how is miss may this was all uttered in eager delight and flora equally pleased answered the inquiries i hope you are not in a hurry proceeded meta i want your advice you know all about schools don't you i am come to get some easter presents for our children and i am sure you can help me are the children little or big asked flora oh all sorts and sizes i have some books for the great sensible ones and some stockings and shoes for the tiresome stupid ones but there are some dear little pets that i want nice things for there there's a doll that looks just fit for little curly-headed annie langley don't you think so mrs larpent the price of the doll was a shilling and there were quickly added to it boxes of toys elaborate beadwork pin cushions polished blue and green boxes the identical writing case even a small noah's ark Maida hardly asked the prices which certainly were not extravagant since she had nearly twenty articles for little more than a pound papa has given me a benefaction of five pounds for my school gifts said she is not that charming i wish you would come to the feast now do it is on easter tuesday won't you come thank you i am afraid we can't i should like it very much you never will come to me you have no compassion we should enjoy coming very much perhaps in the summer when margaret is better could not she spare any of you well i shall talk to papa and make him talk to dr may mrs larpent will tell you i always get my way don't i good-bye see if i don't she departed and flora returned to her own business but blanche's interest was gone dazzled by the more lavish gifts she looked listlessly and disdainfully at bodkins three for two pence i wish i might have bought the writing-box for janet taylor why does not papa give us money to get pretty things for the children said she as soon as they came out 
because he is not so rich as Miss Rivers's papa. Laura was interrupted by meeting the Mrs. Anderson, who asked, Was not that carriage Mr. Rivers's of Abbotstroke Grange? Yes, we like Miss Rivers very much, said Flora, resolved to show that she was acquainted. Oh, do you visit her? I knew he was a patient of Dr. May. Flora thought there was no need to tell that the only call had been owing to the rain, and continued. She has been begging us to come to her school feast, but I do not think we can manage it. Oh, indeed. The Grange is very beautiful, is it not? Very, said Flora. Good morning. Flora had a little uneasiness in her conscience, but it was satisfactory to have put down Louisa Anderson, who never could aspire to an intimacy with Miss Rivers. Her little sister looked up. Why, Flora, have you seen the Grange? No, but Papa and Norman said so and Blanche showed that the practical lesson on the palms of the world was not lost on her by beginning to wish they were as rich as Miss Rivers. Flora told her it was wrong to be discontented, but the answer was, I don't want it for myself, I want to have pretty things to give away, and her mind could not be turned from the thought by any attempt of her sister. Even when they met Dr. May coming out of the hospital, Blanche renewed the subject. She poured out the catalogue of Miss Rivers's purchases, making appealing attempts at looking under his spectacles into his eyes, and he perfectly understood the tenor of her song. "'I have had a sight, too, of little maidens preparing Easter gifts,' said he. "'Have you, Papa? What were they? Were they as nice as Miss Rivers's? "'I don't know, but I thought they were the best sort of gifts, "'for I saw that plenty of kind thought and clever contrivance went to them, "'I, and some little self-denial, too.' "'Papa, you look as if you meant something, but ours are nothing but nasty old rubbish. "'Perhaps some fairy or something better has brought a wand to touch the rubbish, Blanche, "'for I think that the maidens gave what would have been worthless kept, "'but became precious as they gave it. "'Do you mean the list of our flannel petticoats, Papa, that Mary has made into a tippet? "'Perhaps I meant Mary's own time and pains, as well as the tippet. "'Would she have done much good with him otherwise?' No, she would have played. Oh, then you like the presents because they are on making? I never thought of that. Was that the reason you did not give us any of your sovereigns to buy things with? Perhaps I want my sovereigns for the eleven gaping mouths at home, Blanche, but would not it be a pity to spoil your pleasure? You would have lost all the chattering and laughing and buzzing I have heard round Margaret of late, and I am quite sure Miss Rivers can hardly be as happy in the gifts that cost her nothing as one little girl who gives her sugar plums out of her own mouth. Blanche clasped her papa's hand tight, and bounded five or six times. They are our presents, not yours, said she. Yes, I see. I like them better now. Ay, ay, said the doctor. Seeing Miss Rivers's must not take the shine out of yours, my little maids. For if you can't give much, you have the pleasure of giving the best of all, your labor of love. Then thinking on, and speaking to Flora, the longer I live, the more I see the blessing of being born in a state of life where you can't both eat your cake and give it away. Flora never was at ease in a conversation with her father. She could not follow him, and did not like to show it. She answered aside from the mark, you would not have Blanche underrate Miss Rivers? No, indeed. She is as good and sweet a creature as ever came across me. Most kind to Margaret and loving to all the world. I like to see one whom care and grief have never set their grip upon. Most likely she would do like Ethel, if she had the opportunity, but she has not. So she has not the same merit, said Flora? We don't talk of merit. I mean that the power of sacrifice is a great advantage. The habit of small sacrifice that is made necessary in a large family is a discipline that only children are without. And so, with regard to wealth, I think people are to be pitied who can give extensively out of such abundance that they can hardly feel the want. In effect, they can do much more, said Flora. I'm not sure of that. They can, of course, but it must be at the cost of personal labor and sacrifice. I have often thought of the words, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And such as we have, it is that does the good. The gold, if we have it, but, at any rate, the personal influence, the very proof of sincerity, shown by the exertion and self-denial, tells far more than money lightly come by, lightly spent. 
Do you mean that a person who maintained a whole school would do less good than one who taught one child? If the rich person take no pains, and leave the school to take care of itself, nay, if he only visit it now and then, and never let it inconvenience him, has he the least security that the scholars are obtaining any real good from it? If the teacher of the one child is doing his utmost, he is working for himself at least. Suppose we could build, say, our church and school on Coxmoor at once, and give our superintendents besides. If things were ripe for it, the means would come. As it is, it is a fine field for Ethel and Richard. I believe it will be the making of them both. I am sure it is training Ethel, or making her train herself, as we could never have done without it. But here, come in and see old Mrs. Robbins. A visit from you will cheer her up. Flora was glad of the interruption. The conversation was uncomfortable to her. She almost fancied her papa was moralizing for their good, but that he carried it too far, for wealthy people assuredly had it in their power to do great things, and might work as hard themselves. Besides, it was finer in them. There was so much eclat in their stooping's charity. But her knowledge of his character would not allow her to think for a moment that he could say aught, but from the bottom of his heart. No, it was one of his one-sided views that led him into paradox. It was just like Papa, and so there was no need to attend to it. It was one of his enthusiasms. He was so very fond of Ethel, probably because of her likeness to himself. Flora thought Ethel put almost too forward. They all helped at Coxmoor, and Ethel was very queer and unformed, and could do nothing by herself. The only thing Flora did keep in her mind was that her papa had spoken to her as if she were a woman compared with Ethel. Little Blanche made her report of the conversation to Mary, that it was so nice, and now she did not care about Miss Rivers's fine presence at all, for Papa said what one made oneself was better to give than what one bought. And Papa said, too, that it was a good thing not to be rich, for then one never felt the miss of what one gave away. Margaret, who overheard the exposition, thought it so much to Blanche's credit that she could not help repeating it in the evening, after the little girl was gone to bed, when Mr. Wilmot had come in to arrange the program for Coxmoor. So the little fit of discontent and its occasion, the meeting with Mena Rivers, were discussed. Yes, said Mr. Wilmot, those Riverses are open-handed. They really seem to have so much money that they don't know what to do with it. My brother is ready to complain that they spoil his parish. It is all meant so well, and they are so kind-hearted and excellent, that it is a shame to find fault, and I tell Charles and his wife that their grumbling at such a squire proves them the most spoiled of all. Indiscriminate liberality? asked the doctor. I should guess the old gentleman to be rather soft. That's one thing. The parish is so small, and there are so few to shower all this bounty on, and they are so utterly unused to country people. They seem to think... By laying out money they can get a show set of peasants in rustic cottages, just as they have their fancy cows and poultry, all that a fancy eye out of the way. Making it a matter of taste, said the doctor. I'm sure I would, said Norman, aside to Ethel. What's the use of getting oneself disgusted? One must not begin with showing dislike, began Ethel. Or, I, you like rags, don't you? But hush! "'That is just what I should expect of Mr. Rivers,' said Dr. May. "'He has cultivated his taste till it is getting to be a disease, "'but his daughter has no lack of wit.' "'Perhaps not. "'Charles and Mary are very fond of her, but she is entirely inexperienced, "'and that is a serious thing with so much money to throw about. "'She pays people for sending their children to school "'and keeping their houses tidy, "'and there is so much given away.' that it is enough to take away all independence and motive for exertion. The people speculate on it, and take it as a right. By and by there will be a reaction. She will find out she is imposed upon, take offense, and for the rest of her life will go about saying how ungrateful the poor are. It is a pity good people won't have a little common sense, said Dr. May, but there's something so bewitching in that little girl that I can't give her up. I verily believe she will write herself. 
I have scarcely seen her, said Mr. Wilmot. She has won Papa's heart by her kindness to me, said Margaret, smiling. You see her beautiful flowers? She seems to be made to lavish pleasures on others wherever she goes. Oh, yes, they are most kind-hearted, said Mr. Wilmot. It is only the excess of a virtue that could be blamed in them, and they are most valuable to the place. She will learn experience in time. I only hope she will not be spoiled. Flora felt as if her father must be thinking his morning's argument confirmed, and she was annoyed. But she thought there was no reason why wealth should not be used sensibly, and if she were at the head of such an establishment as the Grange, her charity should be so well regulated as to be the subject of general approbation. She wanted to find someone else on her side, and, as they went to bed, she said to Ethel, "'Don't you wish we had some of this superfluity of the Riverses for poor Coxmoor? "'I wish we had anything for Coxmoor. "'Here's a great hole in my boot, and Nurse says I must get a new pair. "'That is seven and sixpence gone. "'I shall never get the first pound made up towards building.' "'And pounds seem nothing to them,' said Flora. "'Yes, but if they don't manage right with them. "'I'll tell you, Flora, I got into a fit of wishing the other day. "'It does seem such a grievous pity to see those children running to waste "'for want of daily teaching, and Jenny Hall had forgotten everything. "'I was vexed and thought it was all no use while we could not do more. "'But just then I began to look out the texts that Richie had marked for me "'to print for them to learn, and the first was— be thou faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. And then I thought, perhaps we were learning to be faithful with a few things. I am sure what they said to-night showed it was lucky we have not more in our hands. I should do wrong for ever with the little we have if it were not for Richie and Margaret. By the time we have really got the money together for the school, perhaps I shall have more sense. Got the money? As if we ever could. "'Oh, yes, we shall and will. "'It need not be more than seventy pounds,' Richie says, "'and I have twelve shillings for certain put out from the money for hire of the room, "'and the books and the clothes, and in spite of these horrid boots, "'I shall save something out of this quarter, half a crown at least, "'and I have another plan besides.' "'But Flora had to go down to Margaret's room to bed. "'Flora was always ready to throw herself into the present.' and liked to be the most useful person in all that went forward, so that no thoughts of greatness interfered with her enjoyment at Coxmoor. The house seemed wild that Easter Monday morning. Ethel, Mary, and Blanche flew about in all directions, and in spite of much undoing of their own arrangements, finished their preparations so much too early that, at half-past eleven, Mary complained that she had nothing to do, and that dinner would never come. Many were the lamentations at leaving Margaret behind, but she answered them by talking of the treat of having Papa all to herself, for he had lent them the gig, and promised to stay home all the afternoon with her. The first division started on foot directly after dinner, the real council of education, as Norman called them, namely Mr. Wilmot, Richard, Ethel, and Mary. Flora, the other member, waited to take care of Blanche and Aubrey, who were to come in the gig, with the cakes tea kettles and prizes driven by norman tom and hector ernstcliffe were invited to join the party and many times did mary wish for harry supremely happy were the young people as they reached the common and heard the shout of tumultuous joy raised by their pupils who were on the watch for them all was now activity everybody tripped into mrs green's house while richard and ethel ran different ways to secure that the fires were burning which they had hired to boil their kettles with the tea in them then when the kitchen was so full that it seemed as if it could hold no more some kind of order was produced the children were seated on their benches and while the mother stood behind to listen mr wilmot began to examine as well as he could in so crowded an audience there was progress yes there was only three were as utterly rude and idealist as they used to be at christmas glimmerings had dawned on most and one una mccarthy was fit to come forward to claim Mr. Wilmot's promise of a prayer book. She could really read and say the catechism. Her Irish wit and love of learning had outstripped all the rest, and she was the pride of Ethel's heart, fit now to present herself on equal terms with the Stoneboro set, as far as her sense was concerned. 
though, alas, neither present nor exhortation had succeeded in making her anything in looks but a picturesque tatterdemalion, her sandy elf locks streaming over a pair of eyes, so dancing and gracieuses that it was impossible to scold her. With beating heart, as if her own success in life depended forever on the way her flock acquitted themselves, Ethel stood by Mr. Wilmot, trying to read answers coming out of the dull mouths of her children, and looking exultingly at Richard whenever some good reply was made, especially when Una answered an unexpected question. It was too delightful to hear how well she remembered all the history up to the flood, and how prettily it came out in her Irish accent. That made up for all the atrocious stupidity of others who, after being told every time since they had begun who gave their names, now chose to forget. In the midst, while the assembly were listening with admiration to the reading of the scholar next in proficiency to Una, a boy who could read words of five letters without spelling, there was a fresh squeezing at the door, and, the crowd opening as well as it could, in came Flora and Blanche, while Norman's head was seen for a moment in the doorway. Flora's whisper to Ethel was her first discovery that the closeness and the heat of the room was nearly overpowering. Her excitement had made all be forgotten. Could not a window be opened? Mrs. Green interfered. It had been nailed up because her husband had the rheumatiz. Where's Aubrey? asked Mary. With Norman. Norman said he would not let him go into the black hole, so he has got him out of doors. Ethel, we must come out. You don't know what an atmosphere it is. Blanche, go out to Norman. Flora, Flora, you don't consider, said Ethel, in an agony. Yes, yes, it is not at all cold. Let them have their presents out of doors and eat their buns. Richard and Mr. Wilmot agreed with Flora, and the party were turned out. Ethel did own, when she was in the open air, that it had been rather hot. Norman's face was a sight as he stood holding Aubrey in his arms to gratify the child's impatience. The stifling din, the uncouth aspect of the children, the head girl so very ragged a specimen, thoroughly revolted his somewhat fastidious disposition. This was Ethel's delight? To this she made so many sacrifices? This was all that her time and labor had affected? He did not wish to vex her, but it was more than he could stand. However, Ethel was too much engrossed to look for sympathy. It was a fine spring day, and on the open space of the common the arrangements were quickly made. The children stood in a long line, and the baskets were unpacked. Flora and Ethel called the names, Mary and Blanche gave the presents, and assuredly the grins, courtesies, and pulls of the forelock they elicited could not have been more hearty for any of Miss Rivers's treasures. The buns and the kettles of tea followed. It was perfect delight to entertainers and entertained, except when Mary's dignity was cruelly hurt by Norman's authoritatively taking a kettle out of her hands, telling her she would be the death of herself or somebody else, and reducing her to the mere rank of a bun distributor, which Blanche and Aubrey could do just as well, while he stalked along with a grave and resigned countenance, filling up the cups held out to him by timid-looking children. Mary next fell in with Granny Hall, who had gone into such an ecstasy over Blanche and Aubrey that Blanche did not know which way to look, and Aubrey, in some fear that the old woman might intend to kiss him, returned the compliments by telling her she was ugly up in her face, at which she laughed heartily and uttered more vehement benedictions. Finally, the three best children, boys and girls, were to be made fit to be seen, and recommended by Mr. Wilmot to the Sunday School and Penny Club at Stoneboro, and, this being proclaimed and the children selected, the assembly dispersed, Mr. Wilmot rejoicing Ethel and Richard by saying, Well, really, you have made a beginning. There is an improvement in tone among those children that is more satisfactory than any progress they may have made. Ethel's eyes beamed, and she hurried to tell Flora. Richard colored and gave his quiet smile, then turned to put things in order for their return. "'Will you drive home, Richard?' said Norman, coming up to him. "'Don't you wish it?' said Richard, who had many minor arrangements to make, and would have preferred walking home independently. "'No, thank you. I have a headache, and walking may take it off,' said Norman, taking off his hat and passing his fingers through his hair. "'A headache again. I am sorry to hear it. It is only that suffocating den of yours.' My head ached from the moment I looked into it. 
How can you take Ethel into such a hole, Richard? It is enough to kill her to go on with it forever. It is not so every day, said the elder brother quietly. It is a warm day, and there was an unusual crowd. I shall speak to my father, exclaimed Norman, with somewhat of the supercilious tone that he had now and then been tempted to address to his brother. It is not fit that Ethel should give up everything, health and all, to such a set as these. They look as if they had been picked out of a gutter. Dirt, squalor, everything disgusting, and summer coming on, too, and that horrid place with no window to open. It is utterly unbearable. Richard stooped to pick up a heavy basket, then smiled and said, You must get over such things as these if you mean to be a clergyman, Norman. Whatever I am to be, it does not concern the girls being in such a place as this. I am surprised that you could suffer it. There was no answer. Richard was walking off with his basket and putting it into the carriage. Norman was not pleased with himself, but thought it his duty to let his father know his opinion of Ethel's weekly resort. All he wished was to avoid Ethel herself, not liking to show her his sentiments, and he was glad to see her put into the gig with Aubrey and Mary. They rushed into the drawing-room, full of glee, when they came home, all shouting their news together, and had not at first leisure to perceive that Margaret had some tidings for them in return. Mr. Rivers had been there, with a pressing invitation to his daughter's school feast, and it had been arranged that Flora and Ethel should go and spend the day at the Grange, and their father come to dine and fetch them home in the evening. Margaret had been much pleased with the manner in which the thing was done, when Dr. May, who seemed reluctant to accept the proposal that related to himself, was called out of the room, Mr. Rivers had, in a most kind manner, begged her to say whether she thought it would be painful to him, or whether it might do his spirits good. She decidedly gave her opinion in favor of the invitation. Mr. Rivers gained his point, and she had ever since been persuading her father to like the notion, and assuring him it need not be made a precedent for the renewal of invitations to dine out in the town. He thought the change would be pleasant for his girls, and had, therefore, consented. "'Oh, Papa, Papa, thank you!' cried Ethel, enraptured as soon as he came into the room. "'How very kind of you! How I have wished to see the Grange, and all Norman talks about! Oh, dear, I am so glad you are going there, too!' "'Why, what should you do with me?' said Dr. May, who felt and looked depressed at this taking up of the world again. "'Oh, dear! I should not like it at all without you. It would be no fun at all by ourselves.' I wish Flora would come home. How pleased she will be. Papa, I do wish you would look as if you didn't mind it. I can't enjoy it if you don't like going. I shall when I am there, my dear, said the doctor affectionately, putting his arm round her as she stood by him. It will be a fine day sport for you. But can't you like it beforehand, Papa? Not just this minute, Ethel, said he, with his bright, sad smile. All I like just now is my girls not being able to do without me but we'll do the best we can. So your flock acquitted themselves brilliantly? Who is your senior wrangler? Ethel threw herself eagerly into the history of the examination and had almost forgotten the invitation till she heard the front door open. Then it was not she, but Margaret, who told Flora. Ethel could not, as she said, enjoy what seemed to sadden her father. Flora received it much more calmly. It will be very pleasant, said she, it was very kind of Papa to consent. You will have Richard and Norman, Margaret, to be with you in the evening. And, as soon as they went upstairs, Ethel began to write down the list of prizes in her school journal, while Flora took out the best evening frocks to study whether the crepe looked fresh enough. The invitation was a convenient subject of conversation, for Norman had so much to tell his sisters of the curiosities they must look for at the Grange that he was not obliged to mention Coxmore. He did not like to mortify Ethel by telling her his intense disgust, and he knew he was about to do what she would think a great injury by speaking to his father on the subject, but he thought it for her real welfare, and took the first opportunity of making to his father and Margaret a most formidable description of Ethel's black hole. It quite alarmed Margaret, but the doctor smiled, saying, "'Aye, aye, I know the face Norman puts on if he looks into a cottage.' "'Well,' said Norman, with some mortification, 
All I know is that my head ached all the rest of the day. Very likely, but your head is not Ethel's, and there were twice as many people as the place was intended to hold. A stuffy hole, full of peat smoke and with a window that can't open at the best of times. Peat smoke is wholesome, said Dr. May, looking provoking. You don't know what it is, Papa, or you would never let Ethel spend her life there. It is poisonous. I'll take care of Ethel, said Dr. May, walking off, and leaving Norman in a state of considerable annoyance at being thus treated. He broke out into fresh exclamations against the horrors of Coxmoor, telling Margaret she had no idea what a den it was. But, Norman, it can't be so very bad, or Richard would not allow it. Richard is deluded, said Norman, but if he chooses to run after dirty brads, why should he take Ethel there? My dear Norman, you know it is all Ethel's doing. Yes, I know she has gone crazy after them, and given up all her Greek for it. It is past endurance, said Norman, who had worked himself up into a great indignation. Well, but surely, Norman, it is better they should do what they can for those poor creatures than for Ethel to learn Greek. I don't know that. Let those who are fit for nothing else go and drone over A, B, C with ragged children if they like. It is just their vocation. But there is an order in everything, Margaret, and minds of a superior kind are intended for higher purposes, not to be wasted in this manner. I don't know whether they are wasted, said Margaret, not quite liking Norman's tone, though she had not much to say to his arguments. Not wasted? Not in doing what any one can do? I know what you'll say about the poor. I grant it, but high ability must be given for a purpose, not to be thrown away. It is common sense that someone must be meant to do the dirty work. I see what you mean, Norman, but I don't quite like that to be called by such a name. I think, she hesitated, don't you think you dislike such things more than... Anyone must abominate dirt and slovenliness. I know what you mean. My father thinks tis all nonsense in me, but his profession has made him insensible to such things, and he fancies everyone else is the same. Now, Margaret, am I being unreasonable? I am sure I don't know, dear Norman, said Margaret, hesitating, and feeling it her duty to say something. I dare say it was very disagreeable. And you think, too, that I made a disturbance for nothing? No, indeed I don't, nor does dear Papa. I have no doubt he will see whether it is proper for Ethel. All I think he meant is that perhaps your not being well last winter has made you a little more sensitive in such things. Norman paused and colored. He remembered the pain it had given him to find himself incapable of being of use to his father, and that he had resolved to conquer the weakness of nerve of which he was ashamed. But he did not like to connect this with his fastidious feelings of refinement. He would not own to himself that they were over nice, and, at the bottom of all this justification, rankled Richard saying that he who cared for such things was unfit for a clergyman. Norman's secret thought was, it was all very well for those who could only aspire to parish work in wretched cottages. People who could distinguish themselves were more useful at the university, forming minds and opening new discoveries in learning. Was Norman quite proof against the consciousness of daily excelling all his competitors? His superiority had become even more manifest this Easter, when Chevy and Forder, the two elder boys whom he had outstripped, left the school avowedly because it was not worth while for them to stay since they had so little chance of the randall scholarship norman had now only to walk over the course no one even approaching him but r v anderson meadow rivers always said that fine weather came at her call and so it did glowing sunshine streaming over the shaven turf and penetrating even the solid masses of the great cedar the carriage was sent for the misses may and at two o'clock they arrived Flora, extremely anxious that Ethel should comport herself discreetly, and Ethel full of curiosity and eagerness, the only drawback, her fears that her papa was doing what he disliked. She was not in the least shy, and did not think about her manner enough to be troubled by the consciousness that it had a good deal of abruptness and eagerness, and that her short sight made her awkward. Meta met them with outstretched hands and a face beaming with welcome. I told you I should get my way, she said triumphantly, and after her warm greeting, she looked with some respect at the face of the Miss May, who was so very clever. 
It certainly was not what she expected, not at all like either of the four sisters she had already seen, brown, sallow, and with that sharp long nose, and the eager eyes, and brow a little knit by the desire to see as far as she could. It was pleasanter to look at Flora. Ethel left the talk chiefly to Flora. There was wonder and study enough for her in the grounds and garden, and when Mrs. Larpent tried to enter into conversation with her, she let it drop two or three times while she was peering hard at a picture and trying to make out its subject. However, when they all went out to walk to church, Ethel lighted up and talked, admired, and asked questions in her quick, eager way, which interested Mrs. Larpent greatly. The governess asked after Norman, and no more was wanted to produce a volume of histories of his successes, till Flora turned as she walked before with Maida, saying, "'Why, Ethel, you are quite overwhelming, Mrs. Larpent.' But some civil answer convinced Ethel that what she said was interesting, and she would not be stopped in her account of their anxieties on the day of the examination. Flora was pleased that Meta, catching some words, begged to hear more, and Flora gave an account of the matter, sober in terms, but quietly setting Norman at a much greater distance from all his competitors. After church came the feast in the school. It was a large, commodious building. Maida declared it was very tiresome that it was so good inside. It was so ugly. She should never rest till Papa had built her a real beauty. They found Mr. and Mrs. Charles Wilmot in the school, with a very nice, well-dressed set of boys and girls, and— but there's no need to describe the roast beef and plum pudding. The feast ate merrily, and Ethel was brilliantly happy waiting on the children, and so was sunny-hearted Meta. Flora was too busy in determining what the Riverses might be thinking of her and her sister to give herself up to the enjoyment. Ethel found a small boy looking ready to cry at an untouched slice of beef. She examined him whether he could cut it, and at last discovered that, as had been the case with one or two of her own brothers at the same age, meat was repugnant to him. In her vehement manner she flew off to fetch him some pudding, and hurrying up, as she thought, to Mr. Charles Wilmot, who had been giving it out, she thrust her plate between him and the dish, and had begun her explanation when she perceived it was a stranger, and she stood, utterly discomfited, not saying, I beg your pardon, but only blushing, awkward and confused, as he spoke to her in a good-natured, hospitable manner, which showed her it must be Mr. Rivers. She obtained her pudding and, turning hastily, retreated. Meta said Mr. Rivers, as his daughter came out of the school with him, for, open and airy as it was, the numbers and the dinner made him regard it as Norman had viewed the Coxmoor room. Was that one of the Miss Mays? Yes, Papa, Ethel, the third, the clever one. I thought she must be one of them from her dress, but what a difference between her and the others. Mr. Rivers was a great admirer of beauty, and Meta, brought up to be the same, was disappointed, but consoled herself by admiring Flora. Ethel, after the awkwardness was over, thought no more of the matter, but went on in full enjoyment of the feast. The eating finished, the making of presents commenced, and choice ones they were. The smiles of Meta and of the children were a pretty sight, and Ethel thought she had never seen anything so like a beneficent fairy. Mr. and Mrs. Wilmot said the words of counsel and encouragement, and, by five o'clock, all was over. "'Oh, I am so sorry,' said Meta. "'Easter won't come again for a whole year, and it has been so delightful. How that dear little Annie smiled and nursed her doll! I wish I could see her show it to her mother. Oh, how nice it is! I am so glad Papa brought me to live in the country.' I don't think anything can be so charming in all the world as seeing little children happy. Ethel could not think how the Wilmots could have found it in their heart to regret the liberality of this sweet damsel on whom she began to look with Norman's enthusiastic admiration. There was time for a walk around the grounds, Maida doing the honors to Flora and Ethel walking with Mrs. Larpent. Both pairs were very good friends, and the two sisters admired and were charmed with the beauty of the gardens and conservatories. Ethel laying up a rich store of intelligence for Margaret, but still she was not entirely happy. Her papa was more and more on her mind. He had looked dispirited at breakfast, he had a long, hard day's work before him, and she was increasingly uneasy at the thought that it would be a painful effort to him to join them in the evening. Her mind was full of it when she was conducted, with Flora, 
to the room where they were to dress and when flora began to express her delight her answer was only that she hoped it was not very unpleasant to papa it is not worth while to be unhappy about that ethel if it is an effort it will be good for him when he is once here i know he will enjoy it yes i should think he would i hope he will he must like you to have such a friend as miss rivers how pretty she is now ethel it is high time to dress pray make yourself look nice don't twist up your hair in that anyhow fashion ethel sighed then began talking fast about some hints on schoolkeeping which she had picked up for cocksmoor flora's glossy braids were in full order while ethel was still struggling to get her plate smooth and was extremely beholden to her sister for taking it into her own hands and doing the best with it that its thinness and roughness permitted and then flora pinched and pulled and arranged ethel's frock in vain attempts to make it sit like her own those sharp high bones resisted all attempts to disguise them never mind flora it is quite tidy i am sure there do let me be in peace you are like old nurse so those are all the thanks i get well thank you very much dear flora you are a famous person how i wish margaret could see that lovely mimosa and ethel do take care pray don't poke and spy when you come into the room and don't frown when you are trying to see i hope you won't have anything to help at dinner take care how you manage i'll try said ethel meekly though a good deal tormented as flora went on with half a dozen more injunctions closed by meta's coming to fetch them little meta did not like to show them her own bedroom she pitied them so much when she thought of the contrast she would have liked to put flora's arm through hers but she thought it would look neglectful of ethel so she only showed the way downstairs ethel forgot all her sister's orders for there stood her father and she looked most earnestly at his face it was cheerful and his voice sounded well pleased as he greeted meta then resumed an animated talk with mr rivers ethel drew as near him as she could she had a sense of protection and could open to full enjoyment when she saw him bright at the first pause in the conversation the gentleman turned to the young ladies mr rivers began talking to flora and dr may after a few pleasant words to meta went back to ethel he wanted her to see his favorite pictures he led her up to them made her put on his spectacles to see them better and showed her their special merits mr rivers and the others joined them ethel said little except a remark or two in answer to her papa but she was very happy she felt that he liked to have her with him and meta too was struck by the soundness of her few sayings and the participation there seemed to be in all things between the father and daughter at dinner ethel went on pretty well she was next to her father and was very glad to find the dinner so grand that no side dish fell to her lot to be carved there was a great deal of pleasant talk such as the girls could understand though they did not join much in it except that now and then dr may turned to ethel as a reference for names and dates to make up for silence at dinner there was a most confidential chatter in the drawing-room flora and meta on one side hand in hand calling each other by their christian names mrs larpin and ethel on the other flora dreaded only that ethel was talking too much and revealing too much in how different style they lived then came the gentleman dr may begging mr rivers to show ethel one of his prints when ethel stooped more than ever as if her eyelashes were feelers but she was in transports of delight and her embarrassment entirely at an end in her admiration as she exclaimed and discussed with her papa and by her hearty appreciation made mr rivers for the time forget her plainness music followed flora played nicely meta like a well-taught girl ethel went on musing over the engravings the carriage was announced and so ended the day in norman's fairyland ethel went home leaning hard against her papa talking to him of raphael's madonnas and looking out at the stars and thinking how the heavenly beauty of those faces that in the prints she had been turning over seemed to be connected with the glories of the dark blue sky and glowing stars as one star differs from another star in glory murmured she that was the lesson to-day papa and when she felt him press her hand she knew he was thinking of that last time she had heard the lesson when he had not been with her 
and her thoughts went with his, though not another word was spoken. Flora hardly knew when they ceased to talk. She had musings equally engrossing of her own. She saw she was likely to be very intimate with Meta Rivers, and she was roaming away into schemes for not letting the intercourse drop, and hopes of being admitted to many a pleasures as yet little within her reach. Parties, balls, London itself, and above all, the satisfaction of being admired. The certainty that Mr. Rivers thought her pretty and agreeable had gratified her all the evening, and if he, with his refined taste, thought so, what would others think? Her only fear was that Ethel's awkwardness might make an unfavorable impression, but, at least, she said to herself, it was anything but vulgar awkwardness. The reflections were interrupted by the fly stopping, it was at a little shop in the outskirts of the town, and Dr. May explained that he wanted to inquire for a patient. He went in for a moment, then came back to desire that they would go home, for he should be detained some little time. No one need sit up for him. He would let himself in. It seemed to comment on Ethel's thoughts, bringing them back to the present hour. That daily work of homely mercy, hoping for nothing again, was surely the true way of doing service. End of Part 1, Chapter 20 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Part 1, Chapter 21 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young Part One, Chapter Twenty One. Watchman, how if he will not stand? Dogberry, why then take no note of him, but let him go. Much ado about nothing. Doctor May had promised Margaret that he would see whether the black hole of Coxmoor was all that Norman depicted it, and accordingly he came home that way on Tuesday evening the next week much to the astonishment of Richard, who was in the act of so mending the window that it might let in air when open and keep it out when shut, neither of which purposes had it ever yet answered. Dr. May walked in, met his daughter's look of delight and surprise, spoke cheerfully to Mrs. Green, a hospital acquaintance of his, like half the rest of the country, and made her smile and curtsy by asking if she was not surprised at such doings in her house, then looked at the children, and patted the head that looked most fit to pat, inquired who was the best scholar, and offered a penny to whoever could spell copper tea-kettle, which being done by three merry mortals, and having made him extremely popular, he offered Ethel a lift, and carried her off between him and Adams, on whom he now depended for driving him, since Richard was going to Oxford at once. It was possible to spare him now, Dr. May's arm was as well as he expected it ever would be. He had discarded the sling and could use his hand again, but the arm was still stiff and weak. He could not stretch it out nor use it for anything requiring strength. It soon grew tired with writing, and his daughters feared that it ached more than he chose to confess when they saw it resting in the breast of his waistcoat. Driving he never would have attempted again, even if he could, and he had quite given up carving— he could better bear to sit at the side than at the bottom of the dinner-table. Means of carrying Margaret safely had been arranged by Richard, and there was no necessity for longer delaying his going to Oxford, but he was so unwillingly spared by all as to put him quite into good spirits. Ethel was much concerned to lose him from Coxmoor, and dreaded hindrances to her going thither without his escort— but she had much trust in having her father on her side, and meant to get authority from him for the propriety of going alone with Mary. She did not know how Norman had jeopardized her projects, but the danger blew over. Dr. May told Margaret that the place was clean and wholesome, and though more smoky than might be preferred, there was nothing to do any one in health any harm, especially when the walk there and back was over the fresh moor, he lectured Ethel herself on opening the window, now that she could, and advised Norman to go and spend an hour in the school, that he might learn how pleasant peat-smoke was, a speech Norman did not like at all. 
The real touchstone of temper is ridicule on a point where we do not choose to own ourselves fastidious, and if it had been from any one but his father, Norman would not have so entirely kept down his irritation. Richard passed his examination successfully, and Dr. May wrote himself to express his satisfaction. Nothing went wrong just now except little Tom, who seemed to be justifying Richard's fears of the consequence of exciting his father's anger. At home, he shrank and hesitated at the simplest question if put by his father suddenly, and the appearance of cowardice and prevarication displeasing Dr. May further rendered his tone louder and frightened Tom the more, giving his manner an air of sullen reserve that was most unpleasant. At school it was much the same. He kept aloof from Norman, and threw himself more into the opposite faction, by whom he was shielded from all punishment, except what they chose themselves to inflict on him. Norman's post as head of the school was rendered more difficult by the departure of his friend Cheviot, who had always upheld his authority. Harvey Anderson did not openly transgress, for he had a character to maintain, but it was well known throughout the school that there was a wide difference between the boys, and that Anderson thought it absurd, superfluous, and troublesome in May not to wink at abuses which appeared to be licensed by long standing. When Edward Anderson, Axworthy and their set, broke through rules, it was with the understanding that the second boy in the school would support them if he durst. The summer and the cricket season brought the battle of Balhatchet's house to issue. The cricket ground was the field close to it, and for the last two or three years there had been a frequent custom of dispatching juniors to his house for tarts and ginger-beer bottles. Norman knew of instances last year in which this had led to serious mischief, and had made up his mind that, at whatever loss of popularity, it was his duty to put a stop to the practice. He was an ardent cricketer himself, and though the game did not, in anticipation, seem to him to have all the charms of last year, he entered into it with full zest when once engaged. But his eye was on all parts of the field, and especially on the corner by the bridge, and the boys knew him well enough to attempt nothing unlawful within the range of that glance. However, the constant vigilance was a strain too great to be always kept up, and he had reason to believe he was eluded more than once. At last came a capture, something like that of Tom, one which he could not have well avoided making. The victim was George Larkins, the son of a clergyman in the neighborhood, a wild, merry varlet, who got into mischief rather for the sake of the fun than from any bad disposition. His look of consternation was exaggerated into a most comical character in order to hide how much of it was real. "'So you are at that trick, Larkins.' "'There! That bet is lost!' exclaimed Larkins. "'I laid Hill half a crown that you would not see me when you were mooning over your verses.' "'Well, I have seen you, and now—' "'Come! You would not thrash a fellow when you have just lost him half a crown. Single misfortunes never come alone, they say.' "'So there's my money and my credit gone, to say nothing of Balhatchet's ginger-beer.' The boy made such absurd faces that Norman could hardly help laughing, though he wished to make it a serious affair. "'You know, Larkins, I have given out that such things are not to be. It is a melancholy fact.' "'Ay, so you must make an example of me,' said Larkins, pretending to look resigned. "'Better call all the fellows together, hadn't you, and make it more effective?' It would be grateful to one's feelings, you know. And June, added he, with a ridiculous confidential air, if you'll only lay it on soft, I'll take care it makes noise enough. Great cry, little wool, you know. Come with me, said Norman. I'll take care you are example enough. What did you give for those articles? Fifteen pence halfpenny. Rascally dear, isn't it? But the old rogue makes one pay double for the risk. You are making his fortune. You have raised his prices fourfold. I'll take care of that. Why? Where are you taking me? Back to him? I am going to gratify your wish to be an example. A gibbet! A gibbet! cried Larkins. I'm to be turned off on the spot where the crime took place. A warning to all beholders. Only let me send home for old Neptune's chain, if you please, sir. If you hang me in the combined watch-chains of the school, I fear they would give way and defeat the purposes of justice." They were by this time at the bridge. 
"'Come in,' said Norman to his follower, as he crossed the entrance of the little shop, the first time he had ever been there. A little cringing, shriveled old man stood up in astonishment. "'Mr. May, can I have the pleasure, sir?' "'Mr. Belhatchet, you know that it is contrary to the rules that there should be any traffic with the school without special permission?' "'Yes, sir, just nothing, sir, only when the young gentlemen come here, sir. I'm an old man, sir, and I don't like not to oblige a young gentleman, sir,' pleaded the old man in a great fright. "'Very likely,' said Norman. "'But I am come to give you fair notice. I am not going to allow the boys here to be continually smuggling spirits into the school.' "'Spirits!' "'Bless you, sir, I never thought of no such a thing. "'Tis nothing in life but ginger-beer, "'very cooling drink, sir, of my wife's making. "'She had the receipt from her grandmother up in Leicestershire. "'Won't you taste a bottle, sir?' "'And he hastily made a cork bounce and poured it out. "'That, of course, was genuine, "'but Norman was up to him in schoolboy phrase. "'Give me yours, Larkins.' "'No pop ensued.' Larkins, enjoined the detection, put his hands on his knees and looked wickedly up in the old man's face to see what was coming. "'Bless me! It is a little flat. I wonder how that happened. I'll be most happy to change it, sir. Wife, what's the meaning of Mr. Larkins' ginger pot being so flat?' "'It is very curious ginger beer indeed, Mr. Balhatchet,' said Norman. "'And since it is liable to have such strange properties, I cannot allow it to be used any more at the school. Very well, sir, as you please, sir. You are the first gentleman as has objected, sir. And once for all I give you warning, added Norman, that if I have reason to believe you have been obliging the young gentleman, the magistrates and the trustees of the road shall certainly hear of it. You would not hurt a poor man, sir, as is drove to it. You as has such a name for goodness. "'I have given you warning,' said Norman. "'The next time I find any of your bottles in the school fields, your license goes. "'Now, there are your goods. "'Give Mr. Larkins back the fifteen pence. "'I wonder you are not ashamed of such a charge.' "'Having extracted the money, Norman turned to leave the shop. "'Larkins, triumphant. "'Ha! There's Harrison!' as the tutor rode by, and they touched their caps. "'How he stared! My eyes!' "'June, you'll be had up for dealing with old Ball.' "'And he went into an ecstasy of laughing. "'You settled him, I believe. "'Well, is justice satisfied?' "'It would be no use thrashing you,' said Norman, laughing, "'as he leaned up against the parapet of the bridge "'and pinched the boy's ear. "'There's nothing to be got out of you but chaff.' "'Larkins was charmed with the compliment. "'But I'll tell you what, Larkins.' I can't think how a fellow like you can go and give in to those sneaking, underhand tricks that make you ashamed to look one in the face. It is only for the fun of it. Well, I wish you would find your fun in some other way. Come, Larkins, recollect yourself a little. You have a home not so far off. How do you think your father and mother would fancy seeing you reading the book you had yesterday, or coming out of ball hatchets with a bottle of spirits, called by a false name? Larkins pinched his fingers. Home was a string that could touch him, but it seemed beneath him to own it. At that moment a carriage approached. The boy's whole face lighted up, and he jumped forward. "'Our own!' he cried. "'There she is!' She was, of course, his mother, and Norman, though turning hastily away that his presence might prove no restraint, saw the boy fly over the door of the open carriage, and could have sobbed at the thought of what that meeting was. "'Who was that with you?' asked Mrs. Larkins, when she had obtained leave to have her boy with her while she did her shopping. "'That was May Senior, our Dooks. "'Was it? I am very glad you should be with him, my dear George. He is very kind to you, I hope.' "'He is a jolly good fellow,' said Larkins sincerely, though by no means troubling himself as to the appropriateness of the eulogy, nor thinking it necessary to explain to his mother the terms of the conversation. "'It was not fruitless.' Larkins did avoid mischief when it was not extremely inviting, was more amenable to May Sr., and having been put in mind by him of his home, was not ashamed to bring the thought to the aid of his eyes when, on Sunday, during a long sermon of Mr. Ramsden's, he knew that Axworthy was making the grimace which irresistibly incited him to make a still finer one. 
and Balhatchet was so much convinced of that their young May being in earnest, that he assured his persuasive customers that it was as much as his license was worthy to supply them. Evil and insubordination were more easily kept under than Norman had expected when he first made up his mind to the struggle. Firmness had so far carried the day, and the power of manful assertion of the right had been proved, contrary to Cheviot's parting auguries, that he would only make himself disliked and do no good. The whole of the school was extremely excited this summer by a proceeding of Mr. Tompkins, the brewer, who suddenly closed up the footway called Randall's Alley, declaring that there was no right of passage through a certain field at the back of his brewery. Not only the school, but the town was indignant, and the maze especially so. It had been the doctor's way to school forty years ago, and there were recollections connected with it that made him regard it with personal affection. Norman, too, could not bear to lose it. He had not entirely conquered his reluctance to pass that spot in the high street, and the loss of the alley would be a positive deprivation to him. Almost every native of Stoneborough felt strongly the encroachment of the brewer, and the boys, of course, carried the sentiment to exaggeration. The propensity to public speaking perhaps added to the excitement, for Norman May and Harvey Anderson, for once in unison, each made a vehement harangue in the school court. Anderson's a fine specimen of the village Hampton style, about Britons never suffering indignities, and free-born Englishmen swelling at injuries. "'That they do, my hearty,' interjected Larkins, pointing to an inflamed eye that had not returned to its right dimensions. However, Anderson went on unmoved by the under-titter, and demonstrated, to the full satisfaction of all the audience, that nothing could be more illegal and unfounded than the brewer's claims. Then came a great outburst from Norman, with all his father's headlong vehemence. The way was the right of the town— the walk had been trodden by their forefathers for generations past. It had been made by the good old generous-hearted man who loved his town and townspeople, and would have heard with shame and anger of a stranger, a new inhabitant, a grasping radical, caring, as radicals always did, for no rights but their own chance of unjust gains, coming here to Stoneborough to cut them off from their own path. He talk of liberalism and the rights of the poor— he who cut off Randall's poor old creatures in the almshouses from their short way, and then came some stories of his oppression as a poor law guardian, which greatly aggravated the wrath of the speaker and the audience, though otherwise they did not exactly bear on the subject. "'What would old Nicholas Randall say to these nineteenth-century doings?' finished Norman. "'Down with them!' cried a voice from the throng, probably Larkin's, but there was no desire to investigate." It was the universal sentiment. Down with it! Hurrah! We'll have our footpath open again. Down with the fences! Britons never shall be slaves, as Larkins finally ejaculated. That's the way to bring it to bear, said Harvey Anderson. See if he dares to bring an action against us. Hurrah! Yes, that's the way to settle it, said Norman. Let's have it down. It's an oppressive, arbitrary, shameful proceeding, and we'll show him we won't submit to it. Carried along by the general feeling, the whole troop of boys dashed shouting up to the barricade at the entrance of the field, and leveled it with the ground. A handkerchief was fastened to the top of one of the stakes, and waved over the brew-house wall, and some of the boys were for picking up stones and dirt and launching them over, in hopes of spoiling the beer, but Norman put a stop to this, and brought them back to the schoolyard, still in a noisy state of exultation. It cooled a little by and by, under the doubt how their exploit would be taken. At home, Norman found it already known, and his father, half glad, half vexed, enjoying the victory over Tompkins, yet a little uneasy on his son's behalf. "'What will Dr. Hoxton say to the ducks?' said he. "'I didn't know he was to be ducks in mischief as well as out of it.' "'You can't call it mischief, Papa, to resent—' an unwarranted encroachment of our rights by such an old ruffian as that? One's blood is up to think of the things he has done. He richly deserves it, no doubt, said the doctor, and yet I wish you had been out of the row. If there is any blame, you will be the first it will light on. I am glad of it. That is but just. Anderson and I seem to have stirred it up, if it wanted stirring, for it was in every fellow there. Indeed, I had no notion it was coming to this when I began.' 
Oratory, said the doctor, smiling. Ha, ah, Norman, think a little another time, my boy, before you take the law into your own hands, or, what is worse, into a lot of hands you can't control for good, though you may excite them to harm. Dr. Hoxton did not come into the school at the usual hour, and in the course of the morning sent for May Sr. to speak to him in his study. He looked very broad, awful, and dignified, as he informed him that Mr. Tompkins had just been with him to complain of the damage that had been done, and he appeared extremely displeased that the ducks should have been no check on such proceedings. "'I am sorry, sir,' said Norman, "'but I believe it was the general feeling that he had no right to stop up the alley, and therefore that it could not be wrong to break it down.' "'Whether he has a right or not is not a question to be settled by you. "'So I find that you, whose proper office is to keep order, "'have been inflaming the mischievous and aggressive spirit amongst the others. "'I am surprised at you. "'I thought you were more to be depended upon, May, in your position.' "'Norman coloured a good deal and simply answered, "'I am sorry, sir.' "'Take care, then, that nothing of the kind happens again,' said Dr. Hoxton, who was very fond of him, and did not find fault with him willingly. That the first inflammatory discourse had been made by Anderson did not appear to be known. He only came in for the general reprimand given to the school. It was reported the following evening, just as the town boys turned out to go to their homes, that old Tompkins had his fence up five times higher than before— "'Have at him again, say I,' exclaimed Axworthy. "'What business has he, coming, stopping up ways that were made before he was born?' "'We shall catch it from the doctor if we do,' said Edward Anderson. "'He looked in no end of a rage yesterday when he talked about the credit of the school.' "'Who cares for the credit of the school?' said the elder Anderson. "'We are out of the school now. We are townsmen, Stoneborough boys, citizens not bound to submit to injustice.' "'No, no, the old rogue knew it would not stand if it was brought into court, "'so he brings down old Hoxton on us instead. "'A dirty trick he deserves to be punished for.' "'And there was a general shout and yell in reply. "'Anderson,' said Norman, "'you had better not excite them again. "'They are ripe for mischief. "'It will go further than it did yesterday, don't you see?' "'Anderson could not afford to get into a scrape without May to stand before him, "'and rather sulkily he assented.' "'It is of no use to rave about old Tompkins,' proceeded Norman, in his style of popular oratory. "'If it is illegal, someone will go to law about it, and we shall have our alley again. "'We have shown him our mind once, and that is enough. "'If we let him alone now, he will see tis only because we are ordered, not for his sake. "'It would be just putting him in the right, and maybe winning his cause for him to use any more violence. "'There's law for you, Anderson. So now no more about it.' "'Let us all go home like rational fellows. "'August. Where's August?' "'Tom was not visible. "'He generally avoided going home with his brother. "'And Norman, having seen the boys divide into two or three little parties "'as their roads lay homewards, "'found he had an hour of light for an expedition of his own, "'along the bank of the river. "'He had taken up botany with much ardour, "'and sharing the study with Margaret was a great delight to both.' There was a report that the rare yellow bog-bean grew in a meadow about a mile and a half up the river, and thither he was bound, extremely enjoying the summer evening walk, as the fresh dewy coolness sunk on all around, and the noises of the town were mellowed by distance, and the sun's last beams slanted on the green meadows, and the mayflies danced, and dragonflies darted, and fish rose or leaped high in the air, or showed their spotted sides. "'and opened and shut their gills as they rested in the clear water, "'and the evening breeze rustled in the tall reeds "'and brought fragrance from the fresh-mown hay. "'It was complete enjoyment to Norman after his day's study "'and the rule and watch over the unruly crowd of boys, "'and he walked and wandered and collected plants for Margaret "'till the sun was down and the grasshoppers chirped clamorously "'while the fern-owl purred and the beetle hummed, and the skimming swallows had given place to the soft-winged bat, and the large white owl floating over the fields as it moused in the long grass. The summer twilight was sobering every tint when, as Norman crossed the cricket field, he heard, in the distance, a loud shout. He looked up, and it seemed to him that he saw some black specks dancing in the forbidden field, 
and something like the waving of a flag. But it was not light enough to be certain, and he walked quickly home. The front door was fastened, and while he was waiting to be let in, Mr. Harrison walked by and called out, "'You are late at home tonight. It is half-past nine. "'I have been taking a walk, sir.' A good night was the answer, and he was admitted. Everyone in the drawing-room looked up and exclaimed as he entered, "'Where's Tom?' "'What? Is he not come home?' "'No. Was he not with you?' "'I missed him after school. I was persuaded he was come home. I have been to look for the yellow bog-bean. There, Margaret. Had I not better go and look for him?' "'Yes, do,' said Dr. May. "'The boy is never off one's mind.' A sort of instinctive dread directed Norman's steps down the open portion of Randall's alley, and voices growing louder as he came nearer confirmed his suspicions. The fence at this end was down, and on entering the field a gleam of light met his eye on the ground. A cloud of smoke, black figures were flitting around it, pushing brands into red places, and feeding the bonfire. "'What have you been doing?' exclaimed Norman. "'You have got yourselves into a tremendous scrape!' "'A peal of laughter and a shout of, "'Randall and Stoneborough forever!' was the reply. "'August! May Junior! Tom! Answer me! Is he here?' asked Norman, "'not solicitous to identify anyone, but gruff voices broken upon them. "'There they are! Nothing like em for mischief!' "'Come, young gentlemen,' said a policeman. "'Be off, if you please. We don't want to have none of you at the station to-night.' A general hurry-scurry ensued. Norman alone, strong in innocence, walked quietly away, and as he came forth from the darkness of the alley, beheld something scouring away before him in the direction of home. It popped in at the front door before him, but was not in the drawing-room. He strode upstairs, called, but was not answered, and found, under the bedclothes, a quivering mass consisting of Tom with all his clothes on, fully persuaded that it was the policeman who was pursuing him. End of Part 1, Chapter 21 Recording by Hannah Mary Part 1, Chapter 22 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gail Goslin The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young Part 1, Chapter 22 O oh, life, without thy checkered scene Of right and wrong, of weal and woe, Success and failure, could a ground For magnanimity be found. Wordsworth, Dr. May was called for Late the next day, Friday, And spent some time in one of the houses Near the river. It was nearly eight o'clock when he came away, and he lingered, looking towards the school, in hopes of a walk home with his boys. Presently he saw Norman coming out from under the archway, his cap drawn over his face, and step, gesture and manner, betraying that something was seriously wrong. He came up almost to his father without seeing him, until, startled by his exclamation, "'Norman! Why, Norman, what's the matter?' Norman's lips quivered, and his face was pale. He seemed as if he could not speak. "'Where's Tom?' said the doctor, much alarmed. Has he got into disgrace about this business of Tomkins? That boy! He has only got an imposition, interrupted Norman. No, it's not that. It is myself. And it was only with a gulp and struggle that he brought out the words. I am turned down in the school. The doctor started back a step or two, aghast. What? How? Speak, Norman, what have you done? Nothing, said Norman, recovering in the desire to reassure his father. Nothing! "'That's right,' said the doctor, breathing freely. "'What's the meaning of it? A misunderstanding?' "'Yes,' said Norman with bitterness. "'It's all Anderson's doing. A word from him would have set all straight. "'But he would not. I believe from my heart he held his tongue to get me down, "'that he might have the Randall. "'We'll see you righted,' said the doctor eagerly. "'Come, tell me the whole story, Norman. "'Is it about this unlucky business?' "'Yes,' The town fellows were all up about it last evening when we came out of school. Anderson Senior himself began to put them up to having the fence down again. Yes, that he did. I remember his very words, that Tomkins could not bring it into court, and so set old Hoxton at us. Well, I told them it would not do. Thought I had settled them. Saw them off home. Yes, Simpson and Benson and Gray up the high street and the others their way. 
I only left Axworthy going into a shop when I set off on my walk. What could a fellow do more? How was I to know that that Axworthy would get them together again and take them off to this affair, pull up the stakes, saw them down, for they were hard to get down, shy all sorts of things over into the court, hooted old Tomkins' man when he told them to be off, and make a bonfire of the sticks at last? And Harvey Anderson was there? No, not he. He's too sharp. Born and bred attorney as he is, he talked them up to the mischief when my back was turned, and then sneaked quietly home, quite innocent, and out of the scrape. But Dr. Hoxton can never entertain a suspicion that you had anything to do with it? Yes, he does, though. He thinks I incited them, and Tomkins and the policeman declare I was there in the midst of the row, and not one of these fellows will explain how I came at the last to look for Tom. Not Tom himself. He did try to speak, poor little fellow, but after the other affair his word goes for nothing, and so it seems does mine. I did think Hoxton would have trusted me. And did not he? exclaimed Dr. May. He did not in so many words accuse me of, of, but he told me he had serious charges brought against me. Mr. Harrison had seed me at ball hatchets, setting an example of disregard to rules, and again Mr. Harrison saw me coming in at a late hour last night. I know he did, I said, and I explained where I had been, and they asked for proofs. I could hardly answer from surprise at their not seeming to believe me, but I said, you could answer for my having come in with the flowers for my sister. To be sure I will, I'll go this instant. He was turning. It is of no use, Papa. Tonight, Dr. Hoxton has a dinner party. He's always having parties. I wish he would mind them less and his business more. You disbelieved. But I'll see justice done you, Norman, the first thing tomorrow. We'll... Well, then, I said. Old Bellhatchet could tell them that I crossed the bridge at the very time they were doing this pretty piece of work, for he was sitting smoking in his porch when I went home, and, would you believe it, the old rascal would not remember who passed that evening. It is all his malice and revenge, nothing else. Why, what have you been doing to him? Norman shortly explained the ginger beer story, and, adding, Cheviot told me I should get nothing but ill will, and so I have. All those town fellows turn against me now, and though they know as well as possible how it was, they won't say a word to right me, just out of spite, because I have stopped them from all the mischief I could. Well, then, they asked me whether, since I allowed that I had been there at last, I had dispersed the boys. I said no, I had no time. Then they desired to know who was there, and that I had not seen. It was all dark, and there had not been a moment, and if I guessed... It was no affair of mine to say. So they ordered me down, and had up Ned Anderson, and one or two more who were known to have been in the riot, and then they consulted a good while, and sent for me. Mr. Wilmot was for me, I am sure, but Harrison was against me. Dr. Hoxton sat there, and made me one of his addresses. He said he would not enter on the question whether I had been present at the repetition of the outrage, as he called it. But what was quite certain was that I had abused my authority and influence in the school. I had been setting a bad example and breaking the rules about Bullhatchet, and so far from repressing mischief, I had been the foremost in it, making inflammatory harangues, leading them to commit violence the first time, and the next, if not actually taking part in it personally, at any rate not preventing it. In short, he said it was clear I had not waked enough for my post. It was some excuse I had been raised to it so young, but it was necessary to show that proficiency in studies did not compensate for disregard of discipline. And so he turned me down below the first six. So there's another May in disgrace. It shall not last. It shall not last, my boy, said Dr. May, pressing Norman's arm. I'll see you righted. Dr. Hoxton shall hear the whole story. I am not for fathers interfering in general, but if ever there was a case, this is. Why? It is almost actionable, injuring your whole prospects in life, and all because he will not take the trouble to make an investigation? It is a crying shame. Every fellow in the school knows how it was, said Norman. And plenty of them would be glad to tell, if they had only the opportunity, but he asked no one but those two or three worst fellows that were at the fire, and they would not tell, on purpose. The school will go to destruction now. They'll get their way, and all I have been striving for is utterly undone. You setting a bad example? Dr. Hoxton little knows what you've been doing. It is a mockery, as I have always said, to see that old fellow sit wrapped up in his pomposity, eating his good dinners and knowing no more what goes on among his boys than his umbrella. But he will listen to me, 
and we'll make those boys confess the whole, eh, and have a bell hatchet himself to say what your traffic with him was, and we will see what old Hoxton says to you then, Norman. Dr. May and his son felt keenly and spoke strongly. There was so much of sympathy and fellow-feeling between them that there was no backwardness on Norman's part in telling his whole trouble, with more confidence than schoolboys often show towards their fathers, and Dr. May entered into the mortification as if he were still at school. They did not go into the house, but walked long up and down the garden, working themselves up into, if possible, stronger indignation, and concerting the explanation for tomorrow, when Dr. May meant to go at once to the headmaster, and make him attend to the true version of the story, appealing to Harvey Anderson himself, Larkins, and many others, for witnesses. There could hardly be a doubt that Norman would be thus exculpated, but... If Dr. Hoxton would not see things in their true light, Dr. May was ready to take him away at once, rather than see him suffer injustice. Still, though comforted by his father's entire reliance, Norman was suffering severely under the sense of indignity, and grieved that Dr. Hoxton and the other masters should have believed him guilty. That name of May could never again boast of being without reproach. To be in disgrace stung him to the quick, even though undeservedly, and he could not bear to go in meet his sisters and be pitied. There's no need they should know of it, said he, when the minster clock peeling ten obliged them to go indoors, and his father agreed. They bade each other good night, with the renewal of the promise that Dr. Hoxton should be forced to hear Norman's vindication the first thing tomorrow, Harvey Anderson be disappointed of what he meanly triumphed in, and Norman be again in his post at the head of the school, in more honour and confidence than ever, putting down evil and making Stoneborough what it ought to be. As Dr. May lay awake in the summer's morning, meditating on his address to Dr. Hoxton, he heard the unwelcome sound of a ring at the bell, and in a few minutes, a note was brought to him. Tell Adams to get the gig ready. I'll let him know whether he is to go with me. And in a few minutes, the doctor opened Norman's door, and found him dressed, and standing by the window reading. What? Up already, Norman? I came to tell you that our affairs must wait till the afternoon. It is very provoking, for Hoxton may be gone out, but Mr. Lake's son, at Groveswood, has an attack on the head, and I must go at once. It is a couple of dozen miles off, or more. I have hardly ever been there, and it may keep me all day. Shall you go in the gig? Shall I drive you? said Norman, looking rather blank. That's what I thought of. If you like it, I thought you would sooner be out of the way. Thank you. Yes, Papa. Shall I come and help you to finish dressing? Yes, do thank you. It will hasten matters. Only, first order in some breakfast. What makes you up so early? Have not you slept? Not much. It has been such a hot night. And you have a headache. Well, we will find a cure for that before the day is over. I have settled what to say to old Hoxton. Before another quarter of an hour had passed, they were driving through the deep lanes, the long grass thickly laden with morning dew, which beaded the webs of the spiders and rose in clouds of mist under the influence of the sun's rays. There was stillness in the air at first, then the morning sounds, the labourer going forth, the world wakening to life, the opening houses, the children coming out to school. In spite of the tumult of feeling, Norman could not but be soothed and refreshed by the new and fair morning scene, and both minds quitted the school politics. As Dr. May talked of past enjoyments of walks or drives home in early dawn, the more delicious after a sad watch in a sick room, and told of the fair sights he had seen at such unwanted hours. They had far to go, and the heat of the day had come on before they entered the place of their destination. It was a woodland village, built on a nook in the side of the hill, sloping greenly to the river, and shut in by a white gate, which seemed to gather all in one the little old-fashioned church, its yard, shaded with trees, and enclosed by long white rails, the parsonage, covered with climbing plants and in the midst of a gay garden, and one or two cottages. The woods cast a cool shadow, and in the meadows by the river rose cocks of new-made hay. There was an air of abiding serenity about the whole place, save that there stood an old man by the gate, evidently watching for the physician's carriage, and where the sun fell on that parsonage house was a bedroom window, wide open, with the curtains drawn. "'Thank heavens you are come, sir,' said the old man. "'He is fearfully bad.' Norman knew young Lake, who had been a senior boy when he first went to school, was a Randall scholar, and had borne an excellent character, and highly distinguished himself at the university. And now, by all accounts, he seemed to be dying, in the height of honour and general esteem. Dr. May went into the house, the old man took the horse, and Norman lingered under the trees in the churchyard. 
watching the white curtains now and then puffed by the fitful summer breeze as he lay on the turf in the shade under the influence of the gentle sadness around resting mind and body from the tossing tumultuous passionate sensations that had kept him restless and miserable through the hot night he waited long one hour two hours had passed away but he was not impatient and hardly knew how long the time had been before his father and mr lake came out of the house together and after they parted dr may summoned him he of course asked first for the patient not quite so hopeless as at first and the reasons for having been kept so long were detailed with many circumstances of the youth's illness and the parent's resignation by which dr may was still too deeply touched to have room in his mind for anything besides they were more than half way home and a silence had succeeded the conversation about the lake family when norman spoke papa i've been thinking about it and i believe it would be better to let it alone if you please not apply to dr hoxton exclaimed his father well i think not i've been considering it and it does hardly seem to me the right thing you see if i had not you close at hand this could never be explained and it seems rather hard upon anderson who has no father and the other fellows who have their fathers off right norman that is what my father before me always said and the way i have always acted myself much better let a few trifles go on not just as one would wish than be for ever interfering but i think this is a case for it and i don't think you ought to let yourself be influenced by the fear of any party spirit it's not only that papa i've been thinking a good deal to-day and there are other reasons of course i should wish dr hoxton to know that i spoke the truth about that walk and i hope you will let him know as i appeal to you but on cooler thoughts i don't believe dr hoxton could seriously suspect me of such a thing as that and it was not on that ground that i am turned down but that i did not keep up sufficient discipline and allowed the outrage as he calls it now you know that is after a fashion true if i had not gone on like an ass the other day and incited them to pull down the fences they would not have done it afterwards and perhaps i ought to have kept on guard longer it was my fault and we can't deny it dr may made a restless reluctant movement well well i suppose it was but it was just as much harvey anderson's and is he to get the scholarship because he has added meanness to the rest he was not ducks said norman with a sigh it was more shabby than i thought was even in him but i don't know that the feeling about him is not one reason there has always been a rivalry and bitterness between us two and if i were to get the upper hand now by means not in the usual course such as the fellows would think ill of it it would be worse than ever and i should always feel guilty and ashamed to look at him over refining norman muttered dr may besides don't you remember when his father died how glad you and every one were to get him a nomination and it was said that if he gained a scholarship it would be such a relief to poor mrs anderson now he has this chance and it does seem hard to deprive her of it i should not like to know that i had done so <whistles> the doctor gave a considering whistle you could not make it straight papa without explaining about the dealing with bell hatchet and that would be unfair to them all even the old rogue himself for i promised to say nothing about former practices as long as he did not renew them well i don't want to compromise you norman you know your own ground best but i don't like it at all you don't know the humiliation of disgrace those who have thought highly of you now thinking you changed i don't know how to bear it for you i don't mind anything while you trust me said norman eagerly not much i mean except mr wilmot you must judge papa and do as you please no you must judge norman your confidence in me ought not to be a restraint it has always been an understood thing that what you say at home is as if it had not been said as regards my dealings with the masters i know papa well i'll tell you what brought me to this i tumbled about all night in a rage when i thought how they had served me and of hoxton's believing it all and how he might only half give in to your representation and then i gloried in anderson's coming down from his height and being seen in his true colours so it went on till morning came and i got up you know how you gave me my mother's little thomas a kempis i always read a bit every morning to-day it was of four things that bring much inward peace and what do you think they were be desirous my son to do the will of another rather than thine own choose always to have less rather than more seek always the lowest place and to be inferior to every one wish always and pray that the will of god may be wholly fulfilled in thee i like them the more because it was just like her last reading with us and like that letter 
Well, then I wondered as I lay on the grass at Groveswood whether she would have thought it best for me to be reinstated, and I found out that I should have been rather afraid of what you might say when she had talked it over with you. Dr. May smiled a little at the simplicity with which this last was said, but his smile ended in one of his heavy sighs. So you took her for your counsellor, my boy. That was the way to find out what was right. Well, there was something in the place, and in watching poor Lake's windows, that made me not able to dwell so much on getting on and having prizes and scholarships. I thought that caring for those had been driven out of me. And you know, I never felt as if it were my right when I was made ducks, but now I find it has all come back, and does not do for me to be first. I have been what she called elated, and been more peremptory than need with the lower boys, and gone on in my old ways with Richard, and so I suppose this disgrace has come to punish me. I wish it were not disgrace, because of our name at school, and because it will vex Harry so much, but since it has come, considering all things, I suppose I ought not to struggle to justify myself at other people's expense. His eyes were so dazzled with tears that he could hardly see to drive, nor did his father speak at first. I can't say anything against it, Norman, but I am sorry, and one thing more you should consider. If Dr. Hoxton should view this absurd business in the way he seems to do, it will stand in your way for ever in testimonials, if you try for anything else. Do you think it will interfere with my having a confirmation ticket? Why, no, I should not think. Such a boyish escapade could be no reason for refusing you one. Very well, then, it had better rest. If there should be any difficulty about my being confirmed, of course we will explain it. I wish everyone showed themselves as well prepared, half muttered the doctor. Then, after long musing, Well, Norman, I give up the scholarship. Poor Mrs. Anderson wants it more than we do, and if the boy is a shabby fellow, the more he wants a decent education. But what do you say to this? I make Hoxton do you full justice, and reinstate you in your proper place, and then I take you away at once, send you to a tutor, anything till the end of the long vacation. Thank you, said Norman, pausing. I don't know, Papa, I'm very much obliged to you, but I think it would hardly do. You would be uncomfortable at seeming to quarrel with Dr. Hoxton, and it would hardly be creditable for me to go off in anger. You are right, I believe, said Dr. May. You judge wisely, though I should not have ventured to ask it of you. But what is to become of the discipline of the school? Is that all to go to the dogs? I could not do anything with them if I were restored in this way. They would be more set against me. It is bad enough as it is, but even for my own peace, I believe it is better to leave it alone. All my comfort in school is over, I know. And he sighed deeply. It is a most untoward business, said the doctor. I am very sorry your school days should be clouded, but it can't be helped, and you will work yourself into a character again. You are full young, and can stay for the next Randall. Norman felt as if, while his father looked at him as he now did, the rest of the world were nothing to him. But perhaps the driving past the school brought him to a different mind, for he walked into the house slowly and dejectedly. He told his own story to Ethel in the garden, not without much difficulty, so indignant were her exclamations, and it was impossible to make her see that his father's interference would put him in an awkward position among the boys. She would argue vehemently that she could not bear Mr. Wilmot to think ill of him, that it was a great shame of Dr. Hoxton, and that it was dreadful to let such a boy as Harvey Anderson go unpunished. I really do think it is quite wrong of you to give up your chance of doing good, and leave him in his evil ways. That was all the comfort she gave Norman, and she walked in to pour out a furious grumbling upon Margaret. Dr. May had been telling the elder ones, and they were in conversation after he had left them, Margaret talking with animation, and Flora sitting over her drawing, uttering reluctant assents. "'Has he told you, poor fellow?' asked Margaret. "'Yes,' said Ethel. "'Was there ever such a shame?' "'That is just what I say,' observed Flora. "'I cannot see why the Andersons are to have a triumph over all of us.' "'I used to think Harvey the best of the two, said Ethel. "'Now I think he is a great deal the worst. "'Taking advantage of such mistake as this, "'how will he ever look Norman in the face?' Really, said Margaret, I see no use in aggravating ourselves by talking of the Andersons. I can't think how Papa can consent, proceeded Flora. I am sure if I were in his place I should not. Papa is so much pleased with dear Norman's behaviour that it quite makes up for all the disappointment, said Margaret. Besides, he is very much obliged to him in one way. He would not have liked to have to battle the matter with Dr. Hoxton. He spoke of Norman's great good judgment. 
Yes, Norman can persuade Papa to do anything, said Flora. Yes, I wish Papa had not yielded, said Ethel. It would have been just as noble in dear Norman, and we should not have the apparent disgrace. Perhaps it is best as it is, after all, said Flora. Why, how do you mean, said Ethel. I think very likely things might have come out. Now don't look furious, Ethel. Indeed, I can't help it, but really I don't think it is explicable why Norman should wish to hush it up unless there were something behind. Flora, cried Ethel, too much shocked to bring out another word. If you are unfortunate enough to have such suspicions, said Margaret quietly, I think it would be better to be silent. As if you did not know Norman, stammered Ethel. Well, said Flora, I don't wish to think so. You know I did not hear Norman himself, and when Papa gives his vehement account of things, it always puzzles us of the cooler-minded sort. It is a great shame as ever I heard, cried Ethel, recovering her utterance. Who would you trust if not your own father and brother? Yes, yes, said Flora, not by any means wishing to displease her sisters. If there is such a thing as an excess of generosity, it is sure to be among ourselves. I only know it does not suit me. It will make us all uncomfortable whenever we meet the Andersons or Mr. Wilmot or anyone else, and as to such tenderness to Harvey Anderson, I think it is thrown away. Thrown away on the object, perhaps, said Margaret, but not in Norman. To be sure, broke out Ethel, better be than seem. Oh, dear, I am sorry I was vexed with dear old June when he told me. I had rather have him now than if he had gained everything and everyone was praising him that I had. Harvey Anderson is welcome to be Ducks and Randall's scholar for what I care, while Norman is, while he is just what we thought of the last time we read that gospel. You know, Margaret. He is, that he is, said Margaret, and indeed it is most beautiful to see how what has happened has brought him at once to what she wished, when perhaps otherwise it would have been a work of a long time. Ethel was entirely consoled. Flora thought of the words, Tete exalte and considered herself alone to have sober sense enough to see things in a true light. Not that she went the length of believing that Norman had any underhand motives, but she thought it very discreet in her to think a prudent father would not have been satisfied with such a desire to avoid investigation. Dr. May would not trust himself to enter on the subject with Dr. Hoxton in conversation. He only wrote a note. June 16th. Dear Dr. Hoxton, my son has appealed to me to confirm his account of himself on Thursday evening last. I therefore distinctly state that he came in at half-past nine, with his hands full of plants from the river, and that he then went out again, by my desire, to look for his little brother. Yours very truly, R. May. A long answer came in return, disclaiming all doubt of Norman's veracity, and explaining Dr. Hoxton's grounds for having degraded him. There had been misconduct in the school, he said, for some time past, and he did not consider that it was any very serious approach to a boy of Norman's age that he had not had weight enough to keep up his authority, and had been carried away by the general feeling. It had been necessary to make an example for the sake of principle, and though very sorry it should have fallen on one of such high promise and general good conduct, Dr. Hoxton trusted that it would not be any permanent injury to his prospects, as his talents had raised him to his former position in the school so much earlier than usual. The fact was, said Dr. May, that old Hoxton did it in a passion, feeling he must punish somebody, and now, finding there's no uproar about it, he begins to be sorry. I won't answer this note. I'll stop after church tomorrow and shake hands, and that will show we don't bear malice. What Mr. Wilmot might think was felt by all to affect them more nearly. Ethel wanted to hear that he declared his complete conviction of Norman's innocence, and was disappointed to find that he did not once allude to the subject. She was only consoled by Margaret's conjecture that, perhaps, he thought the headmaster had been hasty, and could not venture to say so. He saw into people's characters, and it was notorious that it was just what Dr. Hoxton did not. Tom had spent the chief of that Saturday in reading a novel borrowed from Axworthy, keeping out of sight of everyone. All Sunday he avoided Norman more scrupulously than ever, and again on Monday. That day was a severe trial to Norman. The taking the lower place, and the sense that, excel as much as ever he might in his studies, it would not avail to restore him to his former place, were more unpleasant, when it came to the point, than he had expected. He saw the cold manner, so different from the readiness with which his tasks had always been met, certain as they were of being well done, 
he found himself among the common herd whom he had passed so triumphantly, and for a little while he had no heart to exert himself. This was conquered by the strong will and self-rebuke for having merely craved for applause. But in the playground he found himself still alone. The other boys who had been erased by his fall shrank from intercourse with one whom they had injured by their silence, and the Andersons, who were wont to say the Mays carried every tale home, and who still almost expected interference from Dr. May, hardly believed their victory secure. And the younger one, at least, talked spitefully and triumphed in the result of May's meddling and troublesome over-strictness. Such prigs always come to a downfall, was the sentiment. Norman found himself left out of everything, and stood dispirited and weary on the bank of the river, wishing for Harry, wishing for Cheviot, wishing that he had been able to make a friend who would stand by him, thinking it could not be worse if he had let his father reinstate him, and a sensation of loneliness and injustice hung heavy at his heart. His first interruption was a merry voice. "'I say, June, there's no end of river crayfish under that bank!' And Larkin's droll face was looking up at him, from that favourite position, half stooping, his hands on his knees, his expression of fun trying to conceal his real anxiety and sympathy. Norman turned and smiled, and looked for the crayfish, and at the same time became aware of Hector Ernscliffe, watching for an opportunity to say, "'I have a letter from Alan. He knew they wanted, as far as little boys ventured to seek after one so much their elder, to show themselves his friends, and he was grateful. He roused himself to hear about Alan's news, and found it was important. His great friend, Captain Gordon, had got a ship, and hoped to be able to take him, and this might lead to Harry's going with him. Then Norman applied himself to the capture of crayfish, and Larkins grew so full of fun and drollery that the hours of recreation passed off less gloomily than they had begun. If only his brother would have been his adherent. But he saw almost nothing of Tom. Day after day he missed him. He was off before him in going and returning from school, and when he caught a sight of his face, it looked harassed, pale and miserable, stealing anxious glances after him, yet shrinking from his eye. But at the same time, Norma did not see him mingling with his former friends, and could not make out how he disposed of himself. To be thus continually shunned by his own brother, even when the general mass were returning to ordinary terms, became so painful that Norman was always on the watch to seek for one more conversation with him. He caught him at last in the evening, just as they were going home. "'Tom, why are you running away? Come with me!' said he authoritatively, and Tom obeyed in trembling. Norman led the way to the meads. "'Tom,' said he, "'do not let this go on. Why do you serve me? Why do you serve me in this way?' "'You surely need not turn against me,' he said with pleading melancholy in his voice. It was not needed. Tom had flung himself upon the grass and was in an agony of crying, even before he had finished the words. "'Tom, Tom, what is the matter? Have they been bullying you again? Look up and tell me. What is it?' "'You know, I can stand by you still, if you'll only let me,' said Norman. And Norman sat by him on the grass and raised his face by a sort of force. But the kind words only brought more piteous sobs. It was a long time before they diminished enough to let him utter a word, but Norman went on patiently consoling and inquiring, sure at least, that here had broken down the sullenness that had always repelled him. At last came the words, Oh, I cannot bear it! It is all my doing! What? How? You don't mean this happening to me? It's not your doing, August. What fancy is this? Oh, yes it is, said Tom, his voice cut short by gasps, the remains of the sobs. They would not hear me. I tried to tell them how you told them not, and sent them home. I tried to tell them about Bull Hatchet, but, but they wouldn't. They said if it had been Harry, they would have attended, but they would not believe me. Oh, if Harry was but here. I wish he was, said Norman, from the bottom of his heart. But you see, Tom, if this sets you on always telling truth, I shan't think any great harm done. A fresh burst. Oh, they are all so glad. They say such things. And the Mays were never in disgrace before. Oh, Norman, Norman. Never mind about that, began Norman. But you would mind, broke in the boy passionately. And if you knew what Anderson Jr. and Axworthy say, they say it serves you right. And they were going to send me to old Bell Hatchard's to get some of his stuff to drink confusion to the mouth of June and all pragmatical mendlers. And when I said I could not go, they vowed if I did not, I should eat the corks for them. And Anderson Jr. called me names and licked me. Look there. He showed a dark blue and red stripe raised on the palm of his hand, 
I could not write well for it these three days, and Hawes gave me double copies. The cowardly fellows, exclaimed Norman indignantly. But you did not go. No, Anderson Senior stopped them. He said he would not have the bullhatchets business begin again. That is one comfort, said Norman. I see he does not dare not to keep order. But if you'll only stay with me, August, I'll take care they don't hurt you. Oh, June, June, and he threw himself across his kind brother. I'm so very sorry, oh, to see you put down, and hear them, and you to lose the scholarship, oh dear, oh dear, and be in disgrace with them all. But, Tom, do cheer up. It is nothing to be in such distress at. Papa knows all about it, and while he does, I don't care half so much. Oh, I wish, I wish. You see, Tom, said Norman, after all, though it is very kind of you to be sorry for not being able to get me out of this scrape, the thing one wants you to be sorry about is your own affair. I wish I had never come to school. I wish Anderson would leave me alone. It is all his fault. A mean-spirited, skulking, bullying... Hush, hush, Tom. He is bad enough. But now you know what he is. You can keep clear of him for the future. Now listen. You and I will make a fresh start, and try if we can't get the maids to be looked on as they were when Harry was here. Let us mind the rules, and get into no more mischief. You'll keep me from Ned Anderson and Axworthy? whispered Tom. Yes, that I will, and you'll try and speak the truth and be straightforward? I will, I will, said Tom, worn out in spirits by his long bondage and glad to catch at the hope of relief and protection. Then let us come home, and Tom put his hand into his brother's, as a few weeks back would have seemed most unworthy of schoolboy dignity. Thenceforth, Tom was devoted to Norman, and kept close to him, sure that the instant he was from under his wing his former companions would fall on him to revenge his defection, but clinging to him also from real affection and gratitude. Indolence and timidity were the true root of what had for a time seemed like a positively bad disposition. Beneath there was a warm heart and sense of right which had been almost stifled for the time in the desire from moment to moment to avoid present trouble or fear. Under Norman's care his better self had freer scope. He was guarded from immediate terror, and kept from the suggestions of the worst sort of boys, as much as was in his brother's power. And the looks they cast towards him, and the slight torments they attempted to inflict, by no means invited him back to them. The lessons, where he had a long inveterate habit of shuffling, came under Norman's eye at the same time. He always prepared them in his presence, instead of in the most secret manner possible, and with all Anderson's expeditious modes of avoiding the making them of any use. Norman sat by, and gave such help as was fair and just, showed him how to learn, and explained difficulties, and the ingenuity hitherto spent in eluding learning being now directed to gaining it, he began to make real progress and find satisfaction in it. The comfort of being good dawned upon him once more, but still there was much to contend with. He had acquired such a habit of prevarication that, if by any means taken by surprise, his impulse was to avoid giving a straightforward answer and when he recollected his sincerity, the truth came with the air of falsehood. Moreover, he was an arrant coward, and provoked tricks by his manifest and unreasonable terrors. It was no slight exercise of patience that Norman underwent, but this was the interest he had made for himself, and the recovery of the boy's attachment and his improvement, though slow, were a present recompense. Earnscliff, Larkins, and others of the boys held fast to him, and after the first excitement was passed, all the rest returned to their former tone. He was decidedly as much respected as ever, and at the same time regarded with more favour than when his strictness was resented. And as for the discipline of the school, that did not suffer. Anderson felt that, for his own credit, he must not allow the rules to be less observed than in May's reign, and he enforced them upon the reluctant and angry boys with whom he had been previously making common cause. Dr. Hoxton boasted to the undermasters that the school had never been in such good order as under Anderson, little guessing that this was but reaping the fruits of a past victory, or that every boy in the whole school gave the highest place in their esteem to the deposed ducks. To Anderson, Norman's cordial manner and ready support were the strangest part of all, only explained by thinking that he deemed it, as he tried to do himself, merely the fortune of war and was sensible of no injury. And for Norman himself, when the first shock was over, and he was accustomed to the change, he found the cessation of vigilance a relief, and carried a lighter heart than any time since his mother's death. His sisters could not help observing that there was less sadness in the expression of his eyes, that he carried his head higher, walked with freedom and elasticity of step, tossed and flourished the daisy till she shouted and crowed, 
while Margaret shrank at such freaks, and though he was not much of a laugh himself, contributed much sport in the way of bright apposite sayings to the home circle. It was a very unexpected mode of cure for depression of spirits, but there could be no question that it succeeded, and when, a few Saturdays after, he drove Dr. May again to Grosswood to see young Mr. Lake, who was recovering, he brought Margaret home a whole pile of botanical curiosities, and drew his father into an animated battle of natural and inane systems, which kept the whole party merry with the pros and cons every evening for a week. End of part one, chapter twenty-two. Recorded by Gail Goslin. Part one, chapter twenty-three of the Daisy Chain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Goslin. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. Part 1, Chapter 23. Oh, the golden hearted daisies, witnessed there before my youth to the truth of things with praises of the beauty of the truth. E.B. Browning. Margaret, see here! The doctor threw into her lap a letter which made her cheeks light up. Mr. Ernstcliff wrote that his father's friend, Captain Gordon, having been appointed to the frigate Alcestis, had chosen him as one of his lieutenants, and offered a nomination as naval cadet for his brother. He had replied that the navy was not Hector's destination, but as Captain Gordon had no one else in view, had prevailed on him to pass on the proposal to Harry May. Allen wrote in high terms of his captain, declaring that he esteemed that having sailed with him as one of the greatest advantages he had ever received, and adding that, for his own part, Dr. May needed no promise from him to be assured that he would watch over Harry like his own brother. It was believed that the Alcestis was destined for the South American station. A three years business, said Dr. May with a sigh. But the thing is done, and this is as good as we can hope. Far better, said Margaret. What pleasure it must have given him. Dear, Harry could not sail under more favourable circumstances. No, I would trust to Ernscliff as I would to Richard. It is kindly done, and I will thank him at once. Where does he date from? From Portsmouth. He does not say whether he has seen Harry. I suppose he waited for my answer. Suppose I enclose a note for him to give to Harry. There will be rapture enough, and it is a pity he should not have the benefit of it. The doctor sat down to write, while Margaret worked and mused, perhaps on outfits and new shirts, perhaps on Harry's lion locks, beneath a blue cap and gold band, or, perchance, on the coral shoals of the Pacific. It was one of the quiet afternoons, when all the rest were out, and which the doctor and his daughter especially valued, when they were able to spend one together without interruption. Soon, however, a ring at the door brought an impatient exclamation from the doctor. But his smile beamed out at the words, Miss Rivers. They were great friends. In fact, on terms of some mutual sauciness, though Meta was as yet far less at home with his daughters, and came in looking somewhat shy. "'Ah, your congeners are gone out,' was the doctor's reception. "'You must put up with our sober selves.' "'Is Flora gone far?' asked Meta. "'To Coxmoor,' said Margaret. "'I'm very sorry she has missed you.' "'Shall I be in your way?' said Meta timidly. "'Papa has several things to do, and said he would call for me here.' "'Good luck for Margaret,' said Dr. May. "'So they are gone to Coxmoor,' said Meta. "'How I envy them.' "'You would not if you saw the place,' said Dr. May. "'I believe Norman is very angry with me for letting them go near it.' "'Ah, but they are of real use there, "'and Miss Meta is obliged to take to envying the black hole of Coxmoor "'instead of being content with the eglantine bowers of Abbotstoke. "'I commiserate her,' said the doctor. "'If I did any good instead of harm at Abbotstoke—' "'Harm!' exclaimed Margaret. They went on very well without me, said Meta, but ever since I've had the class they have been getting naughtier and noisier every Sunday, and last Sunday, the prettiest of all, the one I liked best and had done everything for, she began to mimic me, held up her finger, as I did, and made them all laugh. Well, that is very bad, said Margaret, but I suppose she was a very little one. No, a quick clever one who knew much better, about nine years old. She used to be always at home in the week, dragging about a great baby, and we managed that her mother should afford to stay at home and send her to school. It seemed such a pity her cleverness should be wasted. The doctor smiled. Ah, depend upon it, the tyrant baby was the best disciplinarian. 
Meta looked extremely puzzled. Papa means, said Margaret, that if she was inclined to be conceited, the being teased at home might do her more good than being brought forward at school. I have done everything wrong, it seems, said Meta, with a shade of what the French called dépit. I thought it must be right and good, but it has only done mischief. And now Papa says they are an ungrateful set, and that if it vexes me, I had better have no more to do with them. Does not vex you so much as that, I hope, said Margaret. Oh, I could not bear that, said Meta, but it is so different from what I thought. Ah, you had an Arcadia of good little girls in straw hats, such as I see in Blanche's little books, said the doctor all making the young lady an oracle and doing wrong, if they do it at all, in the simplest way, just for an example to the others. Dr. May, how can you know so well? But you really think it is their fault, or mine? Do you think me a conjurer? Well, but what do you think? What do Mr. and Mrs. Charles Wilmot think? I know Mrs. Wilmot thinks I spoil my class. She spoke to me about making favourites, and sometimes has seemed surprised at things which I have done. Last Sunday she told me she thought I had better have a steadier class, and I know whom she will give me. The great big stupid ones at the bottom of the first class. I do believe it is only out of good nature that she does not tell me not to teach at all. I have a great mind I will not. I know I do nothing but harm. What shall you say if I tell you I think so too? asked the doctor. Oh, Dr. May, you don't really. Now does he, Miss May? I'm sure I only want to do them good. I don't know what I can have done. Margaret made her perceive that the doctor was smiling, and she changed her tone, and earnestly begged to be told what they thought of the case, for, if she should show her concern at home, her father and governess would immediately beg her to cease from all connection with the school, and she did not feel at all convinced that Mrs. Wilmot liked to have her there. Feeling injured by the implied accusation of mismanagement, yet with a sense of its truth, used to be petted and new to rebuffs, yet with a sincere wish to act rightly, she was much perplexed by this, her first reverse, and had come partly with a view of consulting Flora, though she had fallen on other counsellors. Margaret, our adviser general said the doctor, what do you say? Put yourself in the place of Mrs. Charles Wilmot, and say, shall Miss Rivers teach or not? I had rather you would, Papa. Not I, I never kept school. Well, then, I being Mrs. Wilmot should certainly be mortified if Miss Rivers deserted me because the children were naughty. I think I'd rather she came and asked me what she had better do. And you would answer, teach, for fear of vexing her, said Meta. I should, and also for the sake of letting her learn to teach. The point where only trial shows one's ignorance, said Dr. May. But I don't want to do it for my own sake, said Meta. I do everything for my own sake already. For theirs then, said the doctor. If teaching will not come by nature, you must serve an apprenticeship, if you mean to be of service in that line. Perhaps it was the gift that the fairies omitted, but will it do any good to them? I can't tell, but I am sure it would do them harm for you to give it up, because it is disagreeable. Well, said Meta with a sigh, I'll go and talk to Mrs. Wilmot. I could not bear to give up anything that seems right just now, because of the confirmation. Margaret eagerly inquired and it appeared that the bishop had given notice for a confirmation in August, and that Mr. Wilmot was already beginning to prepare his candidates, whilst Mr. Ramsden, always tardy, never gave notice till the last moment possible. The hope was expressed that Harry might be able to profit by this opportunity, and Harry's prospects were explained to Meta. Then the doctor, recollecting something that he wished to say to Mr. Rivers, began to ask about the chance of his coming before the time of an engagement of his own. He said he should be here at about half-past four, said Meta. He's gone to the station to inquire about trains. Do you know what time the last comes in? At 9.45, said the doctor. That's what we were afraid of. It is for Belez, my maid. Her mother is very ill, and she's afraid she is not properly nursed. It is about five miles from the Milbury station, and we thought of letting her go with a day ticket to see about her. She could go in the morning, after I'm up, but I don't know what is to be done, for she could not get back before I dress for dinner. Margaret felt perfectly aghast at the cool tone, especially after what had passed. It would be quite impossible, said the doctor. Even going by the eight o'clock train and returning by the last, she would only have two hours to spare. Short enough measure for a sick mother. Papa means to give her whatever she wants for any nurse she may get. Is there no one with her mother now? A son's wife, who they think is not kind, 
Poor Belez was so grateful for being allowed to go home. I wonder if I could dress for once without her. Do you know old Crab? said the doctor. The dear old man at Abbotstoke? Oh, yes, of course. There was a very sad case in his family. The mother was dying of a lingering illness when the son met with a bad accident. The only daughter was a lady's maid and could not be spared, though the brother was half crazy to see her, and there was no one to tend them but a wretch of a woman, paid by the parish. The poor fellow kept calling for his sister in his delirium, and at last I could not help writing to the mistress. Did she let her come? said Meta, her cheek glowing. As a great favour, she let her set out by the mail train after dressing her for a ball, with orders to return in time for her toilette for an evening party the next day. Oh, I remember, said Margaret, her coming here at five in the morning, and your taking her home. And when we got to Abbotstoke, the brother was dead. That parish nurse had not attended to my directions, and I do believe was the cause of it. The mother had had a seizure, and was in the most precarious state. Surely she stayed! It was as much as her place was worth said the doctor, and her wages were the chief maintenance of the family, so she had to go back to dress her mistress, while the old woman lay there, wailing after Betsy. She did give warning then, but before the month was out, the mother was dead. Meta did not speak, and Dr. May presently rose, saying he should try to meet Mr. Rivers in the town, and went out. Meta sat thoughtful, and at last, sighing, said, I wonder whether Belair's mother is so very ill. I have a great mind to let Susan try to do my hair, and let Belle stay a little longer. I never thought of that. I do not think you will be sorry, said Margaret. Yes, I shall, for if my hair does not look nice, Papa will not be pleased, and there is Aunt Leonora coming. How odd it will be to be without Belle I will ask Mrs. Larpent. Oh, yes, said Margaret. You must not think we're meant to advise, but Papa has seen so many instances of distress, from servants not spared to their friends in illness, that he feels strongly on the subject. And I really might have been as cruel as that woman, said Meta, while I hope Mrs. Bellays may be better and able to spare her daughter. I don't know what will become of me without her. I think it will have been a satisfaction in one way, said Margaret. In what way? Don't you remember what you began by complaining of, that you could not be of use? Now, I fancy this would give you the pleasure of undergoing a little personal inconvenience for the good of another. Meta looked half puzzled, half thoughtful. And Margaret who was a little uneasy at the style of counsel she found herself giving, changed the conversation. It was a memorable one to little Miss Rivers, opening out to her, as did almost all her meetings with that family, a new scope for thought and for duty. The code to which she had been brought up taught that servants were the machines of their employer's convenience. Good nature occasioned much kindliness of manner and intercourse, and every luxury and indulgence was afforded freely. But where there was any want of accordance between the convenience of the two parties, there was no question. Their master must be the first object. The servant's remedy was in their own hands. Amiable as was Mr. Rivers, this merely from indulgence and want of reflection was his principle. And his daughter had only been acting on it, though she did not know it, till the feelings that she had never thought of with us displayed before her. These were her first practical lessons that life was not meant to be passed in pleasing ourselves, and being good-natured, at small cost. It was an effort. Meta was very dependent, never having been encouraged to be otherwise, and Belez was like a necessary of life in her estimation, but strength of principle came to aid her naturally kind-hearted feeling, and she was pleased by the idea of voluntarily undergoing a privation, so as to test her sincerity. So, when her father told her of the inconvenient times of the trains, and declared that Belez must give it up, she answered by proposing to let her sleep a night or two there, gaily promised to manage very well, and satisfied him. Her maid's grateful looks and thanks recompensed her when she made the offer to her, and inspirited her to an energetic coaxing of Mrs. Larpent, who, being more fully aware than her father of the needfulness of the lady's maid, and also very anxious that her darling should appear to the best advantage before the expected aunt, Lady Leonora Langdale, was unwilling to grant more than one night at the utmost. Meta carried the day, and her last assurance to Belez was that she might stay as long as seemed necessary to make her mother comfortable. Thereupon Meta found herself more helpful in some matters than she had expected, but at a loss in others. Susan, with all Mrs. Larpent's supervision, could not quite bring her dress to the air that was so peculiarly graceful and becoming, and she often caught her papa's eye looking at her as if he saw something amiss and could not discover what it was. Then came Aunt Leonora, always very kind to meet her, but the dread of the rest of the household, whom she was wont to lecture on the proper care of her niece. Miss Rivers was likely to have a considerable fortune, and Lady Leonora intended her to be a very fashionable and much-admired young lady, 
under her own immediate protection. The two cousins, Leonora and Agatha, talked to her. The one of her balls, the other of her music, patronized her and called her their good little cousin, while they criticized the stiff set of those unfortunate plates made by Susan, and laughed as if it was an unheard-of concession at Bele's holiday. Nevertheless, when honoured miss received a note begging for three days longer grace till a niece should come, in whom Belez could place full confidence, she took it on herself to return free consent. Lady Leonora found out what she had done, and reproved her, telling her it was only the way to make those people presume, and Mrs. Larpent was also taken to task. But decidedly, Meta did not regret what she had done, though she felt as if she had never before known how to appreciate comfort when she once more beheld Belair's station at her toilette table. Mita was asked about her friends. She could not mention anyone but Mrs. Charles Wilmot and the Mrs. May. Physician's daughters, oh! said Lady Leonora, and she proceeded to exhort Mr. Rivers to bring his daughter to London, or its neighbourhood, where she might have masters, and be in the way of forming intimacies suited to her connections. Mr. Rivers dreaded London, never was well there, and did not like the trouble of moving, while Meta was so attached to the Grange that she entreated him not to think of leaving it, and greatly dreaded her aunt's influence. Lady Leonora did, indeed, allow that the Grange was a very pretty place. Her only complaint was the want of suitable society for Meta. She could not bear the idea of her growing accustomed, for want of something better, to the vicar's wife and the pet doctor's daughters. Flora had been long desirous to effect a regular call at Abbotstoke, and it was just now that she succeeded. Mrs. Charles Wilmot's little girl was to have a birthday feast, at which Mary, Blanche and Aubrey were to appear. Flora went in charge of them, and as soon as she had safely deposited them and appointed Mary to keep Aubrey out of mischief, she walked up to the Grange, not a whit daunted by the report of the very fine ladies who were astonishing the natives of Abbotstoke. She was admitted and found herself in the drawing-room, with a quick, lively-looking lady, whom she perceived to be Lady Leonora, and who instantly began talking to her very civilly. Flora was never at a loss, and they got on extremely well, her ease and self-possession, without forwardness, telling much to her advantage. Meta came in, delighted to see her, but of course the visit resulted in no really intimate talk, though it was not without effect. Flora declared Lady Leonora Langdale to be a most charming person, and Lady Leonora, on her side, asked Meta who was that very elegant conversable girl. Flora May, was the delighted answer, now that the aunt had committed herself by commendation, and she did not retract it. She pronounced Flora to be something quite out of the common way, and supposed that she had had unusual advantages. Mr. Rivers took care to introduce to his sister-in-law Dr. May, who would fain have avoided it but ended by being in his turn pleased and entertained by her brilliant conversation, which she put forth for him, as her instinct showed her that she was talking to a man of high ability, a perfect gentleman she saw him to be, and making out some mutual connections far up in the family tree of the Mackenzies, she decided that the May family were an acquisition, and very good companions for her niece at present, while not yet come out. So ended the visit, with this great triumph for Meta, who had a strong belief in Aunt Leonora's power and infallibility, and yet had not consulted her about Belez, nor about the school question. She had missed one Sunday's school on account of her aunt's visit, but the resolution made beside Margaret's sofa had not been forgotten. She spent her Saturday afternoon in a call on Mrs. Wilmot, ending with a walk through the village. She confessed her ignorance, apologised for her blunders, and put herself under the direction which once she had fancied too strict and harsh to be followed. And on Sunday she was content to teach the stupid girls, and abstained from making much of the smooth-faced engaging set. She thought it very dull work, but she could feel that it was something not done to please herself. And whereas her father had feared she would be dull when her cousins were gone, he found her more joyous than ever. There certainly was a peculiar happiness about Margaret Rivers. Her vexations were but ripples rendering the sunny course of her life more sparkling, and each exertion in the way of goodness was productive of so much present joy that the steps of her ladder seemed, indeed, to be of diamonds. Her ladder, for she was indeed mounting upwards. She was very earnest in her confirmation preparation, most anxious to do right and to contend with her failings, but the struggle at present was easy, and the hopes, joys and incentives shone out more and more upon her in this blithe stage of her life. She knew there was a dark side, but hope and love were more present to her than was fear. Happy those to whom such young days are granted. 
End of Part 1, Chapter 23 Recording by Gail Goslin Part 1, Chapter 24 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gail Goslin The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young Part 1, Chapter 24 It is the generous spirit who, when brought among the tasks of real life, hath wrought upon the plan that pleased his childish thought, whose high endeavours are an inward light, making the path before him always bright. Wordsworth The holidays had commenced about a week when Harry, now duly appointed to HMS Alcestis, was to come home on leave, as he proudly expressed it. A glad troop of brothers and sisters, with a doctor himself, walked up to the station to meet him, and who was happiest when, from the window, was thrust out the rosy face with a gold band? Mary gave such a shriek and leap that two passengers and one guard turned round to look at her, to the extreme discomfiture of Flora and Norman. Evidenced by one by a grave, Mary, Mary, by the other by walking off to the extreme end of the platform and trying to look as if he did not belong to them, in which he was imitated by his shadow, Tom. Sailor already, rather than schoolboy, Harry cared not for spectators. His bound from the carriage, and the hug between him, and Mary would have been worthy of the return from the voyage. The next greeting was for his father, and the sisters had had their share by the time the two brothers thought fit to return from their calm walk on the platform. Grand was it to see that party return to the town. The naval cadet, with his arm linked in Mary's, and Aubrey clinging to his hand, and the others walking behind, admiring him as he turned his bright face every moment with some glad question or answer. How was Margaret? Oh, so much better. She had been able to walk across the room. With Norman's arm around her, they hoped she would soon use crutches, and she sat up more. And the baby? More charming than ever. Four teeth. Would soon walk. Such a darling. Then came, My Dirk, the ship, our berth. Papa, do ask Mr. Earnscliff to come here. I know he could get leave. Mr. Earnscliff? You used to call him Alan, said Mary. Yes, but that is all over now. You forget what we do on board. Captain Gordon himself calls me Mr. May. Some laughed. Others were extremely impressed. Ha! Huh, there's Ned Anderson coming, cried Mary. Now, let him see you, Harry. What matters Ned Anderson to me? said Harry, and with an odd mixture of shamefacedness and cordiality, he marched full up to his old schoolfellow and shook hands with him, as if able, in the plenitude of his officership, to afford plenty of good-humoured superiority. Tom had meantime subsided out of all view, but poor Harry's exultation had a fall. Well, graciously inquired Mr. May, and how is Harvey? Oh, very well. We're expecting him home tomorrow. Where has he been? To Oxford, about the Randall. Harry gave a disturbed, wondering look round, on seeing Edward's air of malignant satisfaction. He saw nothing that reassured him, except the quietness of Norman's own face, but even that altered as their eyes met. Before another word could be said, however, the doctor's hand was on Harry's shoulder. You must not keep him now, Ned said he. His sister has not seen him yet. And he moved his little procession onwards, still resting on Harry's shoulder, while a silence had fallen on all, and even the young sailor ventured no question. Only Tom's lips were quivering, and Ethel had squeezed Norman's hand. Poor Harry, he muttered. This is worst of all. I wish we had written it to him. So do I now, but we always trusted it would come right. Oh, if I were but a boy to flog that Edward! Hush, Ethel, remember what we resolved. They were entering their own garden, where, beneath the shade of the tulip tree, Margaret lay on her couch. Her arms were held out, and Harry threw himself upon her, but when he rose from her caress, 
Norman and Tom were gone. What is this? he now first ventured to ask. Come with me, said Dr. May, leading the way to his study, where he related the whole history of the suspicion that Norman had incurred. He was glad that he had done so in private, for Harry's indignation and grief went beyond his expectations. And when at last it appeared that Harvey Anderson was actually Randall Scholar, after opening his eyes with the utmost incredulity and causing it to be a second time repeated, he gave a gulp or two, turned very red, and ended by laying his head on the table, and fairly sobbing and crying aloud, in spite of dirk, uniform, and manhood. "'Harry, why, Harry, my boy! We should have prepared you for this,' said the doctor affectionately. "'We have left off breaking our hearts about it. I don't want any comfort now for having gold instead of glitter, though at first I was as bad as you.' "'Oh, if I had but been there!' said Harry, combating unsuccessfully with his tears. "'Ah, so we all said, Norman and all, your word would have cleared him. That is, if you had not been in the thick of the mischief. Ha! July! Should not you have been on the top of the wall? I would have stood by him at least. Would not I have given Axworthy and Anderson two such black eyes as they could not have shown in school for a week?' They had better look out, cried Harry savagely. What, an officer in Her Majesty's service? Eh, Mr. May? Don't, Papa, don't. Oh, I thought it would have been so happy when I came home to see Norman Randall's collar. Oh, now I don't care for the ship nor anything. Again, Harry's face went down on the table. Come, come, Harry, said Dr. May, pulling off the spectacles that had become very dewy. Don't let us make fools of ourselves, or they will think we are dying for the scholarship. I don't care for the scholarship, but to have June turned down, and disgrace. What I care for, Harry, is having June what he is, and that I know better now. He is, he is, he is June himself, and no mistake, cried Harry with vehemence. The prime of the year, is not it? said the doctor, smiling, as he stroked down the blue sleeve as if he thought that generous July did not fall far short of it. "'That he is!' exclaimed Harry. "'I have never met one fellow like him.' "'It will be a chance if you ever do,' said Dr. May. "'That is better than scholarships.' "'It should have been both,' said Harry. "'Norman thinks the disappointment has been very good for him,' said the doctor. "'Perhaps it made him what he is now. "'All success is no discipline, you know.' Harry looked as if he did not know. Perhaps you will understand better by and by, but this I can tell you, Harry, that the patient bearing of his vexation has done more to renew Norman's spirits than all his prosperity. See if it has not. I believe it is harder to every one of us than to him. To Ethel especially, it is a struggle to be in charity with the Andersons. In charity? repeated Harry. Papa! You don't want us to like a horrid, sneaking, mean-spirited pair like those that have used Norman in that shameful way? No, certainly not. I only want you to feel no more personal anger than if it had been Cheviot or some indifferent person that had been injured. I should have hated them all the same, cried Harry. If it is all the same and it is the treasury you hate, I ask no more, said the doctor. I can't help it, Papa, I can't. If I were to meet those fellows, do you think I could shake hands with them? If I did not lick Ned all down Minster Street, he might think himself lucky. Well, Harry, I won't argue any more. I have no right to preach forbearance. Your brother's example is better worth than my precept. Shall we go back to Margaret, or have you anything to say to me? Harry made no positive answer, but pressed close to his father, who put his arm around him while the curly head was laid on his shoulder. Presently he said, with a great sigh, "'There's nothing like home.' "'Was that what you wanted to say?' asked Dr. May, smiling, as he held the boy more closely to him. "'No, but it will be a long time before I come back. They think we shall have orders for the Pacific.' "'You will come home, our real lion,' said the doctor. "'How much you will have to tell.' "'Yes,' said Harry, "'but—' 
Oh, it is very different from coming home every night, not having anyone to tell a thing to. Do you want to say anything now? I don't know. I told you in my letter about the half-sovereign. Ay, never mind that. And there was one night, I'm afraid, I did not stand by a little fellow that they bullied about his prayers. Perhaps he would have gone on if I had helped him. Does he sail with you? No, he was at school. If I had told him that he and I would stand by each other, but he looked so foolish and began to cry. I'm sorry now. Weak spirits have much to bear, said the doctor, and you stronger ones who don't mind being bullied are meant, I suppose, to help them, as Norman has been doing by poor little Tommy. It was thinking of Norman that made me sorry. I knew there was something else, but you see I forget when I don't see you and Margaret every day. You have one always near, my boy. I know, but I cannot always recollect, and there is such a row at night on board, I cannot think or attend as I ought, murmured Harry. Yes, your life, sleeping at home in quiet, has not prepared you for that trial, said the doctor. But others have kept upright habits under the same, you know, and God helps those who are doing their best. Harry sighed. I mean to do my best, he added, and if it was not for feeling bad, I should like it. I do like it. And his eyes sparkled and his smile beamed, though the tear was undried. I know you do, said Dr. May, smiling. And for feeling bad, my Harry, I fear you must do that by sea or land, as long as you are in this world. God be thanked that you grieve over the feeling. But he is ready to aid and knows the trial, and you will be brought nearer to him before you leave us. Margaret wrote about the confirmation. Am I old enough? If you wish it, Harry, under these circumstances. I suppose I do, said Harry, uneasily twirling a button. But then, if I've got to forgive the Andersons... We won't talk any more of that, said the doctor. Here is poor Mary, reconnoitring to know why I am keeping you from her. Then began the scampering up and down the house, round and round the garden, visiting every pet or haunt or contrivance. Mary and Harry at the head, Blanche and Tom in full career after them, and Aubrey stumping and scrambling at his utmost speed far behind. Not a word passed between Norman and Harry on the school misadventure, but after the outbreak of the latter, he treated it as a thing forgotten, and brought all his high spirits to enliven the family party. Richard, too, returned later on the same day, and though not received with the same uproarious joy as Harry, the elder section of the family were as happy in their way as what Blanche called the middle-aged. The daisy was brought down, and the eleven were again all in the same room, though there were suppressed sighs from some, who reflected how long it might be before they could again assemble. Tea went off happily in the garden, with much laughing and talking. "'Pity to leave such good company,' said the doctor, unwillingly rising at last. "'But I must go to the Union.' I promised Ward to meet him there. Oh, let me walk with you, cried Harry. And me, cried other voices, and the doctor proposed that they should wait for him in the meads and extend the walk after the visit. Richard and Ethel both expressing their intention of adhering to Margaret, the latter observing how nice it would be to get rid of everybody and have a talk. What have we been doing all this time? said Dr. May, laughing. Chattering, not conversing, said Ethel saucily. Aye, the Coxmoor board is going to sit, said Dr. May. What is a board? inquired Blanche, who had just come down prepared for her walk. Richard, Margaret and Ethel. When they sit upon Coxmoor, said Dr. May. But Margaret never does sit on Coxmoor, Papa. Only allegorically, Blanche, said Norman. But I don't understand what is a board, pursued Blanche. Mr. May in his ship, was Norman's suggestion. Poor Blanche stood in perplexity. What is it really? Something wooden-headed, continued the provoking papa. A board is all wooden, not only its head, said Blanche. Exactly so, especially at Stoneborough, said the doctor. It is what papa is when he comes out of the council room, added Ethel. Or what everyone is while the girls are rigging themselves, sighed Harry. Ha! Here's Polly. Now we only want Flora. 
And my stethoscope? Has anyone seen my stethoscope? exclaimed the doctor, beginning to rush frantically into the study, dining room and his own room, but failing, quietly took up a book and gave up the search, which was vigorously pursued by Richard, Flora and Mary, until the missing article was detected, where Aubrey had left it in the nook on the stairs, after using it for a trumpet and a telescope. Ah, now my goods will have a chance, said Dr. May, as he took it and patted Richard's shoulder. I have my best right hand, and Margaret will be saved endless sufferings. Papa! I, poor dear, don't I see what she undergoes, when nobody will remember that useful proverb, a place for everything and everything in its place. I believe one use of her brains is to make an inventory of all the things left about the drawing room. But beyond it, it is past her power. Yes, said Flora, rather aggrieved. I do the best I can, but when nobody ever puts anything into its place, what can I do single-handed? So no one ever goes anywhere without first turning the house upside down for their property. And Aubrey, and now even Baby, are always carrying whatever they can lay hands on into the nursery. I can't bear it, and the worst of it is that, she added, finishing her lamentation, after the others were out at the door, Papa and Ethel have neither of them the least shame about it. No, no, Flora, that is not fair, exclaimed Margaret. But Flora was gone. I have shame, sighed Ethel, walking across the room disconsolately to put a book into a shelf. And you don't leave things trainants as you used, said Margaret. That is what I meant. I wish I did not, said Ethel. I was thinking whether I had better not make myself pay a forfeit. Suppose you keep a book for me, Margaret and make a mark against me at everything I leave about. And if I pay a farthing for each, it will be so much away from Coxmoor, so I must cure myself. And what shall become of the forfeits? asked Richard. Oh, they won't be enough to be worth having, I hope, said Margaret. Give them to the ladies' committee, said Ethel, making a face. Oh, Richie, they're worse than ever. We're so glad that Flora is going to join it, and see whether she can do any good. We? said Margaret, hesitating. Ah, uh, I know you aren't, but Papa said she might, and you know she has so much tact and management, as Norman says, observed Margaret doubtfully. I cannot like the notion of Flora going and squabbling with Mrs. Ledwich and Louisa Anderson. What do you think, Richie? asked Ethel. Is it not too bad that they should have it all their own way, and spoil the whole female population? Why, the last thing they did was to leave off reading the prayer book prayers morning and evening and it is much expected that next they will attack all learning by heart. It is too bad, said Richard, but Flora can hardly hinder them. It will be one voice, said Ethel. But oh, if I could only say half what I have in my mind, they must see the error. Why, these, these, what they call formal, these the ties, links on to the church, on to what is good, if they don't learn them soundly, ram down hard, you know what I mean, so that they can't remember the first, remember when they did not know them, they will never get to learn, no, understand, when they can understand. My dear Ethel, don't frown so horribly, or it will spoil your eloquence, said Margaret. I don't understand either, said Richard gravely. Not understand when they can understand? What do you mean? Why, Richie, don't you see? If they don't learn them, hard, firm, by rote, when they can't, they won't understand when they can. If they don't learn when they can't, they won't understand when they can? Puzzled Richard, making Margaret laugh. But Ethel was too much in earnest for amusement. If they don't learn them by rote when they have strong memories. Yes, that's it, she continued. They will not know them well enough to understand them when they are old enough. Who won't learn and understand what? said Richard. Oh, Richie, Richie! Why the children? The Psalms, the Gospels, the things! They ought to know them, love them, grow up to them, before they know the meaning, or they won't care. Memory, association, affection, all those come when one is younger than comprehension. Younger than one's own comprehension? Richard, you are grown more tiresome than ever. Are you laughing at me? Indeed, I beg your pardon, I did not mean it, said Richard. I am very sorry to be so stupid. My dear Richie, it was only my blundering. Never mind. But what did you mean? I want to know indeed, Ethel. 
I mean that memory and association come before comprehension, so that one ought to know all good things fa with familiarity before one can understand, because understanding does not make one love. Oh, one does that before, and when the first little gleam, little bit of a sparklet of the meaning does come, then it is so valuable and so delightful. I never heard of a little bit of a sparklet before said Richard, but I think I do see what Ethel means, and it is like what I heard and liked in a university sermon some Sundays ago, saying that these lessons and holy words were to be impressed on us here from infancy on earth, that we might be always unravelling their meaning, and learn it fully at last, where we hope to be. The very same thought, exclaimed Margaret, delighted. But, after a pause, I'm afraid the ladies' committee might not enter into it in plain English, far less in Ethel's language. Now, Margaret, you know I never meant myself. I never can get the right words for what I mean. And you leave about your faux commencements, as Mr. Bellompre would call them, for us to stumble over, said Margaret. But Flora would manage, said Ethel. She has power over people and can influence them. Oh, Richie, don't persuade Papa out of letting her go. Does Mr. Wilmot wish it? asked Richard. I have not heard him say, but he was very much vexed about the prayers, said Ethel. Will he stay here for the holidays? No, his father has not been well, and he has gone to take his duty. He walked with us to Coxmoor before he went, and we did so wish for you. How have you been getting on? Pretty well on the whole, said Ethel. But, oh dear, oh dear, Richard, the McCarthys are gone. Gone? Where? Oh, to Wales. I knew nothing of it till they were off. Una and Fergus were missing, and Jane Taylor told me they were all gone. Oh, it is so horrid. Una had really come to be so good and so much in earnest. She behaved so well at school and church that even Mrs. Ledwich liked her and she used to read her testament half the day and bring her Sunday school lessons to ask me about. Oh, I was so fond of her, and it really seemed to have done some good with her, and now it is all lost. Oh, I wish I knew what would become of my poor child. The only hope is that it may not be all lost, said Margaret. With such a woman for a mother, said Ethel, and going to some heathenish place again, if I could only have seen her first and begged her to go to church and say her prayers. If I only knew where she is gone, but I don't. I did think Una would have come to wish me goodbye. I am very sorry to lose her, said Richard. Mr. Wilmot says it is bread cast on the waters, says Margaret. He was very kind in consoling Ethel, who came home quite in despair. Yes, he said it was one of the trials, said Ethel, and that it might be better for Una as well as for me. And I am trying to care for the rest still, but I cannot yet as I did for her. There are none of the eyes that look as if they were easing up one's words before they come, and that smile of comprehension. Oh, they all are such stupid little dolts, and so indifferent. Why, Ethel! Fancy last Friday, Mary and I found only eight there. Do you remember what a broiling day Friday was? interrupted Margaret. Miss Winter and Norman both told me I ought not to let them go, and I began to think so when they came home. Mary was the colour of a peony. Oh, it would not have signified if the children had been good for anything, but all their mothers were out at work, and of those that did come, hardly one had learned their lessons. Willie Blake had lost his spelling card. Anne Harris kicked Susan Pope and would not say she was sorry. Mary Hale would not know M from N, do all our Mary would, and Jane Taylor, after all the pains I have taken with her, when I asked how the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, seemed never to have heard of them. Margaret could have said that Ethel had come in positively crying with vexation, but with no diminution of the spirit of perseverance. I am so glad you are come, Richard, she continued. You will put a little new life into them. They all looked so pleased when we told them Mr. Richard was coming. I hope we shall get on, said Richard. I want you to judge whether the popes are civilised enough to be dressed for Sunday school. Oh, and the money! Here is the account book. 
How neatly you have kept it, Ethel. Ah, it was for you, you know. Receipts. See, aren't you surprised? Four pounds, eighteen and eightpence. That is a great deal. The three guineas were Mr. River's fees, you know. Then Margaret gave us half a sovereign and Mary a shilling. And there was one that we picked up tumbling about the house. And Papa said we might have. And the two pence were little Blanche's savings. Oh, Richie! As a bright coin appeared on the book. That is all I could save this term, he said. Oh, it is famous! Now I do think I may put another whole sovereign away into the purse for the church. See, here is what we have paid. Shoes, those did bring our money very low. And then I bought a piece of print which cost sixteen shillings, but it will make plenty of frocks. So, you see, the balance is actually two pounds nine. That is something. The nine shillings will go on till we get another fee. For I have two frocks ready made for the popes, so the two pounds are a real nest egg towards the church. The church, repeated Richard, half smiling. I looked in the paper the other day and saw that a chapel had been built for nine hundred pounds, said Ethel. And you have two. Two and eight months, Richie, and more will come as we get older. I have a scheme in my head, but I won't tell you now. Nine hundred. And a church has to be endowed as well as built, you know, Ethel. Oh, never mind that now. If we can begin and build, some good person will come and help. I'll run and fetch it, Richie. I drew out a sketch of what I wanted to be. What a girl that is, said Richard, as Ethel dashed away. Is not she? said Margaret, and she means all so heartily. Do you know she has spent nothing on her own pleasures? Not a book, not a thing has she bought this year except a present for Blanche's birthday, and some silk to net a purse for Harry. I cannot help being sometimes persuaded that she will succeed, said Richard. Faith, energy, self-denial, perseverance, they go a great way, said Margaret. And yet when we look at poor dear Ethel and her queer ungainly ways, and think of her building a church, neither Richard nor Margaret could help laughing, but they checked it at once, and the former said, that brave spirit is a reproof to us all. Yes, said Margaret, and so is the resolution to mend her little faults. Ethel came back, having, of course, mislaid her sketch, and much vexed, wished to know if it ought to cause her first forfeit. But Margaret thought these should not begin till the date of the agreement, and the three resumed the Coxmoor discussion. It lasted till the return of the walking party, so late that they had been stargazing, and came in, in full dispute as to which was Cygnus and which Aquila, while Blanche was talking very grandly of Taurus Poniatowski, and Harry begging to be told which constellations he should still see in the southern hemisphere. Dr. May was the first to rectify the globe for the southern latitudes, and fingers were affectionately laid on Orion's studded belt, as though he were a friend who would accompany the sailor boy. Voices grew loud and eager in enumerating the stars common to both, and so came bedtime, and the globe stood on the table in danger of being forgotten. Ethel diligently lifted it up, and while Norman exclaimed at her tidiness, Margaret told how a new leaf was to be turned, and of her voluntary forfeits. A very good plan, cried the doctor. We can't do better than follow her example. What, you, Papa? Oh, what fun, exclaimed Harry. So you think I shall be ruined, Mr. Monkey? How do you know I shall not be the most orderly of all? A penny for everything left about, confiscated for the benefit of Coxmoor, eh? And two pence for pocket handkerchiefs, if you please, said Norman, with a gesture of disgust. Very well. From Blanche upwards, Margaret shall have a book and set down marks against us. Hold an audit every Saturday night. What say you, Blanche? Oh, I hope Flora will leave something about cried Blanche, dancing with glee. End of Part 1, Chapter 24 Recording by Gail Goslin Part 1, Chapter 25 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gail Goslin. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. Part 1, Chapter 25. 
Oh, no, we never mention her. We never breathe her name. Song A great deal of merriment had come home with Harry, who never was grey for ten minutes without a strong reaction, and distracted the house with his noise and his antics in proportion, as it sometimes seemed, to the spaces of serious thought and reading spent in the study, where Dr. May did his best to supply Mr. Ramsden's insufficient attention to his confirmation candidates by giving an hour every day to Norman, Ethel and Harry. He could not lecture, but he read with them, and his own earnestness was very impressive. The two eldest felt deeply, but Harry often kept it in doubt, whether he were not as yet too young and wild for permanent impressions, so rapid were his transitions and so overpowering his high spirits. Not that these were objected to, but there was a feeling that there might as well be moderation in all things, and that it would have been satisfactory if, under present circumstances, he had been somewhat more subdued and diligent. "'There are your decimals not done yet, Harry.' For Harry, being somewhat deficient in arithmetic, had been recommended to work in that line during his visit at home, an operation usually deferred, as at present, to the evening. "'I'm going to do my sums now, Flora,' said Harry, somewhat annoyed. He really fetched his arithmetic, and his voice was soon heard asking how he was ever to put an end to a sum that would turn to nothing but everlasting threes. "'What have you been doing, young ladies?' asked Dr. May. "'Did you call on Miss Walkingham?' "'Flora and Blanche did,' said Ethel. "'I thought you did not want me to go, and I had not time. "'Besides, a London grand young lady—' "'Oh!' and Ethel shook her head in disgust. "'That is not the way you treat Meta Rivers.' "'Oh, Meta's different. She has never been out.' "'I should have been glad for you to have seen Miss Walkingham,' said her father. "'Pretty manners are improving.' Besides, old Lady Walkingham begged me to send my daughters. I should not have seen her, said Ethel, for she was not well enough to let us in. Was it not pushing? said Flora. There were the Andersons leaving their card. Those Andersons, exclaimed the doctor. I am sick of the very sound of the name. As sure as my name is Dick May, I'll include it in Margaret's book of fines. Flora looked dignified. They are always harping on that little trumpery girl's nonsense, said Harry. Ought, ought, eight, that is eight thousandths, hey Norman, if it was about those two fellows, the boys. You would harp only on what affects you, said the doctor. No, I don't, men never do. That is one hundred and twenty-fifth. One man does it to an hundred and twenty-five women, said Dr. May. It is rather a female defect, indeed said Margaret. Defect? said Flora. Yes, said Dr. May. Since it is not only irksome to the hearers, but leads to the breaking of the ninth commandment. Many voices declared in forms of varying severity that it was impossible to speak worse of the Andersons than they deserved. Andersons again, cried Dr. May. One, two, three, four, five, six forfeits. Papa himself, for he said the name. Saucily put in Blanche. I think I should like the rule to be made in earnest, said Ethel. What? In order to catch Flora's pence for Coxmoor? suggested Harry. No, but because it is malice. I mean, that is, if there is dislike or a grudge in our hearts at them, talking for ever of nasty little miserable irritations makes it worse. Then why do you do it? asked Flora. I heard you only on Sunday declaiming about Fanny Anderson. Ha! cried out all at once. There goes Flora. She looked intensely serious and innocent. I know, said Ethel. It is the very reason I want the rule to be made, just to stop us, for I am sure we must often say more than is right. Especially when we come to the pass of declaring that the ninth commandment cannot be broken in regard to them, observed the doctor. Most likely they are saying much the same of us said Richard. Or worse, rejoined Dr. May, the injured never hates as much as the injurer. Now papa has said the severest thing of all, whispered Ethel. Proving the inexpedience of personalities, said Dr. May, and in good time entering the evening post. Why, how now, Mr. May, are you gone mad? Hello, why, ho, ha, hurrah! 
and up went Harry's book of decimals to the ceiling, coming down upon a candle which would have been overturned on Ethel's work if it had not been dexterously caught by Richard. Harry! indignantly cried Ethel and Flora. See what you've done! And the doctor's voice called to order, but Harry could not heed. Here, here, he has a fortune, an estate! Who? Tell us, don't be so absurd! Who? Who? Mr. Ernscliff. Here is a letter from Hector. Only listen. Did you know we had an old faraway English cousin, one Mr. Halliday? I hardly did, though Alan was named after him, and he belonged to my mother. He was a cross old fellow and took no notice of us, but within the last year or two, his nephew or son or something died, and now he is just dead, and the lawyer wrote to tell Alan he is heir at law. Mr. Ernscliff of Maplewood! Does it not sound well? It is a beautiful, great place in Shropshire, and Alan and I mean to run off to see it as soon as he can have any time on shore. Ethel could not help looking at Margaret, but was ashamed of her impertinence, and coloured violently, whereas her sister did not colour at all, and Norman, looking down, wondered whether Alan would make the voyage. Oh, of course he will, he must, said Harry. He would never give up now. Norman further wondered whether Hector would remain on the Stoneborough Foundation, and Mary hoped they should not lose him, but there was no great readiness to talk over the event, and there soon was a silence broken by Flora, saying, He is no such nobody, as Louisa Anderson said when we... Another shout, which caused Flora to take refuge in playing waltzes for the rest of the evening. Moreover, to the extreme satisfaction of Mary, she left her crochet needle on the floor at night. While a tumultuous party were pursuing her with it to claim the penny, and Richard was conveying Margaret upstairs, Ethel found an opportunity of asking her father if he were not very glad of Mr. Ernscliffe's good fortune. Yes, very. He's a good fellow, and will make a good use of it. And now, Papa, does it not make... You won't say now you are sorry he came here. She had no answer but a sigh, and a look that made her blush for having ventured so far. She was so much persuaded that great events must ensue, that all the next day she listened to every ring of the bell, and when one at last was followed by a light, though to her ears manly sounding dread, she looked up flushing with expectation. Behold, she was disappointed. Miss Walkingham was announced and she rose surprised, for the lady in question had only come to Stoneborough for a couple of days with an infirm mother, who, having known Dr. May in old times, had made it her especial request that he would let her see his daughters. She was to proceed on her journey today, and the return of the visit had been by no means expected. Flora went forward to receive her, wondering to see her so young-looking and so unformed. She held out her hand, with a red wrist and as far as could be seen under her veil, coloured when presented to the recumbent Margaret. How she got into her chair they hardly knew, for Flora was at that moment extremely annoyed by hearing an ill-bred peal of Mary's laughter in the garden, close to the window, but she thought it best to appear unconscious, since she had no power to stop it. Margaret thought the stranger embarrassed, and kindly inquired for Lady Walkingham. Much the same, thank you mumbled a voice down in the throat. A silence, until Margaret tried another question. Equally, briefly answered, and after a short interval, the young lady contrived to make her exit, with the same amount of gauchery as had marked her entrance. Expressions of surprise at once began, and were so loud that when Harry entered the room, his inquiry was, "'What's the row?' "'Miss Walkingham,' said Ethel, "'but you won't understand.' She seemed half wild, worse than me. How did you like the pretty improving manners? asked Harry. Manners? She had none, said Flora. She, highly connected, used to the best society. How do you know what the best society do? asked Harry. The poor thing seemed very shy, said Margaret. I don't know about shyness, said Flora. She was stifling a laugh all the time like a rude schoolboy, and I thought Papa said she was pretty. Aye, did you think her so? asked Harry, 
a great broad red face. And so awkward, cried Flora indignantly. If one could have seen her face, I think she might have been nice looking, said Margaret. She had pretty golden curls and merry blue eyes, rather like Harry's. Humph, said Flora. Beauty and manners seem to me much on a par. This is one of Papa's swans indeed. I can't believe it was Miss Walkingham at all, said Ethel. It must have been some boy in disguise. Dear me, cried Margaret, starting with a painful timidity of helplessness. Do look whether anything is gone. Where's the silver inkstand? You don't think she could put that into her pocket, said Ethel, laughing as she held it up. I don't know. Do, Harry, see if the umbrellas are safe in the hall. I wish you would, for now I come to remember. The Walkinghams went at nine this morning. Miss Winter said that she saw the old lady helped into the carriage as she passed. Margaret's eyes looked quite large and terrified. She must have been a spy. The whole gang will come at night. I wish Richard was here. Harry, it really is no laughing matter. You had better give notice to the police. The more Margaret was alarmed, the more Harry laughed. Never mind, Margaret. I'll take care of you. Here's my dirk. I'll stick all the rubbers. Harry! Harry! Oh, don't! cried Margaret, raising herself up in an agony of nervous terror. Oh, where is Papa? Will nobody ring the bell and send George for the police? 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 Thieves! Murder! Robbers! Fire! All hands ahoy! shouted Harry, his hands making a trumpet over his mouth. Harry, how can you? said Ethel hastily. Don't you see that Margaret is terribly frightened? Can't you say at once that it was you? You? And Margaret sank back, as there was a general outcry of laughter and wonder. Did you know it, Ethel? asked Flora severely. I only guessed at this moment, said Ethel. How well you did it, Harry. Well, said Flora, I did think her dress very like Margaret's shot silk. I hope you did not do that any harm. But how did you manage? said Ethel. Where did your bonnet come from? It was a new one of Adam's wife. Mary got it for me. Come in, Polly. They have found it out. Did you not hear her splitting with laughing outside the window? I would not let her come in for fear she should spoil all. And I was just going to give her such a scolding for giggling in the garden, said Flora, and to say we had been as bad as Miss Walkingham. You should not have been so awkward, Harry. You nearly betrayed yourself. He had nobody to teach him but Mary, said Ethel. Ah, oh, you should have seen me at my ease in Minster Street. No one suspected me there. In Minster Street? Oh, Harry, you don't really mean it. I do. That was what I did it for. I was resolved to know what the nameless one said of the Mrs. May. Hasty and eager inquiries broke out from Flora and Ethel. Oh, Dr. May was very clever, certainly very clever. Had I seen the daughters? I said I was going to call there, and they said... What? Oh, what, Harry? They said Flora was thought pretty, but... And as to Ethel, now, how do you think you came off? Unready? Tell me. They could not say the same of me, at any rate. Quite the reverse. They called Ethel very odd, poor girl. I don't mind, said Ethel. They may say what they please of me. Besides that, I believe it is all Harry's own invention. Nay, that is a libel on my invention exclaimed Harry. If I had drawn on that, could I not have told you something much droller? And was that really all? said Flora. They said, let me see, that all our noses were too long, and that that as to Flora's being a beauty, when their brothers called her, so droll of them, but Harvey called her a stuck-up duchess. In fact, it was the fashion to make a great deal of those maize. I hope they said something of the sailor brother, said Ethel. No, I found if I stayed to hear much more, I should be knocking Ned down, so I thought it time to take leave before he suspected. All this had passed very quickly, with much laughter, and numerous interjections of amusement and reprobation or delight, so excited were the young people that they did not perceive a step on the gravel, till Dr. May entered by the window and stood among them. His first exclamation was of consternation, "'Margaret, my dear child, 
what is the matter? Only then did her brother and sisters perceive that Margaret was lying back on her cushions, very pale and panting for breath. She tried to smile and say, it was nothing, and she was silly, but the words were faint from the palpitation of her heart. It was Harry's trick, said Flora indignantly, as she flew for the scent bottle, while her father bent over Margaret. Harry dressed himself up and she was frightened. Oh no, no, he did not mean it gasped Margaret. Don't! Harry, I did not think you could be so cowardly and unfeeling. And Dr. May's look was even more reproachful than his words. Harry was dismayed at his sister's condition, but the injustice of the wholesale reproach chased away contrition. I did nothing to frighten anyone, he said moodily. Now, Harry, you know how you kept on, said Flora, and when you saw she was frightened... I can have no more of this, said Dr. May, seeing that the discussion was injuring Margaret more and more. Go away to my study, sir, and wait till I come to you. All of you, out of the room. Flora, fetch the sal volatile. Let me tell you, whispered Margaret, don't be angry with Harry. It was... Not now, not now, my dear. Lie quite still. She obeyed, took the sal volatile and shut her eyes, while he sat leaning anxiously over, watching her, Presently she opened them, and looking up, said rather faintly and trying to smile, I don't think I can be better till you have heard the rights of it. He did not mean it. Boys never do mean it, was the doctor's answer. I hoped better things of Harry. He had no intention, began Margaret, but she still was unfit to talk, and her father silenced her by promising to go and hear the boy's own account. In the hall... He was instantly beset by Ethel and Mary, the former exclaiming, Papa, you're quite mistaken. It was very foolish of Margaret to be so frightened. He did nothing at all to frighten anyone. Ethel's mode of pleading was unfortunate. The very foolish of Margaret were the very words to displease. Do not interfere, said her father sternly. You only encourage him in his wanton mischief, and no one takes any heed how he torments my poor Margaret. Papa, cried Harry, passionately bursting open the study door. Tormenting Margaret was the last thing I would do. That is not the way to speak, Harry. What have you been doing? With rapid agitated utterance, Harry made his confession. At another time, the doctor would have treated the matter as a joke carried too far, but which, while it called for censure, was very amusing. But now the explanation that the disguise had been assumed to impose on the Andersons only added to his displeasure. You seem to think you have a license to play off any impertinent freaks you please without consideration for anyone, he said. But I tell you it is not so. As long as you are under my roof, you shall feel my authority and you shall spend the rest of the day in your room. I hope quietness there will bring you to a better mind, but I am disappointed in you. A boy who can choose such a time and such subjects for insolent, unfeeling, practical jokes cannot be in a fit state for confirmation. Oh, Papa, Papa, cried the two girls in tones of entreaty. While Harry, with a burning face and hasty step, dashed upstairs without a word. You have been as bad, said Dr. May. I say nothing to you, Mary. You knew no better. But to see you, Ethel, first encouraging him in his impertinence and terrifying Margaret so that I dare say she may be a week getting over it and now defending him and calling her silly is unbearable. I cannot trust one of you. Only listen, Papa. I will have no altercation. I must go back to Margaret, since no one else has the slightest consideration for her. An hour had passed away when Richard knocked at Ethel's door to tell her that tea was ready. I have a great mind not to go down, said Ethel, as he looked in and saw her seated with a book. What do you mean? I cannot bear to go down while poor Harry is so unjustly used. Hush, Ethel. I cannot hush. Just because Margaret fancies robbers and murderers and all sorts of nonsense, as she always did, is poor Harry to be accused of wantonly terrifying her and shut up and cut off from... And just when he is going away, too... It is unkind and unjust and... Ethel, you will be sorry. Papa will be sorry, continued Ethel, disregarding the caution. 
It is very unfair, that I will say so. It was all nonsense of Margaret's, but he will always make everything give way to her, and poor Harry just going to see. No, Richie, I cannot come down. I cannot behave as usual. You will grieve Margaret much more, said Richard. I can't help that. She should not have made such a fuss. Richard was somewhat in difficulties how to answer, but at that moment Harry's door, which was next, was slightly opened, and his voice said, Go down, Ethel. The captain may punish any one he pleases, and it is mutiny in the rest of the crew to take his part. Harry is in the right, said Richard. It is our duty not to question our father's judgments. It would be wrong of you to stay up. Wrong? said Ethel. Of course, it would be against the articles of war, said Harry, opening his door another inch. But Richie, I say, do tell me whether it has hurt Margaret. She is better now, said Richard, but she has a headache, chiefly, I believe, from distress at having brought this on you. She is very sorry for her fright. I had not the least intention of frightening the most fearsome little tender mouse on earth, said Harry. No, indeed, said Ethel. And at another time it would not have signified, said Richard. But you know, Margaret always was timid, and now the not being able to move and the being out of health has made her nerves weak, so that she cannot help it. The fault was in our never heeding her when we were so eager to hear Harry's story, said Ethel. That was what made the palpitation so bad. But now Papa knows all, does he not understand about Harry? He was obliged to go out as soon as Margaret was better, said Richard, and was scarcely come in when I came up. Go down, Ethel, repeated Harry. Never mind me. Norman told me that sort of joke never answered, and I might have minded him. The voice was very much troubled, and it brought back that burning sensation of indignant tears to Ethel's eyes. Oh, Harry, you did not deserve to be so punished for it. That is what you are not to say, returned Harry. I ought not to have played the trick, and, and just now too, but I always forget things. The door shut, and they fancied they heard sobs. Ethel groaned, but made no opposition to follow her brother down to tea. Margaret lay, wan and exhausted, on the sofa. The doctor looked very melancholy and rather stern, and the others were silent. Ethel had begun to hope for the warm reaction she had so often known after a hasty fit, but it did not readily come. Harry was boy instead of girl. The fault and its consequence had been more serious, and the anxiety for the future was greater. Besides, he had not fully heard the story. Harry, in his incoherent narration, had not excused himself, and Margaret's panic had appeared more as if inspired by him than, as it was, in fact, the work of her fancy. Thus the evening passed gloomily away and it was not till the others had said good-night that Dr. May began to talk over the affairs with his eldest son, who then was able to lay before him the facts of the case as gathered from his sisters. He listened with a manner as though it were a reproof, and then said sadly, "'I'm afraid I was in a passion.' "'It was very wrong in Harry,' said Richard, "'and particularly unlucky it should happen with the Andersons.' "'Very thoughtless,' said the doctor. "'No more, even as regarded Margaret,' but thoughtlessness should not have been treated as a crime. "'I wish we could see him otherwise,' said Richard. "'He wants—' And there Dr. May stopped short, and, taking up his candle, slowly mounted the stairs, and looked into Harry's room. The boy was in bed, but started up on hearing his father's step, and exclaimed, "'Papa, I am very sorry. Is Margaret better?' "'Yes, she is. And I understand now, Harry, that her alarm was an accident.' I beg your pardon for thinking for a moment that it was otherwise. No, interrupted Harry, of course I could never mean to frighten her, but I did not leave off the moment I saw she was afraid, because it was so very ridiculous, and I did not guess it would hurt her. I see, my honest boy, I do not blame you, for you did not know how much harm a little terror does to a person in her helpless state. But indeed, Harry... Though you did not deserve such anger as mine was, it is a serious thing that you should be so much set on fun and frolic as to forget all considerations, especially at such a time as this. It takes away from much of my comfort in sending you into the world, and for higher things. How can I believe you really impressed and reverent if the next minute... I'm not fit! I'm not fit! 
sobbed Harry, hiding his face. Indeed, I hardly know whether it is not so, said the doctor. You are under the usual age, and though I know you wish to be a good boy, yet I don't feel sure that these wild spirits do not carry away everything serious, and whether it is right to bring one so thoughtless to— No, no, and Harry cried bitterly, and his father was deeply grieved, but no more could then be said, and they parted for the night. Dr. May saying as he went away, you understand that it is not as punishment for your trick if I do not take you to Mr. Ramsden for a ticket, but that I cannot be certain whether it is right to bring you to such solemn privileges, while you do not seem to me to retain steadily any grave or deep feelings. Perhaps your mother would have better helped you. And Dr. May went away to mourn over what he viewed as far greater sins than those of his sons. Anger had, indeed, given place to sorrow, and all were grave the next morning, as if each had something to be forgiven. Margaret especially felt guilty of the fears which perhaps had not been sufficiently combated in her days of health, and now were beyond control and had occasioned so much pain. Ethel grieved over the words she had yesterday spoken in haste of her father and sister. Mary knew herself to have been an accomplice in the joke, and Norman blamed himself for not having taken the trouble to perceive that Harry had not been talking rodomontade when he had communicated his capital scheme the previous morning. The decision as to the confirmation was a great grief to all. Flora consoled herself by observing that, as he was so young, no one need know it, nor miss him, and Ethel, with a trembling, almost sobbing voice, enumerated all Harry's excellences, his perfect truth, his kindness, his generosity, his flashes of intense feeling, declared that nobody might be confirmed if he were not, and begged and entreated that Mr. Wilmot might be written to, and consulted. She would almost have done so herself if Richard had not shown her it would be undutiful. Harry himself was really subdued. He made no question as to the propriety of the decision, but rather felt his own unworthiness, and was completely humbled and downcast. When a note came from Mrs. Anderson saying that she was convinced that it could not have been Dr. May's wish that she should be exposed to the indignity of a practical joke, and that a young lady of the highest family should have been insulted. No one has spirits to laugh at the terms. And when Dr. May said, What is to be done? Harry turned crimson, and was evidently trying to utter something. I see nothing for it but for him to ask their pardon, said Dr. May, and a sound was heard, not very articulate, but expressing full assent. "'That's right,' said the doctor. "'I'll come with you.' "'Oh, thank you,' cried Harry, looking up. They set off at once. Mrs. Anderson was neither an unpleasing nor unkind person, her chief defect being a blind admiration of her sons and daughters, which gave her, in speaking of them, a tone of pretension that she would never have shown on her own account. Her displeasure was pacified in a moment by the sight of the confused contrition of the culprit, coupled with his father's frank and kindly tone of avowal that it had been a foolish and proper frolic, and that he had been much displeased with him for it. "'Say no more! Pray, say no more, Dr. May! We all know how to overlook a sailor's frolic, and, I am sure, Master Harry's present behaviour. But you'll take a bit of luncheon!' And as something was said of going home to the early dinner— I am sure you will wait one minute. Master Harry must have a piece of my cake and allow me to drink to his success. Poor Mr. May. To be called Master Harry and treated to sweet cake. But he saw his father thought he ought to endure and he even said thank you. The cake stuck in his throat, however, when Mrs. Anderson and her daughters opened their full course of praise on their dear Harvey and dearest Edward telling all the flattering things Dr. Hoxton had said of the order in which Harvey had brought the school, and insisting on Dr. May's reading the copy of the testimonial that he had carried to Oxford. "'I knew you would be kind enough to rejoice,' said Mrs. Anderson. "'And that you would have no, no feeling about Mr. Norman, for of course at his age a little matter is nothing, and it must be better for the dear boy himself to be a little while under a friend like Harvey than to have authority while so young.' I believe it has done him no harm, was all that the doctor could bring himself to say, and thinking that he and his son had endured quite enough, 
he took his leave as soon as Harry had convulsively bolted the last mouthful. Not a word was spoken all the way home. Harry's own trouble had overpowered even this subject of resentment. On Sunday, the notice of the confirmation was read. It was to take place on the following Thursday, and all those who had already given in their names were to come to Mr Ramsden to apply for their tickets. While this was read, large teardrops were silently falling on poor Harry's book. Ethel and Norman walked together in the twilight, in deep lamentation over their brother's deprivation, which seemed especially to humble them. For, said Norman, I am sure no one can be more resolved on doing right than July, and he has got through school better than I did. Yes, said Ethel, if we don't get into his sort of scrape. It is only that we are older, not better. I am sure mine are worse, my letting Aubrey be nearly burned, my neglects. Papa must be doing right, said Norman, but for July to be turned back when we are taken makes me think of man judging only by outward appearance. A few outrageous-looking acts of giddiness that are so much grieved over may not be half so bad as the hundreds of wandering thoughts that one forgets, because no one else can see them, said Ethel. Meanwhile, Harry and Mary were sitting twisted together into a sort of bundle, on the same footstool, by Margaret's sofa. Harry had begged of her to hear him say the catechism once more, and Mary had joined with him in repetition. There was to be only one more Sunday at home. And that, he said, and sighed. Margaret knew what he meant, for the feast was to be spread for those newly admitted to share it. She only said a caressing word of affection. I wonder when I shall have another chance, said Harry, if we should get to Australia or New Zealand. But then perhaps there would be no confirmation going on and I might be worse by that time. Oh, you must not let that be. Why, you see, if I can't be good here with all this going on, what shall I do amongst those fellows, away from all? You will have one friend. Mr. Ernscliff, you are always thinking of him, Margaret, but perhaps he may not go, and if he should, a lieutenant cannot do much for a midshipman. No, I thought, when I was reading with my father, that somehow it might help me to do what it called putting away childish things. Don't you know? I might be able to be stronger and steadier somehow. And then if, if, you know, if I did tumble overboard, or anything of that sort, there is that about the, what they will go to next Sunday, being necessary to salvation. Harry laid down his head and cried. Margaret could not speak for tears, and Mary was incoherently protesting against any notion of his falling overboard. It is generally necessary, Harry, Margaret said at last, not in impossible cases. Yes, if it had been impossible, but it was not. If I had not been a mad goose all this time, but when a bit of fun gets hold of me, I can't think. And if I am too bad for that, I am too bad for, for, and I shall never see Mama again. Margaret, it almost makes me af afraid to sail. Harry, don't, don't talk so, sobbed Mary. Oh, do come to Papa, and let us beg and pray. Take hold of my hand, and Margaret will beg too, and when he sees how sorry you are, I am sure he will forgive, and let you be confirmed. She would have dragged him after her. No, Mary, said Harry, resisting her. It is not that he does not forgive. You don't understand. It is what is right, and he cannot help it or make it right for me, if I am such a horrid wretch that I can't keep grave thoughts in my head. I might do it again after that, just the same. You have been grave enough of late, said Mary. This was enough to make me so, said Harry. But even at church, since I came home, I have behaved ill. I kicked Tom to make him look at old Levitt asleep, and then I went on, because he did not like it. I know I am too idle. On the Tuesday, Dr. May had said he would take Norman and Ethelred to Mr. Ramsden. Ethel was gravely putting on her walking dress when she heard her father's voice calling Harry, and she started with a joyful hope. There, indeed, when she came downstairs, stood Harry, his cap in his hand and his face serious, but with a look on it that had as much subdued joy as awe. "'Dear, dear, Harry, you are going with us, then?' "'Yes, Papa wrote to ask what Mr. Wilmot thought, and he said—' Harry broke off as his father advanced— and gave her the letter itself to read. 
Mr. Wilmot answered that he certainly should not refuse such a boy as Harry, on the proof of such entire penitence and deep feeling. Whether to bring him to the further privilege might be another question, but as far as the confirmation was concerned, the opinion was decided. Norman and Ethel were too happy for words, as they went arm in arm along the street, leaving their dear sailor to be leaned on by his father. Harry's sadness was gone, but he still was guarded and gentle during the few days that followed. He seemed to have learned thought, and in his gratitude for the privileges he had so nearly missed, to rate them more highly than he might otherwise have done. Indeed, the doubt for the Sunday gave him a sense of probation. The confirmation day came. Mr. Rivers had asked that his daughter might be with Miss May, and Ethel had therefore to be called for in the Abbotstoke carriage, quite contrary to her wishes, as she had set her heart on the walk to church with her father and brothers. Flora would not come, for fear of crowding Mr. Rivers, who, with Mrs. Larpent, accompanied his darling. "'Oh, Margaret!' said Flora, after putting her sister into the carriage. "'I wish we had put Ethel into a veil. "'There is Meta, all white from head to foot, with such a veil, "'and Ethel in her little white cap. "'Looks as if she might be Lucy Taylor, only not so pretty. "'Mamma thought the best rule was to take the dress "'that needs least attention from ourselves, "'and will be least noticed,' said Margaret. "'There is Fanny Anderson gone by in the fly with a white veil on,' cried Mary, dashing in. "'Then I am glad Ethel has not one,' said Flora. Margaret looked annoyed, but she had not found the means of checking Flora without giving offence, and she could only call Mary and Blanche to order, beg them to think of what the others were doing, and offer to read to them a little tale on confirmation. Flora sat and worked, and Margaret, stealing a glance at her, understood that, in her quiet way, she resented the implied reproof. "'Making the children think me worldly and frivolous?' she thought, as if Margaret did not know that I think and feel as much as any reasonable person. The party came home in due time, and after one kiss to Margaret, given in silence, dispersed, for they could not yet talk of what had passed. Only Ethel, as she met Richard on the stairs, said, "'Richie, do you know what the bishop's text was? "'No man having put his hand to the plough and looking back "'is fit for the kingdom of God.' Yes, said Richard interrogatively. I thought it might be a voice to me, said Ethel. Besides what it says to all about a Christian course, it seems to tell me not to be out of heart about all those vexations at Coxmoor. Is it not a sort of putting our hand to the plough? Dr. May gave his own history of the confirmation to Margaret. It was a beautiful thing to watch, he said. The faces of our own set, those four were really like a poem. There was little Mita in her snowy whiteness, looking like innocence itself, hardly knowing of evil or pain or struggle, as that soft, earnest voice made her vow to be ready for it all, almost as unscathed and unconscious of trial as when they made it for her at her baptism. Pretty little thing, may she long be as happy. And for our own Ethel, she looked as if she was promising on and on, straight into eternity. I heard her, I do, dear child, and it was in such a tone as if she meant to be ever doing. And for the boys? There was Norman, grave and steadfast, as if he knew what he was about, and was manfully and calmly ready. He might have been a young knight watching his armour. And so he is, said Margaret softly. And poor Harry? The doctor could hardly command voice to tell her. Poor Harry, he was last of all. He turned his back and looked into the corner of the seat till all the voices had spoken, and then turned about in haste, and the two words came on the end of a sob. "'You will not keep him away on Sunday?' said Margaret. "'Far be it from me! I know not who should come, if he should not.'" End of Part 1, Chapter 25 Recording by Gail Goslin. Part 1, Chapter 26 of The Daisy Chain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. What matter whether through delight 
or led through a veil of tears, or seen at once, or hid from sight, the glorious way appears, if step by step the path we see, that leads, my Savior, up to thee. I could not help it, said Dr. May, that little witch. Meta Rivers? Oh, what, Papa? It seems that Wednesday is her birthday, and nothing will serve her but to eat her dinner in the old Roman camp. And are we to go? Oh, which of us? Every one of anything like rational ears. Blanche is especially invited. There were transports till it was recollected that on Thursday morning school would recommence, and that on Friday Harry must join his ship. However, the Roman camp had long been an object of their desires, and Margaret was glad that the last day should have a brilliancy, so she would not hear of any one remaining to keep her company, talked of the profit she should gain by a leisure day, and took ardent interest in everyone's preparations and expectations, in Ethel's researches into county histories and classical dictionaries, Flora's sketching intentions, Norman's promises of Campanula Glamorata, and a secret whispered into her ear by Mary and Harry. Made as weather, as they said, when the August sun rose fresh and joyous, and great was the unnecessary bustle and happy confusion from six o'clock till eleven, when Dr. May, who was going to visit patients some way further on the same road, carried off Harry and Mary to set them down at the place. The rest were called for by Mr. Rivers's carriage and break. Mrs. Charles Wilmot and her little girl were the only additions to the party, and Maida, putting Blanche into the carriage to keep company with her contemporary, went herself in the break. What a brilliant little fairy she was, in her pink summer robes, fluttering like a butterfly, and with the same apparent felicity in basking in joy, all gaiety, glee, and light-heartedness in making others happy. On they went, through honeysuckled lanes, catching glimpses of sunny fields of corn falling before the reaper, and happy knots of harvest folks dining beneath the shelter of their sheaves, with the sturdy old green umbrella sheltering them from the sun. Snatches of song, peals of laughter, merry nonsense, passed from one to the other. Norman, roused into blitheness, found wit, the young ladies found laughter, and Richard's eyes and mouth looked very pretty as they smiled their quiet diversion. At last, his face drawn all into one silent laugh, he directed the eyes of the rest to a high green mound, rising immediately before them, where stood two little figures, one with a spyglass, intently gazing the opposite way. At the same time came the halt, and Norman, bounding out, sprang lightly and nimbly up the side of the mound, and, while the spyglass was yet pointed full at Wales, had hold of a pair of stout legs, and with the words, Keep a good look out, had tumbled Mr. May head foremost down the grassy slope, with Mary rolling after. Harry's first outcry was for his precious glass. His second was, not at his fall, but that they should have come from the east, when, by the compass, Stoneboro was north-northwest, and then the boys took to tumbling over one another, while Maida frolicked joyously, with nippin' after her, up and down the mounds, chased by Mary and Blanche, who were wild with glee. By and by she joined Ethel, and Norman was summoned to help them to trace out the old lines of encampment, ditch, rampart, and gates. Happy work on those slopes of fresh turf, embroidered with every minute blossom of the moor, thyme, bird's foot, eye-bright, and dwarf purple thistle, buzzed and hummed over by busy, black-tailed, yellow-banded dumbledores, the breezy wind blowing softly in their faces, and the expanse of country, wooded hill, verdant pasture, amber harvest field, winding river, smoke canopied town, and brown moor, melting grayly away to the mountain heads. Now in sun, now in shade, the bright young antiquaries surveyed the old banks, and talked wisely of Valum and Fossa, of Legion and Cohort, of Agricola and Suetonius, and discussed the delightful probability that this might have been raised in the war with Caractacus, whence, argued Ethel, since Caractacus was certainly Arviragus, it must have been the very spot where Imogen met Posthumus again. Was not yonder the very high road to Milford Haven, 
and thus must not Fairfidel's grassy tomb be in the immediate neighborhood? Then followed the suggestion that the mound in the middle was a good deal like an ancient tomb, where, as Blanche interposed with some of the lore lately caught from Ethel's studies, they used to bury their tears in wheelbarrows, while Norman observed it was the more probable, as Fairfidel never was buried at all. The idea of a search enchanted the young ladies. It was the right sort of vehicle, evidently, said Norman, looking at Harry, who had been particularly earnest in recommending that it should be explored, and made it declare that if they could but find the least trace, her papa would be delighted to go regularly to work and reveal all the treasures. Richard seemed a little afraid of the responsibility of treasure trove, but he was overruled by a chorus of eager voices and dispossessed of the trowel which he had brought to dig up some down gentians for the garden. While Norman set to work as pioneer, some skipped about in wild ecstasy, and Ethel knelt down to peer into the hole. Very soon there was a discovery, an eager outcry, some pottery, Roman vessels, a red thing that might have been a lamp, another that might have been a lacrimatory. Well, said Ethel, you know, Norman, I always told you that the children's pots and pans in the clay ditch were very like Roman pottery. Posthumus's patty pan, said Norman, holding it up. No doubt this was the bottle filled with the old queen's tears when Cloten was killed. You see it is very small, added Harry. She could not squeeze out many. Come now, I do believe you are laughing at it, said Maida, taking the derided vessels into her hands. Now, they really are genuine and very curious things, are not they, Flora? Flora and Ethel admired and speculated till there was a fresh and still more exciting discovery. A coin, actually a medal, with the head of an emperor upon it. Not a doubt of his high nose being Roman. Maida was certain that she knew one exactly like him among her father's gems. Ethel was resolved that he should be Claudius, and began deciphering the defaced inscription T-H-V-R-V-S. She tried Claudius's whole torrent of names, and, at last, made it into a contraction of Tiberius, which highly satisfied her. Then Maida, in her turn, read D-V-X, which, as Ethel said, was all she could wish. Of course it was ducks a imperator, and Harry muttered into Norma's ear, ducks and geese, and then heaved a sigh, as he thought of the ducks no longer. V-V, continued Maida, what can that mean? Five, five, of course, said Flora. No, no, I have it. Venus Victrix, said Ethel. The ancestral Venus. Ha, huh, don't you see? There she is on the other side, crowning Claudius. Then there is an E. Something about Aeneas, suggested Norman gravely. But Ethel was sure that could not be, because there was no diphthong. And a fresh theory was just being started when Blanche's head was thrust in to know what made them all so busy. Why, Ethel, what are you doing with Harry's old medal of the Duke of Wellington? Poor Maida and Ethel, what a downfall! Maida was sure that Norman had known it the whole time, and he owned to having guessed it from Harry's importunity for the search. Harry and Mary had certainly made good use of their time, and great was the mirth over the trap so cleverly set the more when it was disclosed that Dr. May had been a full participator in the scheme, had suggested the addition of the pottery, had helped Harry to some liquid to efface part of the inscription, and had even come up with them to plant the snare in the most plausible corner for researches. Maida, enchanted with the joke, flew off to try to take in her governess and Mrs. Wilmot, whom she found completing their leisurely promenade and considering where they should spread the dinner. The sight of those great baskets of good fare was appetizing, and the company soon collected on the shady turf, where Richard made himself extremely useful, and the feast was spread without any worse mishap than Nippins running away with half a chicken, of which he was robbed, as Tom reported, by a surly-looking dog that watched in the outskirts of the camp, and caused Tom to return nearly as fast as the poor little white marauder. Maida, very immorally, as Norman told her, comforted Nippon with a large share of her sandwiches. Harry armed himself with a stick and Mary with a stone and marched off to the attack 
but saw no signs of the enemy, and had begun to believe him a figment of Tom's imagination, when Mary spied him under a bush, lying at the feet of a boy, with whom he was sharing the spoil. Harry called out rather roughly, "'Hello! What are you doing there?' The boy jumped up, the dog growled, Mary shrank behind her brother, and begged him not to be cross to the poor boy, but to come away. Harry repeated his question. "'Please, sir, Toby brought it to me.' "'What, is Toby your dog?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Are you so hungry as to eat dog's meat?' "'I have not had nothing before today, sir.' "'Why, where do you live? Hereabouts?' "'Oh, no, sir. I live with Grandmother up in Cheshire. "'But she is dead now, and Father has just come home from sea, "'and he wrote down I was to be sent to him at Portsmouth "'to go to sea with him. "'How do you live? Do you beg your way?' "'No, sir. Father sent up a pound in a letter.' Only Nanny Brooke said I owed some to her for her victuals, and I have not much of it left, and bread comes dear, so when Toby brought me this bit of meat I was glad of it, sir, but I would not have taken it. The boy was desired to wait while the brother and sister, in breathless excitement, rushed back with their story. Mrs. Wilmot was at first inclined to fear that the naval part of it had been inspired by Harry's uniform, but the examination of Jim Jennings put it beyond a doubt that he spoke nothing but the truth, and the choicest delight of the feast was the establishing him and Toby behind the barrow, and feeding him with such viands as they had probably never seen before. The boy could not read writing, but he had his father's letter in his pocket, and Mary capered at the delightful coincidence on finding that Jim Jennings was actually a quartermaster on board the Alcestis. It gave a sort of property in the boy, and she almost grudged Maida the having been first to say that she would pay for the rest of his journey, instead of doing it by subscription. However, Mary had a consolation. She would offer to take charge of Toby, who, as Harry observed, would otherwise have been drowned. He could not be taken on board. To be sure, he was a particularly ugly animal, rough, grisly, short-legged, long-backed, and with an apology for a tail, but he had a redeeming pair of eyes, and he and Jim lived on terms of such close friendship that he would have been miserable in leaving him to the mercy of Nanny Brooks. So, after their meal, Jim and Toby were bidden to wait for Dr. May's coming, and fell asleep together on the green bank, while the rest either sketched, or wandered, or botanized. Flora acted the grown-up lady with Mrs. Wilmot, and Meta found herself sitting by Ethel, asking her a great many questions about Margaret and her home and what it could be like to be one of such a numerous family. Flora had always turned aside from personal matters as uninteresting to her companion, and, in spite of Meta's admiration and the mutual wish to be intimate, confidence did not spring up spontaneously, as it had done with the doctor and, in that single hour, with Margaret." Blunt as Ethel was, her hardiness of manner gave a sense of real progress in friendship. Their confirmation vows seemed to make a link, and made us unfeigned enthusiasm, for the doctor was the sure road to Ethel's heart. She was soon telling how glad Margaret was that he had been drawn into taking pleasure in today's scheme, since not only were his spirits tried by the approach of Harry's departure, but he had, within the last few days, been made very sad by reading and answering Aunt Flora's first letter on the news of last October's misfortune. "'My aunt in New Zealand!' exclaimed Ethel. "'Have you an aunt in New Zealand?' cried Meta. "'I never heard of her.' "'Did not you? Oh, she does write such charming long letters. Is she Dr. May's sister?' "'No, he was an only child. She is dear mamma's sister.' I don't remember her, for she went out when I was a baby, but Richard and Margaret were so fond of her. They say she used to play with them, and tell them stories, and sing Scotch songs to them. Margaret says the first sorrow of her life was Aunt Flora's going away. Did she live with them? Yes, after Grandpapa died, she came to live with them, but then Mr. Arnott came about. I ought not to speak evil of him, for he is my godfather, but we do wish he had not carried off Aunt Flora. That letter of hers showed me what a comfort it would be to Papa to have her here. Perhaps she will come. 
No, Uncle Arnott has too much to do. It was a pretty story altogether. He was an officer at Edinburgh and fell in love with Aunt Flora, but my grandfather Mackenzie thought him too poor to marry her, and it was all broken off, and they tried to think no more of it. But Grandpapa died, and she came to live here, and somehow Mr. Arnott turned up again, quartered at Whitford, and Papa talked over my Uncle Mackenzie, and helped them, and Mr. Arnott thought the best way would be to go out to the colonies. They went when New Zealand was very new, and a very funny life they had. Once they had their house burned in Hecky's Rebellion, and Aunt Flora saw a Maori walking about in her best Sunday bonnet, but in general everything has gone on very well, and he has a great farm besides an office under government. Oh, so he went out as a settler. I was in hopes it was as a missionary. I fancy Aunt Flora has done a good deal that may be called missionary work, said Ethel, teaching the Maori women and girls. They call her mother, and she has quite a doctor's shop for them, and tries hard to teach them to take proper care of their poor little children when they are ill, and she cuts out clothes for the whole pa, that is, the village. And are they Christians? Oh, to be sure they are now. They meet in the pa for prayers every morning and evening. They used to have a hoe struck against a bit of metal for a signal, and when Papa heard of it, he gave them a bell, and they were so delighted. Now there comes a clergyman every fourth Sunday, and, on the others, Uncle Arnott reads part of the service to the English near, and the Maori teacher to his people. Maida asked ravenously for more details, and when she had pretty well exhausted Ethel's stock, she said, How nice it must be! Ethel, did you ever read the faithful little girl? Yes, it was one of Margaret's old Sunday books. I often recollected it before I was allowed to begin Coxmoor. I'm afraid I am very like Lucilla, said Meta. What, in wishing to be a boy, that you might be a missionary? said Ethel. Not in being quite so cross at home? she added, laughing. I am not cross because I have no opportunity, said Meta. No opportunity. Oh, Meta, if people wish to be cross, it is easy enough to find grounds for it. There is always the moon to cry for. Really and truly, said Meta thoughtfully, I never do meet with any reasonable trial of temper, and I am often afraid it cannot be right or safe to live so entirely at ease and without contradictions. Well, but, said Ethel, it is the state of life in which you are placed. Yes, but are we meant never to have vexations? I thought you had them, said Ethel. Margaret told me about your maid. That would have worried some people and made them horribly cross. Oh, no rational person, cried Meta. It was so nice to think of her being with a poor mother, and I was quite interested in managing for myself. Besides, you know, it was just a proof how one learns to be selfish, that it had never occurred to me that I ought to spare her. And your school children? You were in some trouble about them? Oh, that is pleasure. I thought you had a class you did not like. I like them now. They are such steady plotting girls, so much in earnest, and one that has been neglected is so pleased and touched by kindness. I would not give them up for anything now. They are just fit for my capacity. Do you mean that nothing ever goes wrong with you, or that you do not mind anything? Which? Nothing goes wrong enough with me to give me a handsome excuse for minding it. Then it must be all your good temper. I don't think so, said Maida. It is that nothing is ever disagreeable to me. Stay, said Ethel. If the ill temper was in you, you would only be the crosser for being indulged. At least, so books say. And I'm sure myself that it is not whether things are disagreeable or not, but whether one's will is with them that signifies. I don't quite understand. Why, I have seen the boys do for play, and done myself what would have been a horrid hardship if one had been made to do it. I never liked any lessons as well as those I did without being obliged, and always, when there is a thing I hate very much in itself, I can get up an interest in it by resolving that I will do it well, or fast, or something. If I can stick my will to it, it is like a lever, and it is done. Now, I think it must be the same with you, only your will is more easily set at it than mine. 
What makes me uncomfortable is that I feel as if I never followed anything but my will. Ethel screwed up her face as if the eyes of her mind were pursuing some thought almost beyond her. If our will and our duty run the same, she said, that can't be wrong. The better people are, the more they love what he commands, you know. In heaven, they have no will but his. Oh, but Ethel, cried Maida, distressed. That is putting it too high. Won't you understand what I mean? We have learned so much lately about self-denial and crossing one's own inclinations and enduring hardness. And here I live with two dear kind people who only try to keep every little annoyance from my path. I can't wish for a thing without getting it. I am waited on all day long, and I feel like one of the women that are at ease, one of the careless daughters." I think still Papa would say it was your happy, contented temper that made you find no vexation. But that sort of temper is not goodness. I was born with it. I never did mind anything, not even being punished, they say, unless I knew Papa was grieved, which always did make me unhappy enough. I laughed and went to play most saucily, whatever they did to me. If I had striven for the temper, it would be worth having— but it is my nature. And Ethel, she added, in a low voice, as the tears came into her eyes, don't you remember last Sunday? I felt myself so vain and petted a thing, as if I had no share in the cup of suffering, and did not deserve to call myself a member. It seemed ungrateful. Ethel felt ashamed, as she heard of warmer feelings than her own had been, expressed in that lowered, trembling voice, and she sought for the answer that would only come to her mind in sense, not at first in words. Discipline, said she, would not that show the willingness to have the part? Taking the right times for refusing oneself some pleasant thing. Would not that be only making up something for oneself, said Maida? No, the church orders it. It is in the prayer book, said Ethel. I mean, one can do little secret things, not read story books on those days or keep some tiresome sort of work for them. It is very trumpery, but it keeps the remembrance, and it is not so much as if one did not heed. I'll think, said Maida, sighing, if only I felt myself at work, not to please myself, but to be of use. Ha! she cried, springing up. I do believe I see Dr. May coming. Let us run and meet him, said Ethel. They did so, and he called out his wishes of many happy returns of blithe days to the little birthday queen, then added, You both look grave, though. Have they deserted you? No, Papa, we have been having a talk, said Ethel. May I tell him, Maida? I want to know what he says. Maida had not bargained for this, but she was very much in earnest, and there was nothing formidable in Dr. May, so she assented. Maida is longing to be at work. She thinks she is of no use, said Ethel. She says she never does anything but please herself. Pleasing oneself is not the same as trying to please oneself, said Dr. May kindly. And she thinks it cannot be safe or right, added Ethel, to live that happy bright life as if people without care or trouble could not be living as Christians are meant to live. Is that it, Maida? Yes, I think it is, said Maida. I seem to be only put here to be made much of. What did David say, Maida? returned Dr. May. My shepherd is the living Lord, nothing therefore I need. In pastures fair, near pleasant streams, he setteth me to feed. Then you think, said Maida, much touched, that I ought to look on this as the pastures fair and be thankful. I hope I was not unthankful. Oh, no, said Ethel. It was the wish to bear hardness and be a good soldier, was it not? Ah, my dear, he said, the rugged path and dark valley will come in his own fit time. Depend upon it. The good shepherd is giving you what is best for you in the green meadow, and if you lay hold on his rod and staff in your sunny days, he stopped short and turned to his daughter. Ethel, they sang that psalm the first Sunday I brought your mama home. Meta was much affected and began to put together what the father and daughter had said. Perhaps the little modes of secret discipline, of which Ethel had spoken, might be the true means of clasping the staff. Perhaps she had been impatient, 
and wanting in humility and craving for the strife, when her armor was scarce put on. Dr. May spoke once again. Don't let anyone long for external trial. The offering of a free heart is the thing. To offer praise is the great object of all creatures in heaven and earth. If the happier we are, the more we praise, then all is well. But the serious discussion was suddenly broken off. Others had seen Dr. May's approach, and Harry and Mary rushed down in dismay at their story having, as they thought, been forestalled. However, they had it all to themselves, and the doctor took up the subject as keenly as could have been hoped. But the poor boy being still fast asleep, after, probably, much fatigue, he would not then waken him to examine him, but came and sat down in the semicircle, formed by a terrace bank of soft turf, where Mrs. Larpent, Mrs. Wilmot, Richard, and Flora had for some time taken up their abode. Maida brought him the choice little basket of fruit which she had saved for him, and all delighted in having him there, evidently enjoying the rest and sport very much, as he reposed on the fragrant slope, eating grapes, and making inquiries as to the antiquities lately discovered. Norman gave an exceedingly droll account of the great Roman emperor Tiberius V. V., and made a correcting it. There was a regular gay skirmish of words, which entertained everyone extremely, above all, Meta's indignation when the charge was brought home to her of having declared the old duke exactly like in terms to Domitian and Tiberius, his features quite forbidding. This lasted till the younger ones, who had been playing and rioting till they were tired, came up, and throwing themselves down on the grass, Blanche petitioned for something that everyone could play at. Meta proposed what she called the story play. One was to be sent out of earshot, and the rest to agree upon a word, which was then to be guessed by each telling a story, and introducing the word into it, not too prominently. Meta volunteered to guess, and Harry whispered to Mary it would be no go. But, in the meantime, the word was found, and Blanche eagerly recalled Meta, and sat in the utmost expectation and delight. Meta turned first to Richard, but he colored distressfully, and begged that Flora might tell his story for him. He should only spoil the game. Flora, with a little tinge of graceful reluctance, obeyed. No woman had been to the summit of Mont Blanc, she said, till one young girl, named Marie, resolved to have this glory. The guides told her it was madness, but she persevered. She took the staff and everything requisite, and, following a party, began the ascent. She bravely supported every fatigue, climbed each precipice, was undaunted by the giddy heights she attained, bravely crossed the fields of snow, supported the bitter cold, and finally, though suffering severely, arrived at the topmost peak, looked forth where woman had never looked before, felt her heart swell at the attainment of her utmost ambition, and the name of Marie was inscribed as that of the woman who alone has had the glory of standing on the summit of the giant of the Alps. It was prettily enunciated, and had a pleasing effect. Meta stood conning the words, woman, giant, mountain, glory, and begged for another tale. Mine shall not be so stupid as Flora's, said Harry. We have an old sailor on board the Alcestis, a giant he might be for his voice. But he sailed once in the glory of the West, and there they had a monkey that was picked up in Africa, and one day this old fellow found his queer messmate, as he called him, buying through glass just like the captain. The captain had a glorious collection of old coins and the like, dug up in some of the old Greek colonies, and whenever Master Monkey saw him overhauling them, he would get out a brass button or a card or two, and turn them over, and chatter at them, and glory over them, quite knowing, said Harry, imitating the gesture, and I dare say he saw Vivi and Tiberius Caesar, as well as the best of them. Thank you, Mr. Harry, said Maida. I think we are at no loss for monkeys here, but I have not the word yet. Who comes next? Ethel? I shall blunder, I forewarn you, said Ethel, but this is mine. There was a young king who had an old tutor, 
whom he despised because he was so strict, so he got rid of him and took to idle sport. One day, when he was out hunting in a forest, a white hind came and ran before him till she guided him to a castle, and there he found the lady all dressed in white, with a beamy crown on head, and so nobly beautiful that he fell in love with her at once, and was only sorry to see another prince who was come to her palace too. She told him her name was Gloria, and that she had many suitors, but the choice did not depend on herself. She could only be won by him who deserved her, and for three years they were to be on their probation, trying for her. So she dismissed them, only burning to gain her, and telling them to come back in three years' time. But they had not gone far before they saw another palace, much finer, all glittering with gold and silver, and their Lady Gloria came out to meet them, not in her white dress, but in one all gay and bright with fine colors, and her crown they now saw was of diamonds. She told them they had only seen her everyday dress and house. This was her best, and she showed them about the castle and all the pictures of her former lovers. There was Alexander, who had been nearer retaining her than anyone, only the fever prevented it. There was Pyrrhus, always seeking her, but slain by a tile, Julius Caesar, Tamerlane, all the rest, and she hoped that one of these two would really prove worthy and gain her by going in the same path as these great people. So our prince went home, his head full of being like Alexander and all the rest of them, and he sent for his good old tutor to reckon up his armies and see whom he could conquer in order to win her. But the old tutor told him he was under a mistake. The second lady he had seen was a treacherous cousin of Gloria, who drew away her suitors by her deceits, and whose real name was Vena Gloria. If he wished to earn the true Gloria, he must set to work to do his subjects good and to be virtuous. And he did. He taught them, and he did justice to them, and he bore it patiently and kindly when they did not understand. But by and by the other king, who had no good tutor to help him, had got his armies together and conquered ever so many people, and drawn off their men to be soldiers, and now he attacked the good prince, and was so strong that he gained the victory, though both prince and subjects fought manfully with heart and hand, but the battle was lost, and the faithful prince wounded and made prisoner, but bearing it most patiently, till he was dragged behind the other's triumphal car with all the rest, when the three years were up, to be presented to Vanna Gloria. And so he was carried into the forest, bleeding and wounded, and his enemy drove the car over his body, and stretched out his arms to Vanna Gloria, and found her a vain, ugly wretch, who grew frightful as soon as he grasped her. But the good dying prince saw the beautiful beamy face of his lady love bending over him. Oh, he said, vision of my life, hast thou come to lighten my dying eyes? Never, never, even in my best days, did I deem that I could be worthy of thee. The more I strove, the more I knew that Gloria is for none below, for me less than all. And then the lady came and lifted him up, and she said, Gloria is given to all who do and suffer truly in a good cause, for faithfulness is glory, and that is thine. Ethel's language had become more flowing as she grew more eager in the tale, and they all listened with suspended interest. Norman asked where she got the story. Out of an old French book, the Magasin des Enfants, was the answer. But why did you alter the end, said Flora? Why kill the poor man? He used to be prosperous. Why not? Because I thought, said Ethel, that Gloria could not properly belong to anyone here, and if he was once conscious of it, it would be all spoiled. Well, Mida, do you guess? Oh, the word. I had forgotten all about it. I think I know what it must be, but I should so like another story. May I not have one? said Maida, coaxingly. Mary, it is you. Mary fell back on her papa and begged him to take hers. Papa told the best stories of all, she said, and Maida looked beseeching. My story will not be as long as Ethel's, said the doctor, yielding with a half-reluctant smile. My story is of a hummingbird a little creature that loved its master with all its strength and longed to do somewhat for him. It was not satisfied with its lot, because it seemed merely a vain and profitless creature. The nightingale sang praise, and the woods sounded with the glory of its strains. 
The fowl was valued for its flesh, the ostrich for its plume, but what could the little hummingbird do, save rejoice in the glory of the flood of sunbeams, and disport itself over the flowers, and glance in the sunny light, as its bright breastplate flashed from rich purple to dazzling flame color, and its wings supported it, fluttering so fast that the eye could hardly trace them, as it darted its slender beak into the deep bell blossoms. So the little bird grieved, and could not rest, for thinking that it was useless in this world, that it sought merely its own gratification, and could do nothing that could conduce to the glory of its master. But one night a voice spoke to the little bird. Why hast thou been placed here, it said, but at the will of thy master? Was it not that he might delight himself in thy radiant plumage, and see thy joy in the sunshine? His gifts are thy buoyant wing, thy beauteous colors, the love of all around, the sweetness of the honey-drop in the flowers, the shade of the palm-leaf. Esteem them, then, as his. Value thine own bliss, while it lasts, as the token of his care and love. And while thy heart praises him for them, and thy wings quiver and dance to the tune of that praise, then, indeed, thy gladness conduces to no vain glory of thine own, in beauty or in graceful flight, but thou art a creature serving, as best thou canst, to his glory. I know the word, half-whispered Meta, not without a trembling of the lip. I know why you told the story, Dr. May, but one is not as good as the hummingbirds. The elder ladies had begun to look at watches, and talk of time to go home, and Jem Jennings, having been seen rearing himself up from behind the barrow, the doctor proceeded to investigate his case, was perfectly satisfied of the boy's truth, and as ready as the young ones to befriend him. A letter should be written at once, desiring his father to look out for him on Friday, when he should go by the same train as Harry, who was delighted at the notion of protecting him so far, and begged to be allowed to drive them home to Stoneboro in the gig. Consent was given, and Richard being added to give weight and discretion, the gig set out at once. The doctor, much to Maida's delight, took his place in the break. Blanche, who, in the morning, had been inclined to despise it as something akin to a cart, now finding it a popular conveyance, was urgent to return in it, and Flora was made over to the carriage, not at all unwillingly, for, though it separated her from Maida, it made a senior of her. Norman's fate conveyed him to the exalted seat beside the driver of the break, where he could only now and then catch the sounds of mirth from below. He had enjoyed the day exceedingly, with that sort of abandon more than ordinarily delicious to grave or saddened temperaments, when roused or drawn out for a time. Maida's winning grace and sweetness had a peculiar charm for him, and, perhaps, his having been originally introduced to her as ill, and in sorrow, had given her manner towards him a sort of kindness which was very gratifying. And now he felt as if he was going back to a very dusky, dusty world. The last and blithest day of his holidays was past, and he must return to the misapprehensions and injustice that had blighted his school career, be kept beneath boys with half his ability, and without generous feeling, and find all his attainments useless in restoring his position. Dr. Hoxton's dull scholarship would chill all pleasure in his studies. There would be no companionship among the boys. Even his supporters, Ernst Cliff and Larkins, were gone, and Harry would leave him still under a cloud. Norman felt it more as disgrace than he had done since the first, and wished he had consented to quit the school when it had been offered, be made a man instead of suffering these doubly irksome provocations, which rose before him in renewed force. And what would that little hummingbird think of me if she knew me disgraced, thought he, but it is of no use to think of it. I must go through with it, and as I always am getting vainglorious, I had better have no opportunity. I did not declare I renounced a vain pomp and glory last week, to begin coveting them now again. So Norman repressed the sigh as he looked at the school buildings, which never could give him the pleasures of memory they afforded to others. The break had set out before the carriage, so that Maida had to come in and wait for her governess. Before the vehicle had disgorged half of its contents, Harry had rushed out to meet them. 
Come in, come in, Norman. Only here. Margaret shall tell you herself. Hurrah! Is Mr. Earnscliffe come? Crossed Ethel's mind, but Margaret was alone, flushed, and holding out her hands. Norman, where is he? Dear Norman, here is good news. Papa, Dr. Hoxton has been here, and he knows all about it. And, oh, Norman, he is very sorry for the injustice, and you are ducks again. Norman really trembled so much that he could neither speak nor stand, but sat down on the window seat, while a confusion of tongues asked more. Dr. Hoxton and Mr. Larkins had come to call. Heard no one was at home but Miss May, had, nevertheless, come in, and Margaret had heard that Mr. Larkins, who had before intended to remove his son from Stoneborough, had, in the course of the holidays, made discoveries from him, which he could not feel justified in concealing from Dr. Hoxton. The whole of the transactions with Ball Hatchet, and Norman's part in them, had been explained, as well as the true history of the affray in Randall's Alley, how Norman had dispersed the boys, how they had again collected, and, with the full concurrence of Harvey Anderson, renewed the mischief, how the Andersons had refused to bear witness in his favor, and how Ball Hatchet's ill will had kept back the evidence which would have cleared him. Little Larkins had told all, and his father had no scruple in repeating it, and causing the investigation to be set on foot. Nay, he deemed that Norman's influence had saved his son, and came, as anxious to thank him, as Dr. Hoxton, warm-hearted, though injudicious, was to repair his injustice. They were much surprised and struck by finding that Dr. May had been aware of the truth the whole time, and had patiently put up with the injustice and the loss of the scholarship, a loss which Dr. Hoxton would have given anything to repair, so as to have sent up a scholar likely to do him so much credit, but it was now too late, and he had only been able to tell Margaret how dismayed he was at finding out that the boy, to whom all the good order in his school was owing, had been so ill-used. Kind Dr. May's first feeling really seemed to be pity and sympathy for his old friend, the headmaster, in the shock of such a discovery. Harry was vociferously telling his version of the story to Ethel and Mary. Tom stood transfixed in attention. Meta, forgotten and bewildered, was standing near Norman, whose color rapidly varied, and whose breath came short and quick as he listened. A quick half-interrogation passed Meta's lips, heard by no one else. "'It is only that it is all right,' he answered, scarcely audibly. "'They have found out the truth.' "'What?' "'Who? You?' said Maida, as she heard words that implied the past suspicion. "'Yes,' said Norman. "'I was suspected, but never at home. "'And is it over now?' "'Yes, yes,' he whispered huskily. "'All is right, and Harry will not leave me in disgrace.' Maida did not speak, but she held out her hand in hearty congratulation. Norman, scarcely knowing what he did— grasped and wrung it so tight that it was positive pain as he turned away his head to the window to struggle with those irrepressible tears maida's color flushed into her cheek as she found it still held almost unconsciously perhaps in his agitation and she heard margaret's words that both gentlemen had said norman had acted nobly and that every revelation made in the course of their examination had only more fully established his admirable conduct "'Oh, Norman, Norman, I am so glad!' cried Mary's voice in the first pause. And, Margaret asking where he was, he suddenly turned round, recollected himself, and found it was not the back of the chair that he had been squeezing, blushed intensely, but made no attempt at apology, for indeed he could not speak. He only leaned down over Margaret to receive her heartfelt embrace, and, as he stood up again, his father laid his hand on his shoulder. "'My boy, I am glad.' But the words were broken, and, as if neither could bear more, Norman hastily left the room, Ethel rushing after him. "'Quite overcome,' said the doctor, "'and no wonder. He felt it cruelly, though he bore up gallantly. "'Well, July?' "'I'll go down to school with him tomorrow and see him ducks again. "'I'll have three times three,' shouted Harry. "'Hip, hip, hooray!' 
and Tom and Mary joined in chorus. "'What is all this?' exclaimed Flora, opening the door. "'Is everyone gone mad?' Many were the voices that answered. "'Well, I am glad, and I hope the Andersons will make an apology. "'But where is poor Meta? Quite forgotten?' "'Meta would not wonder if she knew all,' said the doctor, "'turning with a sweet smile that had in it something, nevertheless, of apology. "'Oh, I am so glad, so glad,' said Meta, her eyes full of tears, as she came forward. "'And there was no helping it. "'The first kiss between Margaret May and Margaret Rivers "'was given in that overflowing sympathy of congratulation. "'The doctor gave her his arm to take her to the carriage, "'and, on the way, his quick, warm words filled up the sketch of Norman's behavior.' Meta's eyes responded better than her tongue, but, to her good-bye, she could not help adding, Now I have seen true glory. His answer was much such a grip as her poor little fingers had already received, but though they felt hot and crushed all the way home, the sensation seemed to cause such throbs of joy that she would not have been without it. End of Part 1 Chapter 26 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen Gilbert, Arizona. Part 1, Chapter 27 of The Daisy Chain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. And full of hope, they followed day, while that stout ship at anchor lay beside the shores of white. The May had then made all things green, and floating there in pomp serene, that ship was goodly to be seen, his pride and his delight. Yet then, when called ashore, he sought the tender peace of rural thought in more than happy mood. To your abodes, bright daisy flowers, he then would steal at leisure hours, and loved you, glittering in your bowers, a starry multitude. Wordsworth Harry's last home morning was brightened by going to the school to see full justice done to Norman, and enjoying this scene for him. It was indeed a painful ordeal to Norman himself, who could, at the moment, scarcely feel pleasure in his restoration, excepting for the sake of his father, Harry, and his sisters. To find the headmaster making apologies to him was positively painful and embarrassing, and his countenance would have been fitter for a culprit receiving a lecture. It was pleasanter when the two other masters shook hands with him, Mr. Harrison with a free confession that he had done him injustice, and Mr. Wilmot with a glad look of congratulation that convinced Harry he had never believed Norman to blame. Harry himself was somewhat of a hero. The masters all spoke to him, bade him good speed, and wished him a happy voyage, and all the boys were eager to admire his uniform, and wished themselves already men and officers like Mr. May. He had as long desired three cheers for May Senior, shouted with a thorough good will by the United Lungs of the Witchcoat Foundation, and a supplementary cheer arose for the good ship Alcestis, while hands were held out on every side, and the boy arrived at such a pitch of benevolence and good humor as actually to volunteer a friendly shake of the hand to Edward Anderson, whom he encountered skulking apart. Never mind, Ned, we have often licked each other before now, and don't let us bear a grudge now I'm going away. We are Stoneboro fellows both, you know, after all. Edward did not refuse the offered grasp, and though his words were only, Goodbye, I hope you will have plenty of fun, Harry went away with a lighter heart. The rest of the day Harry adhered closely to his father, though chiefly in silence. Dr. May had attended much advice and exhortation for his warm-hearted, wild-spirited son, but words would not come, not even when, in the still evening twilight, they walked down alone together to the cloister and stood over the little stone marked M.M. After standing there for some minute, Harry knelt to collect some of the daisies in the grass. Are those to take with you? Margaret is going to make a cross of them for my prayer book. Aye, they will keep it in your mind. Say it all to you, Harry. She may be nearer to you everywhere, though you are far from us. Don't put yourself from her. 
That was all Dr. May contrived to say to his son, nor could Margaret do much more than kiss him, while tears flowed one by one over her cheeks, as she tried to whisper that he must remember and guard himself, and that he was sure of being thought of, at least, in every prayer. And then she fastened into his book the cross, formed of flattened daisies, gummed upon a framework of paper. He begged her to place it at the baptismal service, for he said, I like that about fighting, and I always did like the church being like a ship, don't you? I only found that prayer out the day poor little Daisy was christened. Margaret had indeed a thrill of melancholy pleasure in this task, when she saw how it was regarded. Oh, that her boy might not lose these impressions amid the stormy waves he was about to encounter! That last evening of home good nights cost Harry many a choking sob ere he could fall asleep. But the morning of departure had more cheerfulness. The pleasure of patronizing Jem Jennings was as consoling to his spirits as was to Mary the necessity of comforting Toby. Toby's tastes were in some respects vulgar, as he preferred the stable and Will Adams to all Mary's attentions, but he attached himself vehemently to Dr. May, followed him everywhere, and went into raptures at the slightest notice from him. The doctor said it was all homage to the master of the house. Margaret held that the dog was a physiognomist. The world was somewhat flat after the loss of Harry, that element of riot and fun. Aubrey was always playing at poor Harry sailing away, Mary looked staid and sober, and Norman was still graver and more devoted to books, while Ethel gave herself up more completely to the thickening troubles of Coxmoor. Jealousies had arisen there, and these, with some rebukes for failures in sending children to be taught, had led to imputations on the character of Mrs. Green, in whose house the school was kept. Ethel was at first vehement in her defense. Then, when stronger evidence was adduced of the woman's dishonesty, she was dreadfully shocked and wanted to give up all connection with her, and in both moods was equally displeased with Richard for pausing and not going all lengths with her. Mr. Wilmot was appealed to and did his best to investigate, but the only result was to discover that no one interrogated had any notion of truth except John Taylor, and he knew nothing of the matter. The mass of falsehood, spite, violence, and dishonesty that became evident was perfectly appalling, and not a clue was to be found to the truth, scarcely a hope that minds so lost to honorable feeling were open to receive good impressions. It was a great distress to Ethel. It haunted her night and day. She lay awake pondering on the vain hopes for her poor children, and slept to dream of the angry faces and rude accusations. Margaret grew quite anxious about her, and her elders were seriously considering the propriety of her continuing her labors at Coxmoor. Mr. Wilmot would not be at Stoneborough after Christmas. His father's declining health made him be required at home, and since Richard was so often absent, it became matter of doubt whether the Misses May ought to be allowed to persevere, unassisted by older heads, in such a locality. This doubt put Ethel into an agony. Though she had lately been declaring that it made her very unhappy to go, she could not bear the sight of Mrs. Green, and that she knew all her efforts were vain while the poor children had such homes. She now only implored to be allowed to go on, she said that the badness of the people only made it more needful to do their utmost for them. There were no end to the arguments that she poured forth upon her ever-kind listener, Margaret. Yes, dear Ethel, yes, but pray be calm. I know Papa and Mr. Wilmot would not put a stop to it if they could possibly help it, but if it is not proper... Proper? That is as bad as Miss Winter. Ethel, you and I cannot judge of these things. You must leave them to our elders. And men always are so fanciful about ladies. Indeed, if you speak in that way, I shall think it is really hurting you. I did not mean it, dear Margaret, said Ethel. But if you knew what I feel for poor Coxmoor, you would not wonder that I cannot bear it. I do not wonder, dearest, but if this trial is sent you, perhaps it is to train you for better things. Perhaps it is for my fault, said Ethel. Oh, oh, if it be that I am too unworthy and it is the only hope. No one will do anything to teach these poor creatures if I give it up. What shall I do, Margaret? Margaret drew her down close to her and whispered, Trust them, Ethel, dear. 
the decision will be whatever is the will of God. If he thinks fit to give you the work, it will come. If not, he will give you some other and provide for them. If I have been too neglectful of home, too vain of persevering when no one but Richard would, sighed Ethel. I cannot see that you have, dearest, said Margaret fondly, but your own heart must tell you that. And now, only try to be calm and patient. Getting into these fits of despair is the very thing to make people decide against you. I will, I will, I will try to be patient, sobbed Ethel. I know to be wayward and set on it would only hurt. I might only do more harm. I'll try. But, oh, my poor children! Margaret gave a little space for the struggle with herself, then advised her resolutely to fix her attention on something else. It was a Saturday morning, and time was more free than usual, so Margaret was able to persuade her to continue a half-forgotten drawing while listening to an interesting article in a review, which opened to her that there were too many cocksmores in the world. The dinner hour sounded too soon, and as she was crossing the hall to put away her drawing materials, the front door gave the click peculiar to Dr. May's left-handed way of opening it. She paused and saw him enter, flushed and with a look that certified her that something had happened. Well, Ethel, he has come. Oh, Papa, Mr. Ernst. He held up his finger, drew her into the study, and shut the door. The expression of mystery and amusement gave way to sadness and gravity as he sat down in his armchair and sighed as if much fatigued. She was checked and alarmed, but she could not help asking, Is he here? At the Swan. He came last night and watched for me this morning as I came out of the hospital. We have been walking over the meadows to Fordholm. No wonder Dr. May was hot and tired. But is he not coming? asked Ethel. Yes, poor fellow, but hush, stop, say nothing to the others. I must not have her agitated till she has had her dinner in peace, and the house is quiet. You know she cannot run away to her room as you would. Then he has really come for that? cried Ethel breathlessly, and, perceiving the affirmative, added, But why did he wait so long? He wished to see his way through his affairs, and also wanted to hear of her from Harry. I am afraid poor July's colors were too bright. And why did he come to the swan instead of to us? That was his fine, noble feeling. He thought it right to see me first, that if I thought the decision too trying for Margaret, in her present state, or if I disapproved of the long engagement, I might spare her all knowledge of his coming. Oh, Papa, you won't! I don't know but that I ought. But yet, the fact is, that I cannot. With that fine young fellow so generously, fondly attached, I cannot find it in my heart to send him away for four years without seeing her, and yet, poor things, it might be better for them both. Oh, Ethel, if your mother were but here! He rested his forehead on his hands, and Ethel stood aghast at his unexpected reception of the addresses for which she had so long hoped. She did not venture to speak, and presently he roused himself as the dinner bell rang. One comfort is, he said, that Margaret has more composure than I. Do you go to Coxmoor this afternoon? I wished it. Take them all with you. You may tell them why when you are out. I must have the house quiet. I shall get Margaret out into the shade and prepare her as best I can before he comes at three o'clock. It was not flattering to be thus cleared out of the way, especially when full of excited curiosity, but any such sensation was quite overborne by sympathy in his great anxiety, and Ethel's only question was, had not Flora better stay to keep off company? No, no, said Dr. May impatiently, the fewer the better, and hastily passing her, he dashed up to his room nearly running over the nursery procession, and, in a very few seconds, was seated at table, eating and speaking by snatches, and swallowing endless draughts of cold water. "'You are going to Coxmore,' said he, as they were finishing. "'It is the right day,' said Richard. "'Are you coming, Flora?' "'Not today. I have to call Mrs. Hoxton.' "'Never mind Mrs. Hoxton,' said the doctor. "'You had better go today. A fine, cool day for a walk.' He did not look as if he found it so. "'Oh, yes, Flora, you must come,' said Ethel. "'We want you.' 
"'I have engagements at home,' replied Flora. "'And it really is a trying walk,' said Miss Winter. "'You must,' reiterated Ethel. "'Come to our room, and I will tell you why. "'I do not mean to go to Coxmoor till something positive is settled. "'I cannot have anything to do with that woman.' "'If you would only come upstairs,' implored Ethel, at the door, "'I have something to tell you alone.' "'I shall come up in due time. "'I thought you had outgrown closetings and foolish secrets,' said Flora. "'Her movements were quickened, however, by her father, "'who, finding her with Margaret in the drawing-room, "'ordered her upstairs in a peremptory manner, "'which she resented as treating her like a child, "'and therefore proceeded in no amiable mood to the room.' where Ethel awaited her in wild, tumultuous impatience. "'Well, Ethel, what is this grand secret?' "'Oh, Flora, Mr. Ernstcliff is at the Swan. He has been speaking to Papa about Margaret.' "'Proposing for her, do you mean?' said Flora. "'Yes, he is coming to see her this afternoon, and that is the reason that Papa wants us to all be out of the way. "'Did Papa tell you this?' "'Yes,' said Ethel, beginning to perceive the secret of her displeasure." but only because I was the first person he met, and Norman guessed it long ago. Do put on your things. I'll tell you all I know when we are out. Papa is so anxious to have the coast clear. I understand, said Flora, but I shall not go with you. Do not be afraid of my interfering with anyone. I shall sit here. But Papa said you were to go. If he had done me the favor of speaking to me himself, said Flora, I should have shown him that it is not right that Margaret should be left without any one at hand in case she should be overcome. He is of no use in such cases, only makes things worse. I should not feel justified in leaving Margaret with no one else, but he is in one of those hand-over-head moods when it is not of the least use to say a word to him. Flora, how can you, when he expressly ordered you? All he meant was, do not be in the way, and I shall not show myself unless I am needed when he would be glad enough of me. I am not bound to obey the very letter, like Blanche or Mary. Ethel looked horrified by the assertion of independence, but Richard called her from below, and, with one more fruitless entreaty, she ran downstairs. Richard had been hearing all from his father, and it was comfortable to talk the matter over with him, and here explained the anxiety which frightened her, while she scarcely comprehended it how Dr. May could not feel certain whether it was right or expedient to promote an engagement which must depend on health so uncertain as poor Margaret's, and how he dreaded the effect on the happiness of both. Ethel's romance seemed to be turned into melancholy, and she walked on gravely and thoughtfully, though repeating that there could be no doubt of Margaret's perfect recovery by the time of the return from the voyage. Her lessons were somewhat nervous and flurried, and even the sight of two very nice, neat new scholars a very different appearance from the rest, and of much superior attainments, only half interested her. Mary was enchanted at them as a pair of prodigies, actually able to read, and had made out their names and their former abodes, and how they had been used to go to school, and had just come to live in the cottage deserted by the lamented Una. Ethel thought it quite provoking in her brother to accede to Mary's entreaties that they should go and call on this promising importation. Even the children's information that they were taught now by Sister Cherry failed to attract her. But Richard looked at his watch and decided that it was too soon to go home, and she had to submit to her fate. Very different was the aspect of the house from the wild Irish cabin appearance that it had in the McCarthy days. It was the remains of an old farmhouse that had seen better days, somewhat larger than the general run of the Coxmoor dwellings. Respectable furniture had taken up its abode against the walls, the kitchen was well arranged, and in spite of the wretched flooring and broken windows, had an air of comfort. A very tidy woman was bustling about, still trying to get rid of the relics of her former tenants, who might, she much feared, have left a legacy of typhus fever. The more interesting person was, however, a young woman of three or four and twenty, pale and very lame, and with the air of a respectable servant, her manners particularly pleasing. It appeared that she was the daughter of a first wife, and, after the period of schooling, had been at service, but had been lamed by a fall downstairs, and had been obliged to come home, just as scarcity of work had caused her father to leave his native parish and seek employment at other quarries. She had hoped to obtain plain work, 
but all the family were dismayed and disappointed at the wild spot to which they had come, and anxiously availed themselves of this introduction to beg that the elder boy and girl might be admitted into the town school, distant as it was. At another time, the thought of Charity Elwood would have engrossed Ethel's whole mind, now she could hardly attend, and kept looking eagerly at Richard as he talked endlessly with a good mother. When, at last, they did set off, he would not let her gallop home like a steam engine, but made her take his arm, when he found that she could not otherwise moderate her steps. At the long hill a figure appeared, and, as soon as Richard was certified of its identity, he let her fly like a bolt from a crossbow, and she stood by Dr. May's side. A little ashamed, she blushed instead of speaking, and waited for Richard to come up and begin. Neither did he say anything, and they paused till, the silence disturbing her, she ventured a, "'Well, Papa!' "'Well, poor things, she was quite overcome when first I told her, said it would be hard on him, and begged me to tell him that he would be much happier if he thought no more of her.' "'Did Margaret?' cried Ethel. "'Oh, could she mean it?' "'She thought she meant it, poor dear, and repeated such things again and again. "'But when I asked whether I should send him away without seeing her, "'she cried more than ever, and said, "'You are tempting me. It would be selfishness.' "'Oh, dear, she surely has seen him.' "'I told her that I would be the last person who wished to tempt her to selfishness, but that I did not think that either could be easy in settling such a matter through a third person. It would have been very unkind, said Ethel. I wonder she did not think so. She did at last. I saw it could not be otherwise, and she said, poor darling, that when he had seen her, he would know the impossibility, but she was so agitated that I did not know how it could be. Has she? I, I told him not to stay too long, and left him under the tulip tree with her. I found her much more composed. He was so gentle and considerate. Ah, he is the very man. Besides, he has convinced her now that affection brings him, not mere generosity, as she fancied. Oh, then it is settled, cried Ethel joyously. I wish it were. She has owned that if, if she were in health. But that is all, and he is transported with having gained so much. Poor fellow. So far... I trust it is better for them to know each other's minds, but how it is to be... But, Papa, you know Sir Matthew Fleet said she was sure to get well, and in three years' time. Yes, yes, that is the best chance, but it is a dreary lookout for two young things. That is in wiser hands, however. If only I saw what was right to do. My miserable carelessness has undone you all, he concluded, almost inaudibly. It was indeed... To him, a time of great distress and perplexity, wishing to act the part of father and mother both towards his daughter, acutely feeling his want of calm decision, and torn to pieces at once by sympathy with the lovers, and by delicacy that held him back from seeming to bind the young man to an uncertain engagement, above all, tortured by self-reproach for the commencement of the attachment, and for the misfortune that had rendered its prosperity doubtful. Ethel could find no words of comfort in the bewildered glimpse at his sorrow and agitation. Richard spoke with calmness and good sense, and his replies, though brief and commonplace, were not without effect in lessening the excitement and despondency which the poor doctor's present mood had been aggravating. At the door, Dr. May asked for Flora, and Ethel explained. If Flora had obtruded herself, he would have been irritated, but, as it was, he had no time to observe the disobedience, and seeing that he hoped she was with Margaret, sent Ethel into the drawing-room. Flora was not there, only Margaret lay on her sofa, and Ethel hesitated, shy, curious, and alarmed. But, as she approached, she was relieved to see the blue eyes more serene even than usual, while a glow of color spread over her face, making her like the blooming Margaret of old times. Her expression was full of peace, but became somewhat amused at Ethel's timid, awkward pauses, as she held out her hands and said, Come, dear Ethel. Oh, Margaret, Margaret! And Ethel was drawn into her sister's bosom. Presently she drew back, gazed at her sister inquiringly, and said in an odd, doubtful voice, Then you are glad? Margaret nearly laughed at the strange manner, but spoke with a sorrowful tone. Glad in one way, dearest, 
almost too glad and grateful. Oh, I am so glad, again said Ethel. I thought it was making everybody unhappy. I don't believe I could be that. Now he has come. Now I know. And her voice trembled. There must be doubt and uncertainty, she added. But I can't dwell on them just yet. They will settle what is right, I know. And, happen what may, I have always this to remember. Oh, that is right. Papa will be so relieved. He was afraid it had only been distress. Poor Papa. Yes, I did not command myself at first. I was not sure whether it was right to see him at all. Oh, Margaret, that was too bad. It did not seem right to encourage any such... such... The word was lost. To such a poor, helpless thing as I am. I did not know what to do, and I am afraid I behaved like a silly child and did not think of dear Papa's feelings. But I will try to be good and leave it all to them. And you are going to be happy? said Ethel wistfully. For the present, at least. I cannot help it, said Margaret. Oh, he is so kind and so unselfish and so beautifully gentle. And to think of his still caring. But there, dear Ethel, I am not going to cry. Do call Papa, or he will think me foolish again. I want him to be quite at ease about me before he comes. Then he is coming? Yes, at tea time. So run, dear Ethel, and tell Jane to get his room ready. The message quickened Ethel, and after giving it and reporting consolingly to her father, she went up to Flora, who had been a voluntary prisoner upstairs all this time, and was not peculiarly gratified at such tidings coming only through the medium of Ethel. She had before been sensible that, superior in discretion and effectiveness as she was acknowledged to be, she did not share so much of the confidence and sympathy as some of the others, and she felt mortified and injured, though in this case it was entirely her own fault. The sense of alienation grew upon her. She dressed quickly and hurried down that she might see Margaret alone, but the room was already prepared for tea, and the children were fast assembling. Ethel came down a few minutes after, and found Blanche claiming Alan Ernstcliff as her lawful property, dancing round him, chattering, and looking injured if he addressed a word to anyone else. How did lovers look? was the speculation which had, more than once, occupied Ethel, and when she had satisfied herself that her father was at ease, she began to study it, as soon as the shamefaced consciousness would allow her, after Alan's warm shake of the hand. Margaret looked much as usual, only with more glow and brightness. Mr. Ernstcliff, not far otherwise. He was as pale and slight as on his last visit, with the same soft blue eyes, capable, however, of a peculiar, keen, steady glance when he was listening, and which now seemed to be attending to Margaret's every word or look, through all the delighted uproar which Aubrey, Blanche, and Mary kept up round him, or while taking his share in the general conversation, telling of Harry's popularity and good conduct on board the Alcestis, or listening to the history of Norman's school adventures, which he had heard, in part, from Harry, and how young Jennings was entered in the flagship as a boy, though not yet to sail with his father. After the storm of the day, the sky seemed quite clear, and Ethel could not see that being lovers made much difference. To be sure, Papa displeased Blanche by calling her away to his side when she would squeeze her chair in between Alan's and the sofa, and Alan took all the waiting on Margaret exclusively to himself. Otherwise, there was nothing remarkable, and he was very much the same Mr. Ernstcliff whom they had received a year ago. In truth, the next ten days were very happy. The future was left to rest, and Alan spent his mornings in the drawing-room alone with Margaret, and looked ever more brightly placid, well, with the rest, he was more than the former kind playfellow, for he now took his place as the affectionate elder brother, entering warmly into all their schemes and pleasures, and winning for himself a full measure of affection from all. Even his little goddaughter began to know him, and smile at his presence. Margaret and Ethel especially delighted in the look of enjoyment with which their father sat down to enter on the evening's conversation after the day's work and Flora was well pleased that Mrs. Hoxton should find Alan in the drawing-room, and ask afterwards about his estate, and that Meta Rivers, after being certified that this was their Mr. Ernscliffe, pronounced that her papa thought him particularly pleasing and gentlemanlike. 
there was something dignified in having a sister on the point of being engaged. End of Part 1, Chapter 27 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Part 1, Chapter 28 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. Sail forth into the sea, thou ship, through breeze and cloud, right onward steer. The moistened eye, the trembling lip, are not the signs of doubt or fear? Longfellow. Tranquility only lasted until Mr. Ernstcliffe found it necessary to understand on what terms he was to stand. Everyone was tender of conscience, anxious to do right, and desirous to yield to the opinion that nobody could or would give. While Alan begged for a positive engagement, Margaret scrupled to exchange promises that she might never be able to fulfill, and both agreed to leave all to her father, who, in every way, ought to have the best ability to judge whether there was unreasonable presumption in such a betrothal. But this very ability only served to perplex the poor doctor more and more. It is far easier for a man to decide when he sees only one bearing of a case than when, like Dr. May, he not only sees them, but is rent by them in his inmost heart. Sympathizing in turn with each lover, bitterly accusing his own carelessness as the cause of all their troubles, his doubts contending with his hopes, his conviction clashing with Sir Matthew Fleet's opinion, his conscientious sincerity and delicacy conflicting with his affection and eagerness, he was perfectly incapable of coming to a decision, and suffered so cruelly that Margaret was doubly distressed for his sake, and Alan felt himself guilty of having rendered everybody miserable. Dr. May could not conceal his trouble, and rendered Ethel almost as unhappy as himself, after each conversation with her, though her hopes usually sprang up again, and she had a happy conviction that this was only the second volume of the novel. Flora was not often called into his counsels. Confidence never came spontaneously from Dr. May to her. There was something that did not draw it forth towards her, whether it resided in that half-sarcastic corner of her steady blue eye, or in the grave common sense of her gentle voice. Her view of the case was known to be that there was no need for such perplexity. Why should not Alan be the best judge of his own happiness? If Margaret were to be delicate for life, it would be better to have such a home to look to. And she soothed and comforted Margaret, and talked in a strain of unmixed hope and anticipation that often drew a smile from her sister, though she feared to trust to it. Flora's tact and consideration in keeping the children away when the lovers could best be alone, and letting them in when the discussion was becoming useless and harassing, her cheerful smiles, her evening music that covered all sounds, her removal of all extra annoyances, were invaluable, and Margaret appreciated them as, indeed, Flora took care that she should. Margaret begged to know her eldest brother's judgment, but had great difficulty in dragging it out. Diffidently, as it was proposed, it was clear and decided. He thought that his father had better send Sir Matthew Fleet a statement of Margaret's present condition and abide by his answer as to whether her progress warranted the hope of her restoration. Never was Richard more surprised than by the gratitude with which his suggestion was hailed, simple as it was, so that it seemed obvious that others should have already thought of it. After the tossings of uncertainty, it was a positive relief to refer the question to some external voice, and only Ethel and Norman expressed strong dislike to Sir Matthew becoming the arbiter of Margaret's fate, and were scarcely pacified by Dr. May's assurance that he had not revealed the occasion of his inquiry. The letter was sent, and repose returned, but hearts beat high on the morning when the answer was expected. Dr. May watched the moment when his daughter was alone, carried the letter to her, and kissing her, said, with an oppressed voice, I give you joy, my dear. She read with suspended breath and palpitating heart. Sir Matthew thought her improvement sure, though slow, and had barely a doubt that, in a year, 
she would have regained her full strength and activity. "'You will show it to Alan,' said Dr. May, as Margaret lifted her eyes to his face inquiringly. "'Will not you?' she said. "'I cannot,' he answered. "'I wish I was more helpful to you, my child,' he added wistfully. "'But you will rest on him and be happy together while he stays, will you not?' "'Indeed I will, dear Papa.' Mr. Ernscliffe was with her as the doctor quitted her. She held the letter to him, but, she said slowly, I see that Papa does not believe it. You promise to abide by it, he exclaimed, between entreaty and authority. I do, if you choose so to risk your hopes. But, cried he, as he glanced hastily over the letter, there can be no doubt. These words are as certain as language can make them. Why will you not trust them? I see that Papa does not. Despondency and self-reproach made him morbidly anxious. Believe so, my Margaret. You know he is no surgeon. His education included that line, said Margaret. I believe he has all but the manual dexterity. However, I would fain have faith in Sir Matthew, she added, smiling. And perhaps I am only swayed by the habit of thinking that Papa must know best. He does in different cases, but it is an old axiom that a medical man should not prescribe for his own family. Above all, in such a case, where it is but reasonable to believe an unprejudiced stranger, who alone is cool enough to be relied on. I absolutely depend on him. Margaret absolutely depended on the bright, cheerful look of conviction. Yes, she said, we will try to make Papa take pleasure in the prospect. Perhaps I could do more if I made the attempt. I am sure you could, if you would let me give you more support, if I were but going to remain with you. Don't let us be discontented, said Margaret, smiling, when so much more has been granted than I dare to hope. Be it as it may, let us be happy in what we have. It makes you happy, said he, archly reading her face to draw out the avowal, but he only made her hide it with a mute caress of the hand that held hers. She was glad enough to rest in the present, now that everything concurred to satisfy her conscience in so doing, and come what might, the days now spent together would be a possession of joy for ever. Captain Gordon contrived to afford his lieutenant another fortnight's leave, perhaps because he was in dread of losing him altogether, for Alan had some doubts, and many longings to remain. Had it been possible to marry at once, he would have quitted the navy immediately, and he would have given worlds to linger beside Margaret's couch, and claim her the first moment possible, believing his care more availing than all. He was, however, so pledged to Captain Gordon that, without strong cause, he would not have been justified in withdrawing. Besides, Harry was under his charge, and Dr. May and Margaret both thought, with the captain, that an active life would be a better occupation for him than watching her. He would never be able to settle down at his new home comfortably without her, and he would be more in the way of duty while pursuing his profession, so Margaret nerved herself against using her influence to detain him, and he thanked her for it. Though hope and affection could not at once repair an injured spine, they had wonderful powers in inciting Margaret to new efforts. Alan was as tender and ready of hand as Richard, and more clever and enterprising, and her unfailing trust in him prevented all alarms and misgivings, so that wonders were effected, and her father beheld her standing with so little support, looking so healthful and so blithe, that his forebodings melted away, and he talked joyously of the future. The great achievement was taking her round the garden. She could not bear the motion of wheels, but Alan adopted the hammock principle, and with the aid of Richard and his crony, the carpenter, produced a machine in which no other power on earth could have prevailed on her to trust herself but in which she was carried round the garden so successfully that there was even a talk of next Sunday and of the minster. It was safely accomplished, and tired as she was, Margaret felt, as she whispered to Alan, that he had now crowned all the joy that he had brought to her. Ethel used to watch them and think how beautiful their countenances were, and talk them over with her father, who was quite happy about them now. She gave assistance, which Alan never once called unhandy, to all his contrivances, and often floundered in upon his conferences with Margaret, in a way that would have been very provoking, 
if she had not always blushed and looked so excessively discomfited, and they had only to laugh and reassure her. Alan was struck by finding that the casual words spoken on the way from Coxmoor had been so strenuously acted on, and he brought on himself a whole torrent of Ethel's confused narratives, which Richard and Flora would fain have checked. But Margaret let them continue, as she saw him a willing listener, and was grateful to him for comprehending the ardent girl. He declared himself to have a share in the matter, reminding Ethel of her appeal to him to bind himself to the service of Coxmoor. He sent a sovereign at once to aid in the case of the sudden death of a pig, and when securely established in his brotherly right, he begged Ethel to let him know what would help her most. She stood coloring, twisting her hands, and wondering what to say, whereupon he relieved her by a proposal to leave an order for ten pounds, to be yearly paid into her hands, as a fixed income for her school. A thousand a year could hardly have been so much to Ethel. Thank you. Oh, this is charming. We could set up a regular school. Chair Elwood is the very woman. Alan, you have made our fortune. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, I must go and tell Richie and Mary. This is the first real step to our church and all. May I do it? said Alan, turning to Margaret, as Ethel frantically burst out of the room. Perhaps I should have asked leave. I was going to thank you, said Margaret. It is the very kindest thing you could have done by dear Ethel. The greatest comfort to us. She will be at peace now, when anything hinders her from going to Coxmoor. I wonder, said Alan, musing, whether we shall ever be able to help her more substantially. I cannot do anything hastily, for you know, Maplewood is still in the hands of the executors, and I cannot tell what claims there may be upon me. But by and by, when I return, if I find no other pressing duty, might not a church at Coxmoor be a thank-offering for all I have found here? Oh, Alan, what a joy it would be! It is a long way off, he said sadly, and perhaps her force of perseverance will have prevailed alone. I suppose I must not tell her, even as a vision. It is too uncertain. I do not know the wants of the Maplewood people, and I must provide for Hector. I would not let these vague dreams interfere with her resolute work, but Margaret... What a vision it is! I can see you laying the first stone on that fine heathy brow. Oh, your godchild should lay the first stone. She shall, and you shall lead her. And there shall be Ethel's sharp face full of indescribable things as she marshals her children. And Richard shall be curate, and read in his steady soft tone, and your father shall look sunny with his boys around him. And you? Oh, Alan, said Margaret, who had been listening with a smile. It is indeed a long way off. I shall look to it as a haven where I would be, said the sailor. They often spoke together of this scheme, ever decking it in brighter colors. The topic seemed to suit them better than their own future, for there was no dwelling on that without an occasional misgiving, and the more glad the anticipation, the deeper the sigh that followed on Margaret's part, till Mr. Earnscliffe followed her lead, and they seldom spoke of these uncertainties, but outwardly smiled over the present, inwardly dwelt on the truly certain hopes. There were readings shared together, made more precious than all, by the conversations that ensued. The hour for parting came at last. Ethel never knew what passed in the drawing-room, whence everyone was carefully excluded. Dr. May wandered about, keeping guard over the door, and watching the clock, till, at the last moment, he knocked, and called in a trembling voice, Ernscliff, Alan, it is past the quarter. You must not stay. The other farewells were hurried. Alan seemed voiceless, only nodding in reply to Mary's vociferous messages to Harry, and huskily whispering to Ethel, Good luck to Coxmore. The next moment the door had shut on him, and Dr. May and Flora had gone to her sister, whom she found not tearful, but begging to be left alone. When they saw her again, she was cheerful. She kept up her composure and animation without flagging, nor did she discontinue her new exertions, but seemed decidedly the happier for all that had passed. Letters came every day for her, and presents to everyone. Ethel had a gold chain and eyeglass, which, it was hoped, might cure her of frowning and stooping, though her various ways of dangling her new possession caused her to be so much teased by Flora and Norman, 
that, but for regard to Margaret's feelings, she would not have worn it for three days. To Mary was sent a daguerreotype of Harry, her glory and delight. Say, who would, that it had pig's eyes, a savage frown, a pudding chin, there were his own tight rings of hair, his gold-banded cap, his bright buttons. How could she prize it enough? She exhibited it to the little ones ten times a day. She kissed it night and morning, and registered her vow always to sleep with it under her pillow. In a letter of thanks, which Margaret defended and dispatched, in spite of Miss Winters's horrors at its disregard of orthography. It was nearly the last letter before the Alcestis was heard of at Spithead. Then she sailed, she sent in her letters to Plymouth, and her final greetings by a Falmouth cutter, poor Harry's wild scrawl in pencil looking very seasick. Dear Papa and all, good-bye. We are out of sight of land. Three years, and keep up a good heart. I shall soon be all right. Your H. May. It was enclosed in Mr. Ernstcliff's envelope, and with it came tidings that Harry's brave spirit was not failing, even under untoward circumstances, but he had struggled on deck and tried to write when all his contemporaries had given in. In fact, he was a fine fellow. Everyone liked him, and Captain Gordon, though chary of commendation, had held him up to the other youngsters as an example of knowing what a sailor was meant to be like. Margaret smiled and cried over the news when she imparted it, but all serenely, and though she was glad to be alone, and wrote journals for Alan, when she could not send letters, she exerted herself to be the same sister as usual to the rest of the household, and not to give way to her wandering musings. From one subject her attention never strayed. Ethel had never found any lack of sympathy in her for her Coxmore pursuits, but the change now showed that, where once Margaret had been interested merely as a kind sister, she now had a personal concern, and she threw herself into all that related to it as her own chief interest and pursuit, becoming the foremost in devising plans and arranging the best means of using Mr. Ernstcliff's benefaction. The Elwood family had grown in the good opinion of the Mays. Charity had hobbled to church, leaning on her father's arm, and being invited to dinner in the kitchen, the acquaintance had been improved, and Nurse herself had pronounced her such a tidy, good sort of body, that it was a pity she had met with such a misfortune. If Miss Ethel brought in nothing but the like of her, they should be welcome. Poor thing! How tired she was! Nurse's opinions were apt to be sagacious, especially when in the face of her prejudices, and this gave Margaret confidence. Cherry proved to have been carefully taught by a good clergyman and his wife, and to be a very different stamp from the persons to whom the girls were accustomed. They were charmed with her, and eagerly offered to supply her with books, respecting her the more when they found that Mr. Hazelwood had already lent her their chief favorites. Other and greater needs they had no power to fill up. "'It is so long without the church bells, you see, miss,' said Mrs. Elwood. "'Our tower had a real fine peal, and my man was one of the ringers. "'I seems quite lost without them, and there was Cherry, went almost every day with the children.' "'Every day?' cried Mary, looking at her with respect. "'It was so near,' said Cherry. "'I could get there easy, and I got used to it when I was at school. "'Did it not take up a great deal of time?' said Ethel. "'Why, you see, ma'am, it came morning and night, out of working times, and I can't be stirring much.' "'Then you miss it sadly?' said Ethel. "'Yes, ma'am. It made the day go on well like, and settled a body's mind when I fretted for what could not be helped but I try not to fret after it now, and Mr. Hazelwood said, if I did my best wherever I was, the Lord would still join our prayers together. Mr. Hazelwood was recollected by Mr. Wilmot as an old college friend, and a correspondence with him fully confirmed the favorable estimate of the Elwoods, and was decisive in determining that the day school, with Allen's ten pounds as salary, and a penny a week from each child, should be offered to Cherry. Mr. Hazelwood answered for her sound excellence and aptitude for managing little children, though he did not promise genius, such as should fulfill the requirements of modern days. With these, Coxmore could dispense at present. Cherry was humbly gratified, and her parents delighted with the honor and profit, 
There was a kitchen which afforded great facilities, and Richard and his carpenter managed the fitting to admiration. Margaret devised all manner of useful arrangements, settled matters with great earnestness, saw Cherry frequently, discussed plans, and learned the history and character of each child as thoroughly as Ethel herself. Mr. Ramsden himself came to the opening of the school, and said so much of the obligations of Coxmoor to the young ladies that Ethel would not have known which way to look if Flora had not kindly borne the brunt of his compliments. Everyone was pleased, except Mrs. Green, who took upon herself to set about various malicious reports of Cherry Elwood, but nobody cared for them except Mrs. Elwood, who flew into such passions that Ethel was quite disappointed in her, though not in Cherry, who meekly tried to silence her mother, begged the young ladies not to be vexed, and showed a quiet dignity that soon made the shafts of slander fall inoffensively. All went well. There was a school instead of a hubbub, clean faces instead of dirty, shining hair instead of wild elf locks, orderly children instead of little savages. The order and obedience that Ethel could not gain in six months seemed impressed in six days by Cherry. The neat work made her popular with the mothers, her firm gentleness won the hearts of the children, and the kitchen was filled not only with boys and girls from the quarry, but with some little ones from outlying cottages of Fort Holm and Abbotstoke, and there was even a smart little farmer who had been unbearable at home. Margaret's unsuccessful bath chair was lent to Cherry, and in it her scholars drew her to Stoneborough every Sunday, and slowly began to redeem their character with the ladies, who began to lose the habit of shrinking out of their way. The Stoneborough children did so instead, and Flora and Ethel were always bringing home stories of injustice to their scholars, fancied a real, and of triumphs in their having excelled any national schoolgirl. The most stupid children at Coxmoor always seemed to them wise in comparison with the Stoneborough girls, and the Sunday school might have become to Ethel a school of rivalry, if Richard had not opened her eyes by a quiet observation that the town girls seemed to fare as ill with her as the Coxmoor girls did with the town ladies. Then she caught herself up, tried to be candid, and found that she was not always impartial in her judgments. Why would competition mingle even in the best attempts? Cherry did not so bring forward her scholars that Ethel could have many triumphs of this dangerous kind. Indeed, Ethel was often vexed with her, for though she taught needlework admirably and enforced correct reading and reverent repetition, her strong provincial dialect was a stumbling block. She could not put questions without book, and nothing would teach her Ethel's rational system of arithmetic. That she was a capital dame and made the children very good was allowed, but now and then, when mortified by hearing what was done at Stoneborough, Foldholm, or Abbotstoke, Ethel would make vigorous efforts, which resulted only in her coming home fuming at Cherry's outrageous dullness. These railings always hurt Margaret, who had made Cherry almost into a friend, and generally liked to have a visit from her during the Sunday, when she always dined with the servants. Then school questions, Coxmoor news, and the tempers of the children were talked over, and Cherry was now and then drawn into home reminiscences and descriptions of the ways of her former school. There was no fear of spoiling her. Notice from her superiors was natural to her, and she had the lady-likeness of womanly goodness so as never to go beyond her own place. She had had many trials, too, and Margaret learned the true history of them as she won Cherry's confidence and entered into them, feeling their likeness, yet dissimilarity, to her own. Cherry had been a brisk, happy girl in a good place, resting in one of the long engagements that often extend over half the life of a servant, enjoying the nod of her baker as he left his bread, and her walk from church with him on alternate Sundays. But poor Cherry had been exposed to the perils of window-cleaning, and, after a frightful fall, had wakened to find herself in a hospital, and her severe sufferings had left her a cripple for life. And the baker had not been in Allan Ernscliffe. She did not complain of him. He had come to see her, and had been much grieved, but she had told him she could never be a useful wife. And, before she had used her crutches, he was married to her pretty fellow-servant. Cherry spoke very simply— she hoped it was better for long, and believed Susan would make him a good wife. Ethel would have thought she did not feel, but Margaret knew better. 
She stroked the thin, slight fingers and gently said, Poor Cherry! And Cherry wiped away a tear and said, Yes, ma'am, thank you. It is best for him. I should not have wished him to grieve for what cannot be helped. Resignation is the great comfort. Yes, ma'am, I have a great deal to be thankful for. I don't blame no one, but I do see how some, as are married, seem to get to think more of this world, and now and then I fancy I can see how it is best for me as it is. Margaret sighed as she remembered certain thoughts before Alan's return. Then, ma'am, there has been such goodness. I did vex at being a poor helpless thing, nothing but a burden on father, and when we had to go from home, and Mr. and Mrs. Hazlewood and all, I can't tell you how bad it was, ma'am. Then you are comforted now? Yes, ma'am, said Cherry, brightening. It seems as if he had given me something to do, and there are you, and Mr. Richard, and Miss Ethel, to help. I should like, please God, to be of some good to those poor children. I am sure you will, Cherry. I wish I could do as much. Cherry's tears had come again. Ah, ma'am, you... And she stopped short and rose to depart. Margaret held out her hand to wish her good-bye. Please, miss, I was thinking how Mr. Hazelwood said that God fits our place to us, and us to our place. Thank you, Cherry. You are leaving me something to remember. And Margaret lay questioning with herself whether the schoolmistress had not been the most self-denying of the two, but withal gazing on the hoop of pearls which Alan had chosen as the ring of betrothal. The pearl of great price, murmured she to herself. If we hold that, the rest will soon matter but little. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as they that have none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. If ever Alan and I have a home together upon earth, may all too confident joy be tempered by the fears that we have begun with. I hope this probation may make me less likely to be taken up with the cares and pleasures of his position than it might have been last year. He is one who can best help the mind to go truly upward. But, oh, that voyage! End of Part 1, Chapter 28 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona Part 1, Chapter 29 of The Daisy Chain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona. The Daisy Chain by Charlotte Mary Young. Heart affluence in household talk, from social fountains never dry. Tennyson. What a bore! What's the matter now? Here has this old fellow asked me to dinner again. A fine pass we are come to, cried Dr. May, half amused, half irate. I should like to know what I should have said, at your age, if the headmaster had asked me to dinner. Papa is not so very fond of dining at Dr. Hoxton's, said Ethel. A whippersnapper schoolboy, who might be thankful to dine anywhere, continued Dr. May, while the girls burst out laughing and Norman looked injured. It is very ungrateful of Norman, said Flora. I cannot see what he finds to complain of. You would know, said Norman, if, instead of playing those perpetual tunes of yours, you had to sit it out in that perfumey drawing-room, without anything to listen to worth hearing. If I have looked over that court album once, I have a dozen times, and there is not another book in the place. I am glad there is not, said Flora. I am quite ashamed to see you forever turning over those old pictures. You cannot guess how stupid you look. I wonder Mrs. Hoxton likes to have you, she added, patting his shoulders between jest and earnest. I wish you would not, then. It is only to escort you. Nonsense, Norman, you know better, cried Ethel. You know it is for your own sake, and to make up for their injustice, that he invites you, or Flora either. Hush, Ethel. He gives himself quite airs enough already, said the doctor. Papa, said Ethel, in vexation, though he gave her a pinch to show it was all in good humor, while he went on, I'm glad to hear they do leave him to himself in a corner. A very good thing, too. Where else should a great gawky schoolboy be? Safe at home, where I wish he would let me be, muttered Norman, though he contrived a smile and followed Flora out of the room without subjecting himself to the imputation of offended dignity. 
Ethel was displeased and began her defense. Papa, I wish... And there she checked herself. Eh? Miss Essel's bristles up, said her father, who seemed in a somewhat mischievous mood of teasing. How could you, Papa? cried she. How could I what, Miss Etheldred? Plague, Norman, the words would come. Accuse him of errors. I hate to see young fellows above taking an honor from their elders, said Dr. May. Now, Papa, Papa, you know it is no such thing. Dr. Hoxton's parties are very dull. You know they are, and it is not fair on Norman. If he was set up and delighted at going so often, then you would call him conceited. Conceit has a good many lurking places, said Dr. May. It is harder to go and be overlooked than to stay at home. Now, Papa, you are not to call Norman conceited, cried Ethel. You don't believe that he is any such thing. Why, not exactly, said Dr. May, smiling. The boy has missed it marvelously. But, you see, he has everything that subtle imp would wish to feed upon, and it is no harm to give him a lick with the rough side of the tongue, as your canny Scott's grandfather used to say. Ah, uh, if you knew, Papa, began Ethel. If I knew? No, no, I must not tell. What? A secret? Is there? I wish it was not. I should like to tell you very much, but then, you see, it is Norman's, and you are to be surprised. Your surprise is likely to be very much like Blanche's birthday presents, a stage aside. No, I'm going to keep it to myself. Two or three days after, as Ethel was going to the schoolroom after breakfast, Dr. May beckoned her back to the dining room, and, with his merry look of significance, said, Well, ma'am, I have found out your mystery. About Norman? Oh, Papa, did he tell you? When I came home from the hospital last night, at an hour when all respectable characters, except doctors and police, should be in their warm beds, I beheld a light in Norman's room, so methought I would see what gravity was doing out of his bed at midnight. And you found him at his Greek? So that was the meaning of his looking so lank and careworn, just as he did last year, and he, the prince of the school. I could have found it in my heart to fling the books at his head. But you consent, don't you, to his going up for the scholarship? I consent to anything, as long as he keeps within due bounds, and does not work himself to death. I am glad of knowing it, for now I can put a moderate check upon it. And did he tell you all about it? He told me he felt as if he owed it to us to gain something for himself, since I had given up the Randall to gratify him. A pretty sort of gratification. Yes, and he will be glad to get away from school. He says he knows it is bad for him, as it is uncomfortable to be singled out in the way Dr. Hoxton does now. You know, pleaded Ethel, it is not ingratitude or elation, but it is, somehow, not nice to be treated as he is, set apart from the rest. True, Dr. Hoxton never had taste or judgment. If Norman were not a lucis naturae, said Dr. May, hesitating for a word, his head would have been turned long ago. And he wants companions, too. He has been forced out of boyhood too soon, poor fellow. And Harry gone, too. He does not get anything like real relaxation, and he will be better among youths than boys. Stoneboro will never be what it was in my time, added the doctor mournfully. I never thought to see the poor old place come to this, but there, when all the better class send their sons to the great public schools and leave nothing but riffraff here, one is forced, for a boy's own sake, to do the same. Oh, I am so glad. Then you have consented to the rest of Norman's scheme, and will not keep poor little Tom at school here without him? By what he tells me, it would be downright ruin to the boy. I little thought to have to take a son of mine away from Stoneboro, but Norman is the best judge, and he is the only person who seems to have made any impressions on Tom, so I shall let it be. In fact, he added, half-smiling, I don't know what I could refuse, old June. That's right, cried Ethel. That is so nice. Then, if Norman gets the scholarship, Tom is to go to Mr. Wilmot first, and then to Eden. If Norman gains the scholarship, but that is an if, said Dr. May, as though hoping for a loophole to escape offending the shade of Bishop Wishcott. Oh, Papa, you cannot doubt of that. I cannot tell, Ethel. He is Fasil Princeps here in his own world, 
but we did not know how it will be when he is measured with public schoolmen who have had more first-rate tutorship than poor old Hoxton's. Ah, he says so, but I thought that was all his humility. Better he should be prepared. If he had had all those advantages, but it may be as well after all. I always had a hankering to have sent him to Eton, but your dear mother used to say it was not fair on the others. And now, to see him striving in order to give the advantage of it to his little brother. I only hope Master Thomas is worthy of it, but it is a boy I can't understand. Nor I, said Ethel. He never seems to say anything he can help, and goes after Norman without talking to anyone else. I give him up to Norman's management, said Dr. May. He says the boy is very clever, but I have not seen it. And, as to more serious matters, however, I must take it on Norman's word that he is wishing to learn truth. We made an utter mistake about him. I don't know who is to blame for it. Have you told Margaret about Norman's plans? asked Ethel. No, he desired me to say nothing. Indeed, I should not like Tom's leaving school to be talked of beforehand. Norman said he did not want Flora to hear her because she is so much with the Hoxtons, and he said they would all watch him. Aye, aye, and we must keep his secret. What a boy it is! But it is not safe to say conceited things. We shall have a fall yet, Ethel. Not seventeen, remember, and brought up at a mere grammar school. But we shall still have the spirit that made him try, said Ethel, and that is the thing. And, to tell the truth, said the doctor, lingering, for my own part, I don't care rush for it. And he dashed off to his work, while Ethel stood laughing. Papa was so very kind, said Norman tremulously, when Ethel followed him to his room, to congratulate him on having gained his father's assent, of which he had been more in doubt than she. And you see he quite approves of the scheme for Tom, except for thinking it disrespect to Bishop Wishcote. He said he only hoped Tom was worthy of it. Tom, cried Norman, take my word for it, Ethel. Tom will surprise you all. He will beat us all to nothing, I know. If only he can be cured of... He will, said Norman, when once he has outgrown his frights, and that he may do at Mr. Wilmot's, apart from those fellows. When I go out for the scholarship, you must look after his lessons, and see if you are not surprised at his construing. When you go, it will be in a month. He has told no one, I hope. No, but I hardly think he will bear not telling Margaret. Well... I hate a thing being out of one's own keeping. I should not so much dislike Margaret's knowing, but I won't have Flora know. Mind that, Ethel, he said, with disproportionate vehemence. I only hope Flora will not be vexed. But, oh dear, how nice it will be when you have it, telling Maida Rivers and all. And this is a fine way of getting it, standing talking here. Not that I shall. You little know what public schools can do, but that is no reason against trying. Good night, then. Only one thing more. You mean that, till further orders, Margaret should not know? Of course, said Norman impatiently. She won't take any of Flora's silly affronts, and, what is more, she would not care half so much as before Alan Ernstcliffe came. Oh, Norman, Norman, I'm sure... Why, it is what they always say. Everybody can't be first, and Ernstcliffe has the biggest half of her, I can see. I am sure I did not, said Ethel, in a mortified voice. Why, of course, it always comes of people having lovers. Then I am sure I won't, exclaimed Ethel. Norman went into a fit of laughing. You may laugh, Norman, but I will never let Papa or any of you be second to anyone, she cried vehemently. A brotherly home truth followed. Nobody asked you, sir, she said, was muttered by Norman, still laughing heartily. I know, said Ethel, not in the least offended. I am very ugly and very awkward, but I don't care. There never can be anybody in all the world that I shall like half as well as Papa, and I am glad no one is ever likely to make me care less for him and Coxmore. Stay till you are tried, said Norman. Ethel squeezed up her eyes, curled up her nose, showed her teeth in a horrible grimace, and made a sort of snarl. Yeah, that's the face I shall make of them. And then, with another good night, ran to her own room. Norman was, to a certain extent, right with regard to Margaret. Her thoughts and interest had been chiefly engrossed by Alan Ernstcliffe, and so far drawn away from her own family, that when the Alcestis was absolutely gone beyond all reach of letters for the present, 
Margaret could not help feeling somewhat of a void, and as if the home concerns were not so entire an occupation for her mind as formerly. She would fain have thrown herself into them again, but she became conscious that there was a difference. She was still the object of her father's intense tenderness and solicitude. Indeed, she could not be otherwise, but it came over her sometimes that she was less necessary to him than in the first year. He was not conscious of any change, and indeed, it hardly amounted to a change, and yet Margaret, lying inactive and thoughtful, began to observe that the fullness of his confidence was passing to Ethel. Now and then it would appear that he fancied he had told Margaret little matters when he had really told them to Ethel, and it was Ethel who would linger with him in the drawing-room after the others had gone up at night, or who would be late at the morning's reading, and disarm Miss Winter by pleading that Papa had been talking to her. The secret they shared together was, of course, the origin of much of this. But also, Ethel was now more entirely the doctor's own than Margaret could be after her engagement, and there was a likeness of mind between the father and daughter that could not but develop more in this year than in all Ethel's life, when she had made the most rapid progress. Perhaps, too, the doctor looked on Margaret rather as the authority, the mistress of his house, while Ethel was more of a playfellow, and thus, without either having the least suspicion that the one sister was taking the place of the other, and without any actual neglect of Margaret, Ethel was his chief companion. "'How excited and anxious Norman looks,' said Margaret, one day when he had rushed in at the dinner hour, asking for his father, and when he could not find him, shouting out for Ethel. "'I hope there is nothing amiss. He has looked thin and worn for some time, and yet his work at school is very easy to him.' "'I wish there may be nothing wrong there again,' said Flora. "'There, there's the front door banging. He's off.' Ethel, stepping to the door and calling in her sister, who came from the street door, her hair blowing about with the wind. "'What did Norman want?' "'Only to know whether Papa had left a note for Dr. Hoxton,' said Ethel, looking very confused and very merry. "'That was not all,' said Flora. "'Now don't be absurd, Ethel. I hate mysteries.' "'Last time I had a secret, you would not believe it,' said Ethel, laughing. "'Come,' exclaimed Flora. "'Why cannot you tell us all at once what is going on?' "'Because I was desired not,' said Ethel. "'You will hear it soon enough,' and she capered a little. "'Let her alone, Flora,' said Margaret. "'I see there is nothing wrong.' "'If she is desired to be silent, there is nothing to be said,' replied Flora, sitting down again, while Ethel ran away to guard her secret. "'Absurd,' muttered Flora. I cannot imagine why Ethel is always making mysteries. She cannot help other people having confidence in her, said Margaret gently. She need not be so important, then, said Flora, always having private conferences with Papa. I do not think it is at all fair on the rest. Ethel is a very superior person, said Margaret, with half a sigh. Flora might toss her head, but she attempted no denial in words. And, continued Margaret, if Papa does find her his best companion and friend, we ought to be glad of it. I do not call it just, said Flora. I do not think it can be helped, said Margaret. The best must be preferred. As to that, Ethel is often very ridiculous and silly. She is improving every day, and you know, dear Mamma always thought her the finest character amongst us. Then you are ready to be left out, and have your third sister always put before you? No, Flora, that is not the case. Neither she nor Papa would ever be unfair. But, as she would say herself, what they can't help, they can't help. And, as she grows older, she must surpass me more and more. And you like it? I like it when, when I think of Papa and of his dear, noble Ethel. I do like it when I am not selfish. Margaret turned away her head, but presently looked up again. Only Flora, she said, pray do not say one word of this, on any account, to Ethel. She is so happy with Papa, and I would not for anything have her think I feel neglected or had any jealousy. Ah, thought Flora, you can give up sweetly, but you have Alan to fall back upon. Now I, who certainly have the best right, and a great deal more practical sense. Flora took Margaret's advice and did not reproach Ethel, for a little reflection convinced her that she should make a silly figure in so doing, and she did not like altercations. 
It was the same evening that Norman came in from school with his hands full of papers, and, with one voice, his father and Ethel exclaimed, "'You have them?' "'Yes,' and he gave the letter to his father, while Blanche, who had a very inquisitive pair of eyes, began to read from a paper he placed on the table. "'Norman Walter, son of Richard and Margaret May, High Street, Doctor of Medicine, December 21st, 18, Thomas Ramsden. "'What is that for, Norman?' and, as he did not attend, she called Mary to share her speculations and spell out the words. "'Ha!' cried Dr. May. "'This is capital. The old doctor seems not to know how to say enough for you. Have you read it?' "'No, he only told me he had said something in my favor, and wished me all success.' "'Success!' cried Mary. "'Oh, Norman, you are not going to see, too?' "'No, no,' interposed Blanche knowingly. He is going to be married. I heard Nurse wish her brother success when he was going to marry the washerwoman with a red face. No, said Mary, people never are married till they are twenty. But I tell you, persisted Blanche, people always write like this, in a great book in church, when they are married. I know, for we always go into church with Lucy and Nurse when there is a wedding. Well, Norman, I wish you success with the bride you are to court, said Dr. May much diverted with the young lady's conjectures. "'But is it really?' said Mary, making her eyes as round as full moons. "'Is it really?' repeated Blanche. "'Oh, dear, is Norman going to be married? I wish it was to be Med Rivers, for then I could always ride her dear little white pony.' "'Tell them,' whispered Norman, a good deal out of countenance, as he leaned over Ethel and quitted the room. Ethel cried, "'Now then,' and looked at her father." while Blanche and Mary reiterated inquiries, marriage and going to sea being the only events that, in their imagination, the world could furnish. Going to try for a bally old scholarship! It was a sad falling off, even if they understood what it meant. The doctor's explanation to Margaret had a tone of apology for having kept her in ignorance, and Flora said few words, but felt herself injured. She had nearly gone to Mrs. Hoxton that afternoon, and how strange it would have been if anything had been said to her of her own brother's projects when she was in ignorance. Ethel slipped away to her brother, who was in his own room, surrounded with books, flushed and anxious, and trying to glance over each subject on which he felt himself weak. "'I shall fail! I know I shall!' was his exclamation. "'I wish I had never thought of it!' "'What? Did Dr. Hoxton think you not likely to succeed?' cried Ethel in consternation. Oh, he said I was certain, but what is that? We Stoneboro men only compare ourselves with each other. I shall break down to a certainty, and my father will be disappointed. You will do your best? I don't know that. My best will all go away when it comes to the point. Surely not. It did not go away last time you were examined, and why should it now? I tell you, Ethel, you know nothing about it. I have not got up half what I meant to have done. Here, do take this book. Try me whether I know this properly. So they went on, Ethel doing her best to help and encourage, and Norman in an excited state of restless despair, which drove away half his senses and recollection, and his ideas of the superior powers of public schoolboys magnifying every moment. They were summoned downstairs to prayers, but went up again at once, and more than an hour subsequently, when their father paid one of his domiciliary visits. There they still were, with their Latin and Greek spread out, Norman trying to strengthen all doubtful points, but in a desperate, desultory manner, that only confused him more and more, till he was obliged to lay his head down on the table, shut his eyes, and run his fingers through his hair, before he could recollect the simplest matter. His renderings alternated with groans, and... Cold as was the room, his cheeks and brow were flushed and burning. The doctor checked all this by saying, gravely and sternly, This is not right, Norman. Where are all your resolutions? I shall never do it. I ought never to have thought of it. I shall never succeed. What if you do not, said Dr. May, laying his hand on his shoulder. What? Why, Tom's chance lost. 
you will all be mortified, said Norman, hesitating in some confusion. I will take care of Tom, said Dr. May. And he will have been foiled, said Ethel. If he is? The boy and girl were both silent. Are you striving for mere victory's sake, Norman? continued his father. I thought not, murmured Norman. Successful or not, you will have done your utmost for us. You would not lose one shot of affection or esteem, and Tom shall not suffer. Is it worth this agony? No, it is foolish, said Norman, with trembling voice, almost as if he could have burst into tears. He was quite unnerved by the anxiety and toil with which he had overtasked himself beyond his father's knowledge. Oh, Papa, pleaded Ethel, who could not bear to see him pained. It is foolish, continued Dr. May, who felt there was a moment for bracing severity. It is rendering you unmanly. It is wrong. Again, Ethel made an exclamation of entreaty. It is wrong, I know, repeated Norman, but you don't know what it is to get into the spirit of the thing. Do you think I do not? said the doctor. I can tell you exactly what you feel now. If I had not been an idle dog, I should have gone through it all many more times. What shall I do? asked Norman, in a worn-out voice. Put all this out of your mind, sleep quietly, and don't open another book. Norman moved his head, as if sleep were beyond his power. I will read you something to calm your tone, said Dr. May, and he took up a prayer book. Know ye not, that they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And Norman, that is not the struggle where the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the contest, where the conqueror only wins vanity and vexation of spirit. Norman had cast down his eyes and hardly made answer, but the words had evidently taken effect. The doctor only further bade him good night with a whispered blessing and, taking Ethel by the hand, drew her away. When they met the next morning, the excitement had passed from Norman's manner, but he looked dejected and resigned. He had made up his mind to lose and was not grateful for good wishes. He ought never to have thought, he said, of competing with men from public schools, and he knew his return of love of vainglory deserved that he should fail. However, he was now calm enough not to be likely to do himself injustice by nervousness, and Margaret had hopes that Richard's steady, equable mind would have a salutary influence. So, commending Tom's lessons to Ethel, and hearing, but not marking, countless messages to Richard, he set forth upon his emprise, while his anxiety seemed to remain as a legacy for those at home. Poor Dr. May confessed that his practice by no means agreed with his precept, for he could think of nothing else, and was almost as bad as Norman, in his certainty that the boy would fail from mere nervousness. Margaret was a better companion for him now, attaching less intensity of interest to Norman's success than did Ethel. She was the more able to compose him and cheer his hopes. End of Part 1, Chapter 29 Recording by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona